Good morning. Wow, that was so much faster than I thought it would be. Um, excellent. Uh, welcome, everybody. I am really excited to see so many faces um, and on a snowy day, so this is fantastic. I am Abby Wozniak. I'm director of the Opportunity and Inclusive Growth Institute, and I am delighted to open the second fall research conference of the Opportunity and Inclusive Growth Institute. So welcome to folks in person. Welcome to those of you watching us on the live stream. And I want to first say that I'm extremely grateful to the very large team who has helped make this event happen. I'm not going to name all the names right now, but I do want to say that I'm just always really impressed by the level of dedication and hard work among the folks whose job it is to bring us together. Uh, and that's been true this week in particular. I hope when you see them, you'll chat with them and thank them as well. And I'm also grateful to all of you for being here in person and making that work today. Really having you in person and your presence is key to making this event a success. So we launched the Institute um, and the Fall Research Conference in particular last year in a virtual format. And we had two goals with this Fall Research Conference. These goals apply today as well. The first is to showcase the range of frontier style research that the Institute supports and engages with. The Institute is united in our mission, but we are open to a variety of tools, approaches, and questions. And so as a result, our program today is broad. Most of you in attendance are experts in your respective fields. But I hope you leave today having learned something that's truly new to you. It's these kind of interactions that I think really strengthen our work. And in particular, it helps ensure that our research is precise, but not narrow. So that is a really big goal we hope to get out of today's convening. We are also, as a result, going to have a set of diverse perspectives um, in the questions that we ask. So I hope that folks lean into that, embrace that, and when we do have Q&A sessions for our paper presenters, that you will put questions to them that they might not hear in other contexts. That's a real benefit and a unique feature, I think, of the event that we've organized today. The second goal of ours with this research conference event is to bring together the growing research community that's supported by the Institute. And so this includes our visiting scholars, past and current, our institute advisory board members, some of whom are here today, many of whom were here last night as well for our first in-person meeting of that group. It also includes our system affiliates and our wider Fed research colleagues, as well as our Fed leadership. This community really builds and uses the evidence uh, that we assemble at the Institute in order to help achieve full opportunity and inclusion in the US economy. But the Institute becomes this community's bridge to the Fed. So with today's event, we're really working to continue to build those relationships and keep that bridge on a solid footing. So we're just really excited to have folks gathering in person um, to enhance this community. I really look forward to seeing the six papers selected for today's program from over 70 submissions and to talking in greater depth during our breaks, meals, and social hour. So before we dive in, I want to highlight just two more behind the scenes pieces. The first is our twice yearly for all publication, which all of you have uh, in front of you. So for all is a great place to keep up with what the Institute is doing throughout the year. Uh, but more importantly, you can keep up with what we are thinking. So you'll find profiles of the scholars who visit us over uh, a year. You'll find profiles and research features that connect with a wide range of researchers, just like you'll see today. And you'll also find longer pieces that sometimes our editors tell us could be a book, but they have to fit into a magazine feature. Um, so hopefully, you will grab this. You can also get this. Um, in hard copy at your home or on your device by just following the links on our website, and I hope you'll check that out going forward. The second behind the scenes piece is just to extend a warm welcome to those folks who are scholars who are staying on to participate in tomorrow's mentoring conference. 
So at the Institute, we are working to also support the work and development of the next generation of scholars who are going to inform us on our Institute mission topics. And the mentoring conference tomorrow is a piece of that work. So you can find the papers and affiliations and um, names and folks of all of the people who will be presenting at the mentoring conference tomorrow. Uh, they are here today. I hope you will check out their work when it becomes publicly available. Tomorrow's event will be about um, helping them sharpen it and refine it in uh, a smaller setting and, and really build that work up. So now I'd like to dive into today's event. Um, it happens that there's a third goal that we had in mind with today's conference in particular, and that is to observe the Institute's fifth anniversary. To recognize the occasion, we are really honored to have Federal Reserve Governor Philip Jefferson join us, and I am beyond honored to introduce him. So Philip Jefferson took office as a member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System in May of this year, and prior to that, Governor Jefferson was Vice President for Academic Affairs and Dean of the Faculty at Davidson College, as well as the Paul B. Freeland Professor of Economics there. He has also held leadership, full professor, and economist roles at Swarthmore College and at the Federal Reserve Board. And he has been president of the National Economic Association. Um, prior to joining the Board of Governors, in addition to these many other accomplishments, Governor Jefferson was a founding member of the Opportunity and Inclusive Growth Institute's advisory board. And he held that position until moving on to join the Board of Governors earlier this year. So given his long connection to the Institute and now his connection to the board, we're particularly excited to hear his thoughts on the role of the Institute from his new perspective. After his remarks, Governor Jefferson will be joined by Neil Kashkari. President Kashkari leads the Minneapolis Fed, serving a district that spans Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, northern Wisconsin, and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And he is a member of the Open Market Committee, setting the nation's monetary policy. He's held a variety of roles in public service and finance, notably as Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, overseeing the Troubled Asset Relief Program in 2008. President Kashkari launched the Institute in 2017 um, and helped found its relationship with the research division of the Minneapolis Fed, bringing it here. President Kashkari will moderate a discussion with the governor and with two esteemed panelists whom he'll introduce when they take the stage. And now I'd like to turn it over to Governor Jefferson. Welcome. Good morning, everyone, and thank you. It's a real honor for me to uh, be asked to speak and to actually do it here. It's, it's a real pleasure. I would like to use my time today to answer the question posed by the title of this first session, which is, what can the Fed learn from research on opportunity and inclusive growth? But first, let me remind you that the views that I expressed are mine own and do not necessarily reflect those of anyone else on the Federal Open Market Committee or the Federal Reserve System. Some of the Fed's purview, including consumer protection, community development, and financial stability, can help to support inclusive growth. But monetary policy cannot address these issues directly. I do, however, see a direct line between research on opportunity and inclusive growth and our dual mandate of maximum employment and price stability. Fulfillment of our mandate is likely to be easier if certain other conditions are present. For example, if the channels of upward social mobility are open and working for all, we are likely to see both higher labor market participation and higher productivity, both of which make it easier to attain maximum employment amid low and stable inflation. 
The better we understand the channels that affect the health and function of the overall economy, the better we can calibrate our policy decisions to deliver on our dual mandate. Those channels consist of several areas that are largely not ours to make policy about, but are important for our policies to be effective in promoting the conditions for prosperity. They include health, housing, transportation, childcare, disability services, education, access to the financial system, and access to capital. First, I would like to address monetary policy. In pursuing its dual mandate, the Federal Reserve is essentially trying to foster and maintain the conditions in which the economy and all its participants can thrive. Research has shown that the benefits of a strong economy with high employment and stable prices are especially significant for less advantaged groups. Those groups also tend to see the greatest gains later in an expansion, meaning that they benefit the most from sustained periods of growth, like the expansion we were experiencing before the pandemic, which was the longest on record. For example, during the pre-pandemic expansion, the long-standing disparity between unemployment rates for prime age African Americans and Hispanics and their white counterparts began to close. In fact, the disparities in labor market outcomes just prior to the onset of the pandemic were the narrowest in at least 50 years. At the same time, inflation remained low lower, in fact, than our 2% target for most of that time, and showed little sign of picking up despite the strong labor market. Unfortunately, the pandemic brought about the most rapid and severe labor market contraction of the past 80 years. It also had a noticeably larger effect on the unemployment rates of women, and of black and Hispanic individuals than it did on most other demographic groups. And while job losses were widespread across all sectors of the economy, workers with less education were particularly hard hit. This was especially true for those unable to work remotely or in jobs that required in-person interactions. As the economy reopened and began to recover, unemployment rates for those groups initially affected the most, black and Hispanic workers, also fell more sharply. Today, while material disparities in unemployment rates along racial lines persist, these disparities have almost returned to the narrow ranges that we saw just before the pandemic. However, as the economy recovered, strong demand and a variety of supply constraints have contributed to the fastest increase in consumer prices since the early 1980s. Inflation, too, has disproportionate effects and is, most, is felt most acutely by those who can least afford it. Prices have been particularly Price increases have been particularly sharp for necessities like food, transportation, and shelter, which make up a substantial portion of household budgets for people on the lower end of the pay scale. Lower income households also have less in savings to buffer price increases, meaning that they not only feel the effects more forcefully but they also fill them immediately. The savings that they do have are more likely to be in cash or non-interest-bearing accounts, 
which means inflation directly erodes the purchasing power of their savings. Monetary policy cannot address the specific reasons that low-income households suffer the most from high inflation. But these reasons help to illustrate the importance of low inflation. Low inflation is the key to achieving a long and sustained expansion, an economy that works for all. Pursuing our dual mandate is the best way for the Federal Reserve to promote widely shared prosperity. At the same time, it is critical for monetary policymakers to understand the many and varied conditions that can make our policies more effective in fostering prosperity. Now let me turn to these concomitant conditions for prosperity outside of the Fed's mandate, which nevertheless should be carefully studied. Many of them are straightforward, like housing, transportation, and childcare. Even as remote work has increased, many jobs remain in person and on site. If people cannot live near work, either because the cost or because jobs are located in non-residential areas, they must commute. Commuting depends on public or personal transportation which in turn relies on infrastructure such as roads and highways. And time spent commuting affects child care decisions. Caring responsibilities overall for children or for other relatives can keep people out of the labor force. And the onus falls disproportionately on the women. This was particularly evident during the pandemic and particularly true for black and Hispanic mothers. Financial participation is also clearly connected to prosperity. Being unbanked means less financial security. Less access to credit means a smaller or even non-existent safety net. But it also means less opportunity be that buying a house to build capital, funding education, or starting a business. But there are other less obvious or even less quantifiable issues. Beyond location, a home provides both basic needs, such as shelter, and invaluable benefits such as an increase of personal safety and dignity. It is a refuge in which our minds and bodies can recuperate and regenerate so that we are prepared to participate in all aspects of life, including the next day's work. The cost of living in disadvantaged areas or dealing with financial hardship can be seen in all aspects of life. Higher stress, the frequent necessity to work more than one job, the absence of benefits, and the time spent, time and money spent commuting. All these exact a financial and psychological toll. There is a fundamental aspect of our humanity, which is to live a more fulfilling existence to enjoy the richness of life. In an economy that works for all, we should not live to work, but work to live. These are the factors that will allow people to thrive. Our policies, I mean, of course, our, the policies that can address these important issues are not made by Fed policymakers. But the research agenda we are discussing today helps us to understand better those aspects of well-being that allow people to prosper and to enrich their lives more broadly. 
Thank you. Thank you, Governor Jefferson. Uh, before I uh, kick off the Q&A, which I'll start with you, I'm going to introduce our fellow panelists up here. Um, first of all, to your right, we've got uh, Karen Dynan, a professor at Harvard University, which I just learned is affiliated both with the Econ Department and the Kennedy School of Government. Uh, we invited Karen today because she's had really remarkable public service career. A uh, longtime staffer at the Board of Governors, uh, spent time at the Brookings Institution uh, in senior economic roles, then at the Treasury Department, where I am very favorable towards the Treasury Department, having spent time there myself, as Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy. Uh, and so I think you're going to bring both a great research perspective as well as a great uh, policymaker perspective. And then uh, to your right, Esteban Rossi Hansberg is a professor of economics at the University of Chicago, previously having, previously having spent time at Princeton University and Stanford. And Esteban does a lot of research on cities and structures, you and I have met and you've shared with some of your research from, uh, with me, looking at growth and organizational uh, considerations, uh, implications of offshoring and organization on economic outcomes. So a very rich research history that really does focus on issues that we care a lot about at the Institute. And importantly, Esteban has been involved with the Institute for several years. Uh, first, he was an early visitor. We have a very rich, uh, Visiting Scholar Program. Esteban was an early visitor. He's published in our working paper series, and he's now on our Institute's advisory board. So it'll be great to get your perspective both inside and outside the Institute. But I want to start with uh, Governor Jefferson, uh, some questions just on your remarks. Thank you for those very thoughtful remarks. I want to go back in time before you joined the board. And you were uh, on our initial advisory board that Abby mentioned when she introduced you. I'm just curious what motivated you when we called and said, would you serve on this advisory board? I'm sure you get lots of invitations to serve on lots of advisory boards. Why did you say yes? Well, at that time, I was spending a lot of my research energy writing about uh, poverty and inequality. And um, I was surprised to receive the call, actually, uh, because uh, my initially I didn't think that uh, this was something that the Fed would be uh, interested in. But once I thought about the uh, mission of the Fed broadly defined, I was very excited about uh, the Fed's interest to know more about these topics and to see the connection between uh, issues like poverty and inequality and its dual mandate. And I thought, what better role uh, that I could play than to provide information to the policymakers and researchers who work in this environment uh, so that uh, as a way of increasing awareness, if you will. So I was very excited uh, that um, for that opportunity and that invitation. And, and I remain to this day very uh, enthusiastic about the work of the Institute. Oh, great, thank you. Um, and we're, we're enthusiastic. We were sad to see you leave our advisory board, but it was for a good reason. Exactly. So, uh, we'll take it. Let, so let me, you've shifted now. Now you're a consumer of this analysis. You're a consumer of this type of research as a policymaker, as a member of the Board of Governors. You know, one of my observations, having been at the Fed now almost seven years, is that the economy is always sending us mixed signals. But the signals we're getting now are more mixed than at any time that I've been observing. And so I'm just curious, when you look at the data and analysis that we get in preparation for FOMC meetings, how do these distributional considerations, how do they help you? Are they help you understanding what's going on with these signals that we're getting right now? The answer to that question is yes, right? Because one of those uh, signals or puzzles that we're facing has to do with uh, labor supply and uh, the fact that it's not where it was, say, before the, the pandemic. Um, issues related to productivity are uh, puzzling also. And as I mentioned in my remarks, I think that understanding some of these distributional issues uh, can be uh, helpful in understanding 
why we're not seeing some of the responsiveness that uh, we could or we could expect maybe based on past behavior. And so if we're trying to have maximum employment um, as, as a consideration, which is part of our mandate, then we need to understand the underlying issues that impact uh, labor supply and, and, and say, product, uh, worker productivity. And so uh, I see a good uh, connection between uh, the work that uh, on distributional issues and fulfillment of a part of the Fed's mandate. Well, I'll say a uh, great comment. I agree completely. That was actually the inspiration for the Institute was we were misreading the labor market. We mm. kept thinking we were at maximum employment. We were not actually at maximum employment. Why is that? And you, I would go out in the low-income communities and they'd say, hey, we're still looking for work. Mm -hmm. And I said, wait a second. I just met businesses who said that they can't find workers. There's some disconnect going mm -hmm. on here. And so um, I, I totally agree with what you said. So Karen, I want to turn to you for a moment. Um, I, there's a lot that you could weigh in on here. I'm just, and, and feel free to, but I would just say, as a policymaker, you know, you've been, you've been at the Board of Governors, you've been at the White House, you've been at Treasury. How do these distributional considerations, I mean, the, the cadence of policymaking, especially in the executive branch, I mean, it is so real time. You're having to respond to things every day. I'm just curious, how can you incorporate these distributional considerations in the policy process? Um, sure. Um, first of all, uh, I want to say just thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's just a pleasure to be here. I really admire the work of the Institute, and um, happy anniversary. <laughs> thank you. Um, and I wish you all the best for the next five years. Um, yeah, so, so um, you know, as Gov Governor Jefferson said in his speech, at the end of the day, what we're all you know, aiming for it is, is an economy that works for everyone. And um, you know, I, I completely agree with the connections to monetary policy maker, making, but um, fiscal policy making, the work of the Institute is incredibly important. Um, one of the um, uh, you know, important things that has happened in the economics literature over the last 15, 20 years is a set of um, papers uh, that's demonstrating that um, uh, the, the fiscal, um, you know, social insurance safety net program, uh, you know, it's, it's not just about uh, relieving hardship in the moment. Uh, it's about important investments in people uh, that um, kind of pay off for them personally uh, in terms of their individual mobility and um, also for the economy as a whole, because these people, you know, years later, I mean, it's just such an impressive literature, you know, years later, you invest in, in children and, um, uh, you know, then you look at, at their lives as adults and you see they're engaged in the labor force and they have more education and they have better jobs. And it's just very, very, very powerful. And I'm just delighted that the literature is, uh, sorry, that the Institute is contributing to that literature, but it's so, important for fiscal, for crafting fiscal policy. Um, you know, you look at um, bills uh, like the, the Big Back Better bill, which didn't fully go through, but you know, one iteration of that was something like $1.75 trillion, um, two thirds of it, which was supposed to be allocated towards uh, investment in people. And, um, you know, this this literature that's been growing would have been really it's it would be really helpful for kind of allocating that money. So most of this did not go through, um, but the truth is we need much more of it. You know, we didn't begin to have uh, kind of all everything we need to know to kind of allocate that money. And I will say, um, kind of, it's just more important than ever that we um, kind of engage in this uh, you know work that would contribute to evidence-based policymaker making. Um, part of that's because of the political uh, environment in Washington. You know, you really need bipartisan uh, support. And um, I think there are many uh, politicians across the spectrum who want to see kind of just the actual evidence, the accountability that um, these programs work. So I think just the institutes uh, work along that, that line has been really important. Thank you. So Esteban, I'm curious, you've obviously been a very uh, prolific researcher in the university context. What, how is it different? You're, you're affiliated with the Institute. What appealed to you about having that affiliation, visiting us, uh, and what role can a research institute like this within a reserve bank play that might be complementary to what universities can do? 
Right. Uh, so first of all, congratula congratulations on the anniversary of the Institute. Uh, I mean, I think this is a great project. I mean, there's a lot to, I mean, the synergies between academic research in universities and institutes like this is, uh, is, can be very fruitful. And here is one particular example. I mean, I think when we look at policy in general and when we think about some of the failures in the US economy, one that is very evident to all of us is the concentrated poverty in, our, in certain cities and, and, the, and kind of the failure in terms of development of particular neighborhoods and cities that were you know, shining examples of uh, productivity at some point but when technology moved into other sectors where, you know, where some of that production was offshore or moved to other parts of the country, et cetera, kind of were left behind and you know, c poverty concentrated in certain parts of, of, of those cities and that led to given local financing at, of schools, for example, or you know, different other dimensions of the financing and organization of cities led to neighborhoods that were left behind with the people that were in those neighborhoods or are in those neighborhoods and implied very slow moving of people out of them. And so, you know, studying that and studying that in the context of everything that is happening in the U.S. economy, all the different technology trends, the movement across parts of the country and the different evolution of uh, the economy in different parts of the country is essential for all policies, when, when we talk about any sort of macro policy, trade policy, monetary policy, fiscal policy, understanding what's happening in those places and how the people in those places can or cannot be incorporated into other parts of the economy is essential. We don't have act models that really incorporate that to heart when we think about either monetary policy or fiscal policy. And so the construction of frameworks that can incorporate that type of phenomenon at the local level uh, into our, the, the kind of frameworks that we use for policy making is essential. And the institute, just to go back to your question, the institute exactly gives us the opportunity to try to work on that intersection that I think is really important. Bring people that know something about local fiscal, poly, uh, local, uh, fiscal issues, about concentration of poverty, about city structure, and bring them together with the people that are, are thinking about the macroeconomy and the role of monetary and fiscal policy. And the unique you know, configuration here at the Minneapolis FAT is that you have great people doing macro, and so the institutes brought in people that knew about these other topics as well. I think this is an ongoing project, of course, in terms of creating this, but I think it's a very important one. But you know, just to follow up, and something that you mentioned that is very relevant in our region. Our region is, by and large, very rural. And for years, maybe for longer than years, our region has been clamoring for more access to broadband. It's been a very big pain point for a lot of communities in our district. And uh, number one, the pandemic hit, and now everybody appreciates how valuable broadband is for education, for healthcare delivery, for work, et cetera. And Congress has now allocated a lot more money and when I talk to a lot of elected leaders, they say there's a lot of money in the pipeline that really could cover the whole country, so to speak, with broadband. I'm just curious, when you think about those trends, I wonder, on many dimensions, are we going to go back to the world as it was in 2019? Or, for example, with broadband and remote work, is the world just fundamentally different? And the trends you just talked about, you know, we got to reset our models yet again because the world is so different. We have to reset them yet again, I think. I mean, I think... Work from home is, I mean, we've talked a little bit about uh, today. Just, uh, I think this is a game changer for many types of jobs and for, the dis again, the distribution of economic activity in space, where people are going to be and the opportunities that they're going to have in different communities because of this. Now, of course, it's very heterogeneous across the population, across occupations, as Governor Jefferson you know, uh, said in his speech. So, so we need to take that into account and, and, and bring that in. I mean, I think broadband is obviously like a huge issue, but then um, thinking about the consequences that this is gonna have for our cities and our regions, 
is very important too, and we're just scratching this at this point. I mean, we're just guessing, right? So, so, so there's a lot of work to do to try to understand how the economy is going to settle on these issues. Karen, did you want to? Yeah, I, I just want to jump in. I mean, I, I agree, and I, um, I think you're flagging a really important uh, theme about staying nimble and how the economy is. Uh, you know, it's going to be a different economy going forward than the one we had before the pandemic. Um, and that's going to be important for the institute. Um, but I just want to say that the the, the so I, you know I think uh, kind of all the changes you're talking about um, you know with respect to remote work you know there's a lot of upside to that. Uh, but it but there is a sense in which it may be hard on on cities. It may really separate the more vibrant cities from the cities that are more struggling because uh, you know if you can work from anywhere you know why stay in the city that doesn't seem to be kind of have its act together that's, you know, taxing you a bunch but not delivering up on the, uh, you know, on the services. But I can say, I can say for the, for the state of, of Massachusetts, which is a very expensive place to live, this is getting back to your theme of affordable housing, uh, you know, there's a real worry about the fact that young people can't afford to live there. Uh, and that, yeah, we have, we have the jobs, but if they can work from any place, you know, are they going to stay in Massachusetts? But but, yeah. you know, but is that a public policy problem? If people say, well, Massachusetts is expensive, we're going to go live somewhere else and have that great job at the company headquartered in Massachusetts, but we have affordable housing in Minnesota. Come yeah. to Minnesota. Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's upsides, but I do worry it's going to set some city, cities in particular, that, that you know, you'll see more of a bifurcation right. from cities, uh, you know, that are really thriving right. to ones that are struggling. But I agree, there are upsides for the individual sure. and there are upsides for, yeah. for places that are vibrant. Yeah, so what I want to add to this conversation is a, a slightly different type of distributional issue that I really think plays out at the micro level, which I do think is a public policy issue, and it has to do with child care. Okay? Uh, this is something that we saw in the pandemic really have a profound effect on uh, work, even remote work, in terms of who was able to do it and when. And uh, I think this is an area in which there is a, a, a shared responsibility uh, to some extent. And again, going tying it back in, when we think about the maximum employment uh, uh, part of the Fed's mandate, really understanding who is going to have access uh, to the labor market, under what conditions, and uh, these, uh, in order to achieve that, uh, goal, then it seems as though the pandemic has presented us with a clear example that um, more needs to be done there uh, on a systemic basis to ensure that all people in the economy who want to participate uh, are going to be able to. Yeah. I, I'll say it's a very personal issue because I have a two-year-old and almost four-year-old, so we are active consumers in the child care market. Yes. <laughs> Spent a lot of time thinking about and trying to understand it. It's a very complicated sector. It's a, you know, for example, prior to the pandemic, as the labor market was tightening, if you do the math on what home childcare providers make, they make minimum wage or less than minimum wage. Mm -hmm. And so as Target started paying $12, $13 an hour, a lot of home childcare providers say, why am I killing myself? I can just go get a job at Target. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very complicated set of, set of situations, but I'm with you because you know, even though my wife and I have access to very high quality childcare for our two children, when COVID ripped through our household, even though we were all mild cases, my wife and I, our ability to work was just halted. You know? So for about 10 days, we were out of the labor market effectively as we were just trying to you know, deal with all of our local childcare issues. So I, I agree completely. I'll give you one more editorial comment on sure. this, which is, I finally concluded, you know, the idea of, afford, of good wages for childcare workers and affordability for families are directly in tension. And what I, here's my analogy. Almost every government in the world subsidizes farming. Why do they all subsidize farming? Because they want high prices for farmers and low prices for consumers. You can only achieve both of those if you subsidize farming. That's why all these countries subsidize farming. If we want decent wages for our child care workers and affordability for families, there's no way to do that unless the government steps in and makes, makes that possible. Yes. That's a political decision, mm -hmm. but that's what I find the a light bulb finally went off, but I could make sense of. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. Uh, other, Esteban, you wanted to get in here. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a great point with child care. 
I think it goes, it's in some sense, more general. To the extent that we see this work from home or remote work uh, trend continue, we're going to have to think about all these supplementary services mm -hmm. that, that, that the economy is going to have to provide in order for people to be able to do that work at home. Exactly. Right? <laughs> and, and, and so, and so childcare is obviously one of them, but it, there's also about, uh, there, and, and at the same time, we also need to rethink, say, commuting and how much we invest in, 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 in parts of the economy that we, where we were investing substantial resources because people were commuting all the time to their workplaces. So thinking about that kind of difference in our expenditure across different types of services uh, is gonna be important. Let me say one more thing where I think the promise of remote work is great, which is one of the great problems we've had in, in the US in terms of the distribution of economic activity is the fact that housing is not being built in the big centers where, produ where we've seen productivity grow. And so, you know, to the extent that suddenly workers don't have to move to these centers in order to do that work, you know, that releases that constraint or has the potential at least to, you know, soften that constraint in an important way. And, the, and just building more housing in uh, Silicon Valley, of course, that could be that would be a great policy in principle. But we all understand that there's a lot of issues and political constraints, etc., local political constraints to, to make that happen. So to the extent that that doesn't happen, this is an alternative way to solve some of these issues and get workers to enjoy some of the productivity in those sectors that otherwise they cannot uh, they, they cannot. Uh, um, take benefits from or Yeah, and so I need to make clear that I am not saying that Fed policy has <laughs> anything to do with, uh, in terms of the things, some of the issues that we're talking about. But as I said in my speech, these are concomitant conditions Correct. that will, uh, can, that need to be present and can be present uh, in order for the policies that we do have control over the Fed, Fed policy, monetary policy in particular, um, you know, can be the most effective. And so I just want to make sure I'm, I'm clear to everyone in this audience uh, about that. For sure. But I'll just say, you know, the issue of affordable housing, everywhere I go in our district, I mean, I know it's true nationally, but everywhere I go in our district, whether it's a red district or a blue district, it does not matter. This is one of the top issues mm -hmm. uh, that, that we have. And... Um, and so, I mean, I think I, you both have a different perspective on this because I kind of view it like, hey, if you, if you want to impose local constraints and you want to make yourself at a competitive disadvantage, you know, you, you should live with the results. Um, I, Karen, I sense that you're a little oh, more sympathetic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, no, I, I, the issue about local constraints is a huge one, and, and this is something Abby and I and Tara, who's back there, we all worked on this when we were working together at... at uh, in Washington, uh, I think it's more tractable in some communities than yeah. others. Um, I, you know, my my only mis I agree with all this conversation. My only kind of misgiving is that when you are ena enabling people in the knowledge economy to to you know move to places like Minnesota, that's that's fantastic for them, and that's going to be fantastic for the macro economy probably broadly. But you are leaving behind a service, a high contact services sector. Uh, who just you know you know wherever it is you left, and there there is going to be a transition cost yeah. uh, to that, which is you know c can those people just say okay now I'm going right. to go find a job where I can work remotely from someplace where there's affordable housing, or you know does more need to be done in terms of policy to make that transition? And I think that's that's some place where the institute could be working. Yeah, yeah. sorry, ask when you want to. Get and and we still don't know or know very little about the long-term productivity implications of the remote work, Correct. Mm -hmm. right? So I think that's a big, big issue, that we understand that it's going to kind of reshuffle people. We understand that maybe they don't have to commute as long. We understand that there may be benefits in you know, staying home, et cetera. But we don't know what, you know, what, what, what is that going to imply for long-term productivity growth in the US, whether, you know, Yes, maybe you're productive in doing the tasks that you know how to do and talking with the people that you already know, but innovation and other forms of more creative work are going to suffer as a result. And 
and we're not likely to know that very, you know, precisely for a long time until we see the outcome of the process. Uh, and because you know, by nature, these are long-term, long-term productivity changes uh, through you know innovation, patenting, etc. That you know we are going to see, uh, we are going to experience over time, and only then can we actually measure them carefully. You know, um, this, and I, I guess I want to move this forward because we could spend the whole time just talking <laughs> about work from home. Um, uh, something that I'm wrestling with is, you know, are we, what is the economy going to look like? What is normal going to look like once we get through the COVID shock and the inflation shock? For example, many of us, I believe, were viewed us in a world of secular stagnation or something like that prior to the pandemic. Are we going back to that world or are we going to a very different world? And I'm just curious if anybody wants to opine on that. Karen's I nodding your like head. Pie. So I, I, this, this is um, just from the fiscal policy maker point of view. One element of that secular stagnation conversation uh, was um, uh, very low interest rates. And um, that kind of led to, I think, a real change among some leading voices in the uh, economics profession, uh, kind of recognizing that there was um, kind of more fiscal space to attend to kind of priorities. I mean, I think no, nobody, you know, was arguing we don't need to fix problems with um, kind of Social Security and, and Medicare financing to make sure those programs can continue to kind of support our older population. Um, those fixes need to uh, be made. But there were people saying, but as for kind of imposing broader austerity, you know, given how low interest rates are, that's not what we should be doing. We have other priorities in this, this country. We have big issues around inequality and, um, and mobility. And we should be kind of using uh, fiscal policy uh, in, in, in my world that would be paying for it, but to kind of put in place kind of investments in people that would change that. But I will say kind of what I am hearing now is um, uh, comments from, uh, you know, some of the people that were on that side of, you know, it's time to do investments who are now kind of looking at the post-pandemic world and saying much more government debt, not just in the United States, uh, but, but globally, um, higher interest rates, maybe higher real interest rates because of higher inflation premiums. Um, and they are starting to kind of change their view about, uh, uh, you know, the calculus around kind of making these investments. And I just think that makes it all the more important that we have um, places like the Institute, uh, you know, um, encouraging, facilitating research that um, kind of, you know, quantifies the investments of these, uh, uh, you know, the, the payoff from these investments, because I just think, um, that's that having that kind of evidence is going to be invaluable to making sure we can go through with that kind of policy. Yes, Mark. I mean, I just want to kind of emphasize or bring into the discussion globalization and the importance mm -hmm. to to don't turn our backs to globalization, trade, and the ability of firms to sell to consumers all around the world and for others to sell to us. I mean, I think th that process of globalization has been very important and was very important in the, all the process that has brought us here. And, and I see like a very dangerous uh, trend here in you know, pulling back on globalization without really thinking very carefully about what that's going to imply. And one of the things I think that that is a, in danger is exactly productivity growth and the type of innovations that, that firms in the US are doing because a lot of that innovation is based on the ability of these firms not only to sell to local customers but to sell all around the world and to expand their operations across a space, if you will, both within the US but also across other places. And so Good, good, good innovation, good research that leads to that innovation is very expensive. It's becoming more expensive. It's becoming more of a fixed cost for your operations. And in order to be able to do it, you need a big, big market. And so 
And so, you know, let's be careful with that. And let's not turn our back on globalization. I think this is very important. And I don't see the urgency uh, in policy making on this front. I guess what I would say when I look at the intermediate term of the next five years, I think um, we as policymakers and possibly participants in the economy are going to have to get used to a great deal of uncertainty. I think that's going to become a persistent um, um, feature of, of economic life. I think um, the US economy and other uh, economies of the world have experienced significant shocks that uh, it takes time for adjustments to take place. There's great uncertainty about what's the process generating the data that we're observing. And so uh, given that lack of understanding, uh, it's, it's going to be necessary for us to uh, tolerate more uh, uncertainty than would have what would have been the case, uh, say in the pre-pandemic world. Um, so that's going to take some time to play out. It's not something that strikes me as particularly comfortable, but I think it's going to be a reality, and I think it's going to have a major impact on how fiscal and monetary policy is being made going forward. Yeah. And you know, one of the things that's, that touches on a lot of this that I hear a lot from businesses in our region is, you know, they need more workers. They always say, when I travel around right now, it's still the number one issue that businesses talk about is they can't find the workers that they need and they're paying up more. And they all kind of are learning, hey, immigration actually has a really important role to play here. And it has throughout our history and it is in increasingly important going forward. And when I talk with elected leaders from our region, both sides of the aisle, they all get it 100%. And I say, you know, all of your peers that I talk to also get it. So why can't you get anything done? Uh, and it's just politically challenging. But some businesses have said to me, well, we would like to recruit these workers from abroad, bring them here as our employees here. We can't get them because of immigration rules. But with Zoom, we can still access them. And their ability to hire them abroad is increased with technology. So I mean, it's better than nothing. My personal editorial here, it's better than nothing being able to access that talent. Um, but it would still be great if we could reform our immigration system. I don't know if anybody wants to react to that. I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think um, it's, uh, yeah, I, th I think it's been a real problem. I mean, you can look at kind of the, the trend in foreign born workers, you see a clear break in 2018 when restrictions were put in place and uh, and that didn't improve is. with the new administration. I mean, there were lots of complications. Now it, there has been some loosening of the rules, but visa processing is incredibly uh, slow right now. I'm sure your businesses are dealing with that. Um, but just to, <laughs> it ties back. I mean, it's directly related, in my view, to monetary po making monetary policy. I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, uh, you know, at least among macroeconomists broadly, what they were thinking a year ago was that um, kind of the labor market was uh, starting to, to strengthen and that was that was great and you know when we did that in the late 2010s people came into the labor force right yeah. we didn't get inflation because people came into the labor force yeah. um, and the fact is I think as we know now that you know we've been really challenged by what's going on uh, with labor supply um, and trying to figure that out and some of that is you know US workers and low participation I think we understand some things about why older people aren't participating although I think there's scope for remote work to bring them back there's a younger group of people that we don't understand well as all at all but the third piece of that is the fact that we can't the foreign born workers are just kind of their share of the economy is just kind of far lower than than what we thought it would be pre-pandemic because of the break of the term. Very quickly then, I've got one more question and I know we have to wrap up. Go ahead yeah, I mean, I think one thing where, where, where research can help is try to understand what has changed the perception of immigrants. And I, I think one hypothesis why we see so much opposition, so much op political opposition to immigration is exactly this concentration, this local concentration of poverty that people see and they, they say, well, given that we see that, do we really need more 
people in, in the US. So to what extent does the distribution of economic activity and the fact that uh, the, this concentration, these problems in certain places that we've had of concentrated poverty, how is that linked to this changing perception about immigration? I think is potentially an important issue. All right, so last question. Um, I'm getting the time signal from Abby. Some people are not supportive of the Fed studying these issues. I get letters from time to time from certain elected leaders. Uh, you know, there's a, there are 100 members of the Senate and there are 100 different opinions, so uh, some are more outspoken than others. How would you respond to those who say, hey, this is not your business, uh, stay out of it? Anybody? Uh, um, so, <laughs> so I think, I think we have, um, you know, outlined ways um, already that uh, there are direct connections. We, we haven't, um, I guess we did mention a little bit, I mean, let's do some, some great work on um, uh, kind of how regressive a tax inflation is. Uh, and I think that's, you know, if you're trying to understand the, the trade-offs when you're adjusting policy, that's essential. Uh, but um, I think understanding the fragilities in the economy uh, are kind of really, really relevant to this debate that's going on outside in the outside world about whether the Fed's over tightened or not. Are the actions, you know, if we see job loss, is that going to be magnified by, you know, households who are so financially fragile that it has ripple effects uh, through the economy? It's kind of related to these questions about why the labor supply hasn't come back. But if I could just say kind of one more thing outside the realm of economics. Um, I just think, you know, trust in the Fed uh, and their credibility has been just such an important part of the success of monetary policy in the decades leading up to the pandemic. And I don't know how you um, kind of, how you, how you retain that trust unless you are uh, doing things to make sure the economy is working for, for everyone. I think that's so important. That's well put. Um, if someone were to ask me about this issue, I would send them a copy of my speech. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And yeah, I think one thing that you've all touched on is the, I, I would say the regional banks do have this unique position in their regions as being a trusted source of uh, research and analysis. And one specific example that I'm going to end on, many of you know the Minneapolis Fed is doing a long-term study of the impact of raising the minimum wage in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And we're doing that in partnership with the University of Minnesota. And we were selected by the cities to serve that role as researcher because they literally told us we were the one research institution in the region that everybody would trust to do the analysis honestly. Mm -hmm. Both the labor community would trust us as well as the business community. And that was our commitment. Of course, we're gonna do our very best and we're gonna be transparent. And so uh, I think we do have that role to play. So I could have talked to these folks. I, I love having really smart people to talk to because I learn a lot. I could have talked to them all morning but uh, please join me in thanking them for Governor Jefferson's speech and our panelists.
All right, we're about ready to get started. So if you could take your seats. All right, so we're happy to start the research uh, presentations that are part of this conference. There will be six research papers. These papers were selected by a scientific committee that included research economists here within the Federal Reserve System, as well as research economists in academia. Each session will start with an author of a paper presenting their work for approximately 25 minutes, and then we'll move on to a discussant who will discuss, critique, criticize, have free reign to um, expand our horizons on the paper for 10 to 15 minutes. But we want to save time, another 10 to 15 minutes, for questions and answers from the audience. So be thinking about uh, any questions you have about the papers, and we hope that you will participate as well. The first session is going to be two papers. The first is by Kartik Satreya at the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. The discussant is Fiona Gregg. The second paper will be by Eric Nielsen, who's at the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. And that will be discussed by Andrew Goodman-Bacon, who's here at the Federal Reserve, Board, uh, Federal Reserve in Minneapolis within the Opportunity and Inclusive Growth Institute. So we'll start with Kartik. Great. Uh, thanks, everyone, for having me. Thanks, Amanda. Um, this paper is joint work with uh, Ryan Mather, Jose Mustre del Rio, and Juan Sanchez. There we go. Um, the goal of this paper actually was teed up by something that Karen said a minute ago in terms of understanding the pass-through of shocks to populations that may be unable to smooth through them effectively. And in particular, we're interested in understanding how shocks pass through once you take account, as seriously as we can, for something that we might call financial distress. And in particular, that's the definition I'll work with, which is households that are 30 days or more past due on some unsecured debts that they have. So why should you look at this measure? The way we're thinking about this is upfront it serves us as a sense of a revealed preference measure of perhaps people having difficulty smoothing through or facing high marginal costs of, of uh, additional resources in the present. Um, they, people face higher APRs, uh, they, their credit scores deteriorate, and so on. Um, it's fairly persistent, and I'll show you that in a second. Uh, it tends to line up well with measures that people have computed for marginal propensities to consume, and it's also common, so it's something that I think from a macro point of view is worth uh, thinking about. It also turns out in the couple of shocks that uh, I'll be using to illustrate how financial distress matters, that, it, that it, in the data it's correlated with uh, subsequent severity of the shocks that are actually received. Um, and really the bottom line is I'll show you that models with, that take this into account do have different implications for consumption pass through uh, compared to models without it. So this is just a notion of persistence. So take the, look at the black dots first. That's just asking at any given age, uh, what's the probability that somebody is in financial distress the way I've defined it? This is actually a slightly more severe uh, version of, of financial distress. And then now take, a, so you can see that it's you know, somewhere between 10 and 15% of the population uh, throughout the life cycle. Now look at the red dots. Uh, the red dots are people two years hence, if they're financially distressed now, what are the odds that they're distressed then? And you can see that in terms of size, that's about three to four times as, as likely to be the case as it was before. And then the last point I want to make is that as time goes on, you can see these lines starting to come back, but it takes a while. So that's the persistence notion that I'd like you to have. I'd also like to move this slide forward, but um, well, let me see. There we go. So um, yeah, so the other thing is that this, is, this has to do with the, the measure of um, correlation that, that initial household distress in a particular geography has, circa 2002, say, has with the change in house prices that actually happened uh, in the Great Recession and thereafter. And you can see that, that higher financially distressed areas ended up experiencing bigger shocks later. We're not asserting anything about causality. It's just that these things go together. If you look more recently at COVID, you'll look at income, uh, at, at the disruption to income. And here you can see that if you look at the most distressed households, that's the fifth quintile of distress. You can see that they are much more likely to report a very substantial loss of earnings uh, at, at, at various dates in the, in the immediate aftermath of the pandemic relative to their uh, less w distressed counterparts in Q1, okay? 
So that's you know, something that's gonna inform the way we do experiments. So we're gonna build a very standard, I would argue, life cycle model of consumption and savings, the kind that many in this room uh, work with. And we're gonna, take, uh, we're gonna take debt default seriously enough that we'll have a notion of financial distress that, that we can talk about that really uh, corresponds to the notion of delinquency. We're gonna estimate that model to match you know, some facts about financial distress. We'll try to be, you know, do a decent job there. That's gonna estimate, a, that's gonna reveal, I would say, a significant degree of, of ex ante heterogeneity, the way we've set the model up across households in a way that will be material for, for the pass-through that we're actually interested in in the end. Then we're gonna hit the model with aggregate shocks of the kind that I just described, income shocks and house price shocks, uh, and then tell you what happens, okay? So in particular, you know, I've talked about all these things and I think Amanda's uh, time constraints I think are gonna make me keep rolling here. What, what we're not gonna do is, this is not, this is about pass through. It's not a, a big general equilibrium exercise of if this shock happens here, are all the things that are gonna happen in the economy later on. Um, it's not something where we're, we, we want you to think about these two shocks as emblematic of things that can happen to people. One is an asset price shock, the other one is an income shock. It is not a model of COVID per se or anything like that. And then we're not gonna take into account policy here because we're actually, again, interested in pass-through. Okay, so what we're gonna find is at the aggregate level, differences in financial distress across households do amplify uh, the response of consumption regardless of, of, of the, which, which of the two shocks that, that, I, you know, that I hit the economy with. And the order of magnitude is like a roughly two, I would say. At the individual level, the importance of financial distress turns out to depend on which shock is being received, whether it's an asset price shock or whether it's something that's disrupting their labor income. And in particular, when house prices fall, models without financial distress, and I'll explain why, uh, generate actually a decline in consumption, inequality, and poverty. Okay, so, so ceteris paribus, within this environment, what you'll have is a compression of the consumption distribution following uh, a decline in house prices that you won't have in a model without it. On the other hand, with, uh, with respect to income or earnings, you're gonna get larger increases in consumption inequality, which is, I think, what many of us would have expected right from the beginning, as well as uh, movements in poverty in the same direction as, as the shock. Okay, and then the correlation channel that I showed you that we wanted to admit a priori, namely that are the places that are uh, more distressed at any given moment more likely to receive the bigger brunt of a given macro shock, how important is that? And it's gonna turn out in this setting that it doesn't actually push things very far, okay? So I'm gonna be very quick now. So this is gonna be a standard life cycle model. The one thing I wanna draw your attention to is, so people like housing and non-housing, um, people are gonna, we're gonna allow for people to be different. Um, and in particular, we're gonna allow, we're gonna load things into the discount factor here, and there are gonna be two values, low and high. And you can think of those as, as subjective discount factors that are reflective of a bunch of things that may be going on in people's lives. We don't, I'm not going to claim that it is some deep structural uh, feature of, of, of a person, um, but it is something that allows us to very quickly get to uh, you know, an environment that produces financial distress uh, in the ways that, that we want, okay? And denote, just for notation, S sub uh, capital L is just the share of people in a given uh, quintile that are going to be, uh, quintile of financial distress that are gonna have that um, uh, the, the, the low discount factor, or the, the low beta, the high discount factor, okay? And this is gonna be disciplined by financial, persist, uh, financial distress facts. People are gonna have houses, they're gonna come in many sizes. Um, we're gonna follow a literature that thinks about mortgages um, and allow them to borrow, because we do want balance sheets to happen. We want meaningful notions of mortgage debt, unsecured debt, mortgage default, credit card default, bankruptcy, we want all those things in there because they all play a role in, in shaping uh, balance sheets, okay? So there's a loan to value constraint, lambda, and then this is gonna be important, um, although in this talk today, I, I will not do justice to it. These functions Q are running around. So those of you who work with default models, you already know this. There's gonna be a discount applied to any loan that a person asks for, which is the reciprocal of which is the interest rate that they pay. That's going to be a function of all the pieces parts. Um, I'm afraid to touch things, there we go. That, that's gonna be a function of all the things that, that describe their state, that influence their, uh, their likelihood of defaulting in the future, just as you might think it, it, it should. 
And so that's gonna be playing a role in the background in terms of when constraints expand, when they tighten for people and for whom they tighten, okay? So that's, that's important here. Um, so mortgage, mortgage, mortgages can be defaulted on. Um, asset markets are incomplete uh, in, in the usual way that people are st stuck uh, saving and dissaving in a bond. There's a level of completeness potentially that can come from the fact that you can default when you need to default. In equilibrium, it's not, typically it's not the case that that's actually a, a big uh, important thing. Now, if we're gonna talk about, uh, if we're gonna talk about uh, financial distress, well, I mentioned that, that there's a cost of doing so. So in this case, the way it happens in the model is that we're gonna say, if you decide not to go bankrupt, not to repay your debt, but simply to stop paying, then what you're doing is you're forcing your incumbent creditor to just roll over the debt. What are they gonna do? So in this model, they're gonna do two things. One is that they're gonna, they're gonna basically make a, they're gonna play a lottery that says, I'm gonna discharge your debt or not with probability eta. And with one minus eta, I'm gonna let you roll it over. Okay, so this is to reflect the fact that creditors sometimes give up in informal credit proceedings from collecting, okay? So, that's what we wanted to get at. And this, I'm sorry, and this is, is a penalty rate. This is gonna be something like 20%. So it's gonna be expensive to do, it's not a freebie to do this. If you go bankrupt, you're gonna pay a filing fee and then that wipes clean your debt. So your balance sheet in some sense, in one way gets cleaned up substantially. Okay, again, uh, sorry, let's see if this works. Again, you, you have this function applying for uh, non-mortgage non related assets or debt there's a Q function for those, okay? So now, now you, we've endogenized all the pricing of, of loans, whether it's for a mortgage, whether it's for, uh, you know, whether it's for non-mortgage non related debts. Okay, so I'm gonna be very quick now to talk about if, you're, if you can be a homeowner, well, that means you can also not be a homeowner. So in this case, you can rent or you can buy. If you, regardless of which of those things that you do, you, you have some extra options. So if you rented a house, you can repay the, the, the financial debts that you have or save, you can go bankrupt, you can go delinquent, or you can buy a house. So we're gonna preclude that you're defaulting and buying a house in the same period, so we're gonna say if you're a buyer, you just choose the house size, you choose the mortgage, and then you do whatever you're supposed to do as promised in the, in the consumer credit market. Okay. If you're a homeowner, you have more choices. I think I already verbalized all these things. You can pay, you can pay your mortgage, uh, you can refinance it, um, it, let's say you get richer, for instance, or you expect higher income, you may want to move into a bigger house, uh, or, you may, or your, your situation changes, in which case you're eligible for better terms in the credit market, you may refinance, you may default. If you default, you go into the rental market, you can sell your house and go rent, uh, and you can sell your house and buy another house, okay? This is all the, the, the presumably the reasonably complete menu of things that, that you wanna do. Okay, so then what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, try to calibrate the model or estimate it in this case. And we're gonna look at the United States as a collection of zip codes. And in some sense, um, I'm gonna get some water. In some sense, you're gonna have, um, you're gonna think of five labs, okay? That's what I want you to do, is if you collected the zip codes, for instance, that have a particular level of financial distress, put them together. They're obviously not geographically contiguous necessarily. But what does tie them together is that they are all described by a similar incidence of financial distress, okay? So those are our five labs. We want then to shock those labs, add up the implications of them, and then produce statistics that I will report to you. Hopefully that makes total sense. I don't know, somebody was laughing, but uh, I, it made sense to me. Um, so the key takeaways is that the, the model implies significant parameter differences across quintiles, and we can talk about them later, but it also generates, we did, we did a validation exercise within the paper to say, okay, look, if you shock this thing, does it produce things like NPCs that look sane uh, for labor income shocks, for, for house price declines? And I think the answer is, I'm gonna claim is yes. And once we do that, we're kind of set. So let me uh, go very quickly here, because I wanna explain results to you and give time. Um, Okay, so for house prices, what are we doing? We're saying, take, a, take the decline in prices that we observed in 07, 08, and then feed that into the model in, in the way that it's, it, you think, can think of it as like a permanent shock to, to house prices. And then for earnings, we're gonna follow Alex uh, uh, Bick and Adam Blandin helped us by, by giving us some, some data to think about declines in income over this period, and we're gonna be able to characterize the, the set of people who lost various levels of income compared to, to pre-COVID, um, the pre-COVID period, 
and we're going to feed those in as an unanticipated transitory change. Now, just very quickly, in the in the uh, the first bullet point, that's a we're making the house price change a permanent change. We could have thought about it as a, also a transitory change, but sort of in keeping with asset price logic, we're thinking, okay, th this price changes. You don't necessarily expect it to change back or something like that right away. Um, but that's something that I think we can talk about. And then for labor income, we're saying this is going to be a, uh, an unanticipated transitory shock. So it's MIT all the way um, at this point. So. The key takeaway is that both the shocks replicate, uh, we replicate that the severity uh, increases with financial distress. And now we're gonna get to the question. So we have a, so the, the main one, I think this is back to, back to Karen's point at the beginning, what, what's the amplification rule? So if you cared about aggregates, uh, what is it that you're gonna learn about uh, financial distress? And so how much more or less does consumption change? And this is, this is non-housing consumption that I wanna talk about. Um, uh, when you when you allow for financial distress versus when you don't. So obviously, we'll need a counterfactual to, to answer this question. The model is kind of geared up to shut things down. Okay, um, And then what feature of the model is crucial? Because there's five million things going on. Um, you know, I'm going to try to do a very game attempt to, to parse things out, and hopefully you know, I'll succeed at least partially. The three statistics that I want you to think about for the aggregate are a measure of consumption dispersion. So take the 90-10 ratio. It's a simple way of thinking about what's happening. The second is if you want to think about absolutes. 90-10 doesn't tell you anything necessarily about the absolute, so you can think about absolute consumption. Uh, and you can look at a measure of consumption-based poverty. And then, of course, you know, so many of us are macro people, so we think, OK, well, what's, what's the headline number on delta C for the US, let's say, when it's hit by a shock? Okay, Again, ceteris paribus. Okay, so. What we're going to do is um, let me look at the time. Yeah, what I let me. Uh, yeah. So we have the baseline model. The baseline model um, has a lot of features in it. It's got the heterogeneity. It's got the default options that that I listed earlier. And now what we want to do is we want to say, okay, well, what are the things that you could shut down? You could shut down the correlation, for example. That's the the simplest thing you could do b between the ex ante financial distress level and the severity of the shock. Okay. You compare those two economies, the baseline versus the no correlation economy, that's, your cor that's what you would call the correlation channel. That's what's being contributed. You could then say, OK, now let's look, at a let's look at a version of our baseline model where we don't have the correlated shocks going on between how distressed the place is and how bad the shock later is going to be. So shut that down. But keep the baseline model with all of its heterogeneity and all of its default options. Now ask, OK, I'm going to shut down the ability to use the bankruptcy system. Um, we get, we're going to call that a a no borrowing model, you can actually relax that, and we have done it. And those of you who work with these models will understand why it doesn't actually matter that much whether you allow for borrowing or not, because the stationary distribution of, of debts is going to adjust accordingly to deliver the proximity of people to a constraint. Okay, So, we, so you call that the no financial distress or no borrowing model. Okay? Then we're, we can say, OK, if, if that effect it, between the baseline and that model, that's going to be the kind of direct effect of having financial distress around. That's the way in which we'll talk about the direct effect. Then lastly, we can talk about shutting down the heterogeneity and ask, well, what if I shut that down too? Then I can compare the economy that I just described, the no borrowing economy with heterogeneity to the one without it. That's like an indirect effect, okay? So, so that's, like, that's the problem. There's a lot of stuff going on, so you have to pick some sequence of experiments to, to, to parse it out. Okay. So here's a headline uh, set of results first. So what, what happens to consumption at the 90-10 ratio? So look in the second, in the middle column. That simple model is what I'm calling the model that doesn't have financial distress in it. Okay. <coughs> so that one, you can see that the 90-10 ratio goes up in the wake of a shock. Um, so consumption is more unequal. Poverty also, consumption-based poverty also goes up. But look at the baseline model. These things go in the other direction. So why might that be? And the reason is that in the, in the baseline model, when you take into account financial distress facts, you end up getting kind of the right mass of people who are constrained in the housing market who are also not homeowners. So that's kind of important. So what happens when a house price tanks? I and mean, we're not used to, I, mean, I don't know, I wasn't generally used to thinking about house prices tanking as being good news, but within this, Within the experiment here, it is good news because there's a bunch of people that are on the edge of not being homeowners that now get 
have this asset get pulled into being feasible for them. Okay, so step one is that they're gonna start changing their consumption uh, towards the thing that has become relatively cheaper. Step two, I didn't show you this, but their preferences are gonna be simple Cobb Douglas over housing and non-housing. So I wanna do more of, more of everything. Uh, and then the third thing is that there's an income effect going on uh, in, the, in this model. This is a permanent shock in a life cycle model to house prices. These guys are richer. So 10, the 10th percentile goes up, okay? But 90, 90 is just getting killed because 90 is super long in real estate and this sucks. So, so they, they, they go down, that's why this thing gets, gets smushed. Um, and then I think that the, the poverty stuff is, is essentially the same mechanism uh, at work, okay? Okay, and now if you're interested in aggregates, like I said, um, you know, it's roughly on the order of one and a half to two. I think I said two before, maybe this is a little bit less. This is the aggregate level of consumption because it can be true that, that the 90th percentile of consumption isn't doing that much while the 10th percentile is doing a lot, but the 90th percentile of consumption in the US consumes a lot more than the 10th percentile. So it's like you, you have that going on as well, okay? So I'm gonna, uh, now let's, look, let's do the same exercise for, um, for earnings. Okay, so in earnings land, you can see that once again, um, you know, well actually, not once again, in, the, in earnings land, you can see that things move in the same direction, okay? So this is kind of clear that where the shock to earnings, like, like the one that happened in COVID, is causing people a lot of difficulty. Um, it, first of all, you can look at the 90-10 ratio, and I'll show you a picture in a second. At the 90-10 ratio, those who are doing uh, relatively well can typically smooth through shocks. Remember, this is a transitory shock to labor income. Um, they're smoothing through it. P90 is kind of doing this, maybe it does a little bit of this. P10 is going down a lot. P10 received big shocks to uh, earnings, and the model at, in its steady state parks a lot of people that have the highest levels of financial distress close to the constraint, and furthermore, close to where the credit market is actually going to you know, treat them actuarially fairly at that point. That's, th th in some sense, that's one of the things that's always lurking in models with default, which is you're gonna be treated the, you know, according to the risk that you pose. So when your circumstances deteriorate, that's also gonna cause you a problem. So in the house price example, actually, it will cause you more of a problem, in fact, than it will here, because this is a transitory shock. That was a permanent shock. In the permanent shock case, if things go bad for you and hold real estate, the credit, the unsecured credit market will also move against you because now you have less, you have less wealth, um, okay? So that stuff is, that's the set of mechanisms going on. If I had more time, I would show you more um, pictures of loan pricing. In fact, I, I, I should have done that, um, but that, that's lurking in the background. Now, the, the thing I wanna draw your attention to is the size of the change um, in terms of pass-through. So for income shocks, once you take financial distress seriously and match it, in the model, you're getting a, a pretty substantial amplification of, of the change in poverty as well as, as, in, as, well as in the 90-10 ratio. So this is sort of just bad news all the way around. There's no countervailing tailwind from a cheaper asset that you don't happen to own. Okay. Now at the aggregate, you see a version of the same thing here, which is that the aggregate consumption response actually doubles roughly. Mm. Again, in this case, it's, it's negative. So, you know, I'll repeat, no matter, even in the case of the house price shock where some of the measures of inequity shrink, aggregate consumption is still, is still moving in the other direction, even if some groups in the economy are actually um, finding it better um, to have an, ac an asset that comes within reach. Okay, so now we wanna disentangle all these things, so I'm gonna just show you some two pictures and then I'll stop. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so lots of bars. So what I want you to focus on first is look at the black bar and the, and the purple bar. Um, the black bar is the baseline, full-blown, everything model. And then the, the other one, the purple line, is the one where you just shut down the correlation in the sense that just because you're in a relatively more distressed place doesn't mean the intensity of the macro shock gets, doesn't get disproportionately allocated to you. Everybody gets the same shock basically, they're sharing equally in the aggregate. So it should be clear that there's not much action there in the case. So the, the purple bar and the blue bar, uh, purple bar and the black bar look the same in both cases, okay? So that's not doing a lot of the work here. However, oh, I think I didn't, I'm sorry if you can't see this. This is the percentile of the consumption distribution, okay? So the model has a steady state, 
there's a, there's a non-degenerate distribution of consumption, you can then ask about people at various points in that distribution. That's what is going on here. So if you look at people here at the 10th percentile, so these are the people that are doing the, you know, the worst, well, what happens in the case of, of a house price shock? Well, you can see that their consumption goes up. I already talked about that you know, more than once. But now look at, compare the purple bar to the blue bar, okay? The purple bar and the blue bar really is giving you a sense of the direct effect of financial distress. That's apples to apples, baseline model without correlation, no, no default model without correlation, okay? That's apples to apples. Well, here, once you do that, you, because that model doesn't have kind of the right set of people in it, you actually see a general decline in consumption there, okay? And then the rest of the picture is actually more straightforward. The, the effects are much smaller of these shocks as you head up the distribution of consumption because people can smooth better. That's going to be overlapping with people that are well healed more generally. Okay? Now if you do this for the, for the earnings uh, shock, you get a, a different result. The correlation channel is still minuscule. What is, what is very different is now look at the blue bar versus the red bar. So now what's going on is that w to process an income shock, it really matters how close to the constraint you are, right? And so once you get a model that strips out any heterogeneity the way we have it and treats everybody identically and makes no attempt to grapple with FD and its implications, you'll understate drastically the, the, the effect. So the model produces that red bar, which is a tiny drop in consumption relative to what it produces in the, in the, blue, uh, in the blue case, okay? So this is, this is a sense in which the heterogeneity that financial distress encodes about the population ends up showing up in the, in the so I'm timing myself out. Um, so I think that's, that's actually perfect. I'll, I'll stop there. So thanks. How do I get my presentation up? Okay. Great. Um, well, while it's coming up, uh, Kartik, thank you for that presentation um, and the and the opportunity to comment on this fantastic paper. Um, as it, it was an unkind ask from Abigail to ask an empiricist or somebody who, who looks at big data all the time to uh, to comment on a on a on a model. Um, I, I'm currently at Vanguard. I just joined um, a, a couple months ago after being at J.P. Morgan Chase for seven eight years, uh, leading research at the J.P. Morgan Chase Institute. So I'm going to comment on this paper uh, largely from the perspective of um, some of the empirics that we see. Um, and while we're waiting, I, I mean, mostly I just want to kick off by saying uh, the quality of the research question is, is fantastic, right? What are the implications of financial distress uh, for consumption um, when you think about financial, uh, uh, sorry, what are the impacts of macroeconomic shocks on consumption if you think about and take seriously financial distress? And um, not just in terms of, uh, you know, who is impacted, but how they are impacted and why. And I think that's really important for three reasons. Um, number one, as Kartik uh, points out, you know, obviously there is, there is evidence that recessions disproportionately impact um, communities that have more financial distress generally. Um, and it's not just when they're experiencing financial distress, but also, um, at, but also there's sort of a permanent or a stickiness to that financial distress, right? So it's not that I'm, I'm, I'm struggling right now, it's that I'm just generally always struggling, right? And so I think that that's a really important feature here. But the, the third reason is that as we think about um, the policy response to these macroeconomic shocks, right? We're, we're, we have a tool set of macroeconomic policies and fiscal policies, and we need to understand better what to do and what to use when, and what are the implications of those different policies in terms of um, consumption inequalities over time. Okay, here we go. Thank you. Um, so I've, 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 I've made it through um, some of these, these, these important reasons of why this research question matters so much. Um, so the answer to this question uh, that the team took on, it turns out to be 
very complicated. <laughs> I found myself struggling with this paper because, and 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 after I I sort of. Did, you know, pieced it apart into its various permutations, I gave myself a little grace. Um, but if you think about it, you know, first of all, they're, they're, they're trying, they actually define two definitions of financial distress, not just the 30-day delinquency, but also, you know, barring limits. Um, they're considering three possible channels uh, by which financial distress impacts consumption, right, this direct, this indirect, and this correlational uh, channel. Uh, they're considering three different uh, consumption outcomes that uh, this may impact. And finally, they're doing this in the context of um, two different types of macroeconomic shocks. So in the spirit of sort of less is more, I, I, would, I would be interested to see how the team can actually um, reduce the dimensions of this question, because I actually think um, you know, uh, you know, less could be more. Um, I'm going to say sort of four things about the paper. Uh, the first is that the indirect channel, what you talked about, the, these different types, the, the, the stickiness of either its liquidity constraints or um, you know, this, uh, this impatience, I think, is really, really important. Um, and it bears out in the, in the model but, um, and in the results of the model, but I think it's, we see it very clearly in the empirical um, data during COVID. So I'm going to show you um, some work that we did at the J.P. Morgan Chase Institute where we were looking at people who had lost a job and received unemployment insurance. And we're looking the, at this through the lens of checking accounts so we can actually see what's going on with income, what's going on with spending, what's going on with balances. And what was so interesting about COVID is if you recall in the beginning of COVID, um, the UI supplements of $600 weekly were so generous that they actually more than fully offset people's income. So on the one hand, people were shocked with this negative income shock, and then they were shocked with actually a positive income shock. And you could actually see that in terms of what happened to their income. It actually rose above baseline. Um, and so here, and just to be clear, we're, we're comparing those who, uh, who are unemployed in blue to those who remained employed during this period in purple. Uh, the spending impacts were also big. Um, but notice there are two important moments in this chart. One is at the beginning when UI benefits started, right? Spending skyrockets. But then look, when the $600 supplements were turned off, spending drops. And those are really different, interesting moments because the first moment, we're hitting people with fiscal supports when they're in a low liquidity state, right? But as we can see from the checking account balances, actually their checking account balances are rising even as they're spending more because the benefits were so generous. And so at the end of this moment, right, when we turn off the supplements, now they're in a high liquidity state. And so you can really, it, 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 you, th this tells us that there must be something in this permanent heterogeneity that is not about liquidity constraints, but is actually more about um, their impatience. And also say, you know, these high, these, the MPCs are high, right? They're 0.43 at the beginning, they're 0 0.30 um, at the end, and we do another one when we look at, you know, what happened to the $300 supplement. Um, so all to say the indirect channel, I think, is really important, especially, um, uh, but thinking about what are we actually really measuring there? What, what is that, um, that special sauce? <laughs> what is encoded, is the word you use, what is encoded in financial distress in, in, in a more permanent way? Okay, more generally, I think it's, uh, you know, the authors do a beautiful uh, say, promise sort of dangle at the end of their tape, the paper that, you know, they're not looking at policy. They're just looking at the macroeconomic shocks. And, and I would urge the, the um, authors to, to think about, well, maybe can you model policy? Can you, you know, given the magnitude that Karen talked about of fiscal supports that happened during COVID, I think it's really important to think about these two things together. I um, mean, you can, and very briefly, if we just looked at what happened to checking account balances over the course of COVID, they were they skyrocketed, especially for low-income families. So fin the very financial distress that Karthik is talking about was alleviated as a result of fiscal um, supports, and it wasn't just unemployment insurance. It was the three rounds of stimulus. It was the um, student loan and, and mortgage forbearance. It was the child tax credit. It was, it was, it was, there was a lot there. So. Um, you know, thinking about policy as po possibly a target for your, um, uh, uh, for your, of your model. Um, now I'm going to make a, a very technical comment, which is that 
you know, after seven, eight years of looking at data in, in, in checking accounts, you know, one MPC feels mushy <laughs> and the other feels very sharp. Um, so the income of, um, so if I, if I just look at sort of every single time you hit a, a, a somebody's financial life with a positive income shock, you immediately see a spending response. So too on the flip side. Every time you see you hit an, an, a checking account with a negative income shock, you immediately see a spending response, even in the face of entirely transitory shocks. And so this is a, just a chart of showing what happens to out-of-pocket healthcare spending when people get their tax refund, right? And so you can see this very sharp response. Um, and and so I, I think the uh, you know the the MPCs that you're training your model towards you know out of income shocks they're big they're short lived they're they're as a result of short uh, of of short income shocks recognizing that you know recessions are often uh, somewhat quite uh, short lived. Um, on the housing side, though, a housing shock, you know, we spent five years trying to calculate an MPC out of housing prices. And of course, we were doing this actually in the context of a, a housing price growth, so 2012 to 2018, and we found basically zero. Uh, we could not find a positive spending impact out of housing price increases. And it turns out we're not the only ones who have found actually no spending impact out of housing price um, shocks. And so all to say, as I as I empathized with the challenge that you, that with, with sort of the premise of your paper, it felt like, um, you know, even as you articulated, the the MPCs that you're modeling out of out of income, where they're out of a temporary income shock, they're measured over one year period, they're big, they're relative, uh, relatively heterogeneous when you look, oh, excuse me, when you look across, um, uh, when you look across like the different levels of financial distress, out of housing shocks, these MPCs. You know, they're out of a permanent housing shock. They're measured over three-year periods. They're small and they're relatively, um, you know, homogeneous. So, as I sort of thought about like what you're training your model towards, it, it felt like, you know, land your model somewhere here. In the case of an income shock, there's like a clear runway, you know, very, you know, strong, sharp response. Whereas in the case of, you know, um, a housing price shock, it's kind of, you know, a field landing somewhere out there in the distance. Um, I'm going to close by just uh, reflecting a little bit on the current in environment and maybe think about that as inspiration for, again, extending your question, maybe even just to another um, environment. Obviously, we're seeing a big increase in consumer prices, and at the same time, we've seen a big drop in asset prices and stock prices. And so this is a very different shock to um, the expense picture and the asset picture for households. Um, and, and how might that uh, play out in your model? Um, and I'm inspired a little bit by, you know, the New York Fed panel that just came out this week with the Q3 data. Um, precisely the financial, oh, excuse me, the, the measures of financial distress that you talked about, this um, Q, the 30-day the, the delin delinquency is starting to tick up in credit cards and auto loans. Um, and I'll close with uh, just a, a tiny snippet of data that I've been collating from Vanguard. Um, it, similarly, you can see just murmurs of financial distress ticking up if we look in the context of retirement plan participants um, who seem to be taking out slightly, you know, we're seeing an uptick in people taking out loans, uh, withdrawals, hardship withdrawals out of their retirement uh, accounts uh, in, in the most recent period. Um, so I think these could be interesting food for thought as you think about different kinds of macroeconomic shocks that are um, permeating through our economy. Thank you. So now we want to invite all of you to join the conversation. Do we have any questions or comments to add to this discussion? Um, just a question. Um, very interesting work. I guess in these type of models with endogenous financial constraints, there are some non-monotonicities with respect to the effect of shocks, just because you know the people that tend to have the biggest loans are those that uh, can borrow, sort of like these uh, subprime type uh, uh, borrowers. So I was wondering if if your uh, framework can shed light on that piece. I understand. So in the model, um, I, yeah, I should have sh shown you pricing functions, but there are nonlinearities right. that, that show up. Um, in particular, 
if there's a bigger chance of kind of the, you know, on the labor income side of the really big shock happening, then suddenly you do, you and I know this, like you, you get these almost cliffs in, in terms of pricing that, that cut some people off in some, some situations. So that's, that's in there, but right. I want to make sure I understood. No, just in terms of like, um, you know, the effect being uh, bigger because of this financial distress to the workers that had a lot of loans. And those are not the poor workers, actually, in these type of models, are the more the middle income, lower type yeah, workers. Yes. So, so the, you know, that can shed light to the fact that the, the, the sort of the segments of the population that are being affected most is not necessarily the poor households, but just this sort of uh, lower middle income households. So, yeah, that's a great point. In fact, um, th there's a, it, it is exactly the case in the model that it's people kind of in the middle and above that have are doing well enough to get the mortgage and then lever up. It, it, not everybody's equally equally levered up. So, yeah, I think that this we need to do more to kind of unpack how much of the effect is in this case would not be coming from them because they wouldn't tighten things up very drastically. It would it would all you know? It, I think it would force the tightening um, to come from low asset, super high. Marginal cost of borrowing guys at the at, at at the very end. That's who I think would be driving everything. Yeah. All right. Let's collect a few more questions and then we can have you come up here, Kartik. And, okay. Uh, people can look at you, not me. <laughs> Do you want me to come up there now? We'll just collect okay. a few questions and then you can answer them all at once. Uh, Esteban here. So I want to go back of the group on the grouping of the zip codes by yep. in five. Uh, and the extent to which you know that geographic aspect actually kind of matters or not, because I would think that, say, with an income shock, the, I mean, there's all sorts of different types of income shocks, of course, but I mean, many of them, whether you live in a city yeah. that is actually growing and full of, is a you know very healthy labor market, it's very different than if you live in a city or commuting zone where that's not the case. And so the nature of the actual shock that these households are receiving across the different zip codes that you have grouped seems very different. Yeah, no, I, th that's, that, sorry, w what's the well, We're just gonna collect questions okay. and you can, you can answer. <laughs> uh, looks like there's another question over here. So one of the things that we saw with the uh, aid given during the pandemic was the, the zip codes where I presume we had more financial distress. Uh, when we supported them through all the things that Fiona mentioned, uh, it, it, it actually protected jobs in that area. Uh -huh. um, so did you correlate local business activity with the stress? Because this is the first time we actually helped those communities. Those businesses were helped a lot. There were more job losses in the high income area for service workers than in the low income areas. We can take perhaps one more question. John has a question. Uh, so my question is about sort of life cycle dynamics. So you've got sort of looking at, I think, spot consumption. You could also think about <laughs> life cycle or you know, lifetime consumption. And then also there might be differences about whether you get the shock when you're young versus old because that affects sort of you know, your asset accumulation profiles and sort of horizon effects and things like that. And I just wondered if you thought about that at all. From, from what I could tell, it seems like the lenders here can discriminate on the betas, the preference heterogeneity, yes. which means that you can kind of arbitrarily cut out one type from the lending market by setting very high uh, interest rates, low Qs for that type, which seems like if that isn't possible, if the bank doesn't know what my beta is, then it must be that you're systematically overestimating the effects for the the impatient guys, I think, because the lending conditions can change a lot for them, and maybe under for the high. I couldn't try to figure out which way that goes. All right, now we'll give Kartik about five minutes. Um, also respond to Fiona's discussion. Great. Thanks, Fiona, very much, and thanks for the questions. That was really helpful. Uh, I think, um, let me just turn to Fiona's points really quickly. First, uh, less could be more, so I think that's correct. Um, although the, in the in the Q and A now, I feel like 
we're going to end up being with more and less at the same time. So we'll need to think carefully about, about I think, how to, how to really um, focus on a couple of experiments that I think would, would satisfy most readers to say, okay, this is what's going on. We, we felt like we had that, but I think that, that there, are, um, there are ways in which we can prune that and, and then maybe make it even more precise in terms of focusing on, on labor income shocks. I mean, to your, I think it's related to the squishiness of MPCs. In, in some sense, you know, we, were, we were happy when um, we took, we, we, when we said, okay, look, what does this model deliver for the MPC from housing, and what does it do for the, for the in, uh, out of income? And they both landed in some ballpark. Now, I agree that, that perhaps the field is the more apt picture, and so you know, we're too quick to claim success on, on that front. But in a way, it, it, was, it was actually ex exciting for us that we thought, gosh, this isn't trying to do these things necessarily. It looks like it, it's capturing something that gets to uh, gets to the things that make it hard for people to smooth and in, for these disparate shocks um, in both cases. But your point's well taken. I, li I really like the slide showing the entire, you know, smorgasbord of, of estimates. And, and, you know, first of all, they're small. And they're small in the model and, 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 and in, the, in the data. And the, the labor income temporary one is a third in the model. And it's, it's somewhere around that, and if, you know, in the, in the data as well. So I think that's a, that's a fair point. Um, I think I, I want to uh, maybe connect the, the last question also with, with, with your discussion, which is we have this kind of more permanent heterogeneity. So a question that I think, I think it's a perfectly apt question to ask, okay, so how much can be conditioned on in this and how, what are markers out there that could be conditioned on without, say, running afoul of other, uh, other rules? And I think we have to think harder about exactly the extent to which we can do that. Now, w one thing that that I learned in, in an earlier paper uh, was that, it, let's say that we truncated the ability to condition on, on that, then I'm gonna have to tell you a mechanism for the, the asymmetric information interaction that subsequently happens in, you know, and my paper was nowhere near the last word on it, but I remember you know, us finding that, man, it's not easy to, to, to get lending actually to happen very much once this thing gets harder to observe, and then, uh, then, then the same set of people in some sense, send up signaling something by trying to borrow, and then they get cut off. So I don't know actually the answer to the question of which way it flipped, you know, which way the sign would go if we had it, if we didn't have it. But in some ways, we're kind of thinking about a world in which the model describes best a world in which there are things that are observable, but that are quite related to longer term, you know, uh, features of your environment that make consumption urgency something that that's real. Um, this is why I didn't want to insist on a structural interpretation because I actually if you ask me in the middle of the night what I think it is I think it's like the whole mash of stuff that afflicts people that are in difficult circumstances um, they have to work get cars worked on all of a sudden they have inflexible jobs that they lose because they can't get to work on time blah 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 I mean I think that's a whole different world this is related to Esteban and Bill's point too which is people face different kinds of shocks the way we handle it here is we have a homogeneous shock process we scale income, though, across these different uh, zip codes to make the relative incomes um, comport with the data. So it's not the case that the Q1 areas have the same mean income, for, it, for instance. They have scaled income that looks like, looks like the data. So there is a sense, there's one way in which we get at that heterogeneity. Y your, your point, I think, is a very valid and interesting one to think about down the road, and it's related to Fiona's policy point, which is, you know, I'm very, I was very influenced when I read you know, the Mian Rao Sufi papers talking about how some changes here allowed service sector employment not to collapse. Um, we don't have anything to say about that directly here, but I, I absolutely think so somewhere down the road I, I would want to do that. Um, I'm at zero minutes. Um, John, I think, yes, we, we should try to think about um, other measures of, of consumption other than the, than the, instant, the, the instant impact. Um, housing, I think, would have the biggest, uh, would have the biggest bang. Um, I think, I think I did it. <laughs> so. so, I'm now live. That's great. And my 
my slides will appear. Super. While I wait for that, thanks everybody for being here. Um, thanks to the Institute for putting this together. I'm very excited today, uh, here we go, to talk about um, the effect of maternal labor supply on children, evidence from bunching. So this is gonna be quite different, I guess, from the, prior, the, the paper you just saw. This is joint work with uh, Carolina and Gregorio Caetano, who are at the University of Georgia, and Viviane Sanfelice, who's at Temple. I'm at the Federal Reserve Board, and so as a disclaimer, these are my own views and don't represent in any way um, the uh, Board of Governors or the Federal Reserve System. So the motivation for the paper is that maternal labor supply has increased you know, very notably in uh, recent decades. Uh, at the same time, a large uh, literature in child development and in economics has found that quality parent-child interactions are particularly important for the early development of children's skills. And so these two trends, or these two facts, raise the question, how might maternal labor supply affect the development of children? And the literature on this topic has tended to sort of think about this as flowing through two possible channels. One is the time channel, that is the more time a mother spends in the labor force, the less time she's at home, the less time there's uh, opportunities to interact with the child. And so if the mother's own time is a productive input into the, the skill production of her children, you would expect that to be a negative effect. On the other hand, the more time somebody spends working, hopefully the more they, uh, their income uh, goes up. And income is known to have positive direct effects on children's skill development. You can purchase uh, different types of enriching goods. You can afford perhaps better child care, better health, a whole nutrition, a whole host of things. And so sort of theoretically then, the overall effect that you might expect to see here is ambiguous. Moreover, this is a pressing question just in that many policies you know, that companies may consider or that governments may consider, such as family leave policies, child tax credits, you know, general changes to the tax code, et cetera, would plausibly affect maternal labor supply. And in considering such policies, it may be important to understand what knock-on effects, if any, there are to uh, the development of children. So in this paper, we tried to estimate the effect of maternal work hours during the first three years of a child's life on their cognitive skills measured around age six. And we do this using a novel approach developed in another paper by myself and the Caetanos, uh, which attempts to leverage the bunching of maternal labor supply at zero during these years to uh, correct for the uh, sort of clear endogeneity problem that would be present. That is, the mothers that work are different in observable and unobservable ways from the mothers who don't work. And indeed, the mothers who work a lot are different uh, along those dimensions from mothers who work relatively, relatively less. So in the one nice thing about this bunching methodology is it allows us to estimate these effects for the uh, uh, sort of a substantially larger sample than you would get if you had to use instruments or family fixed effects or the other types of approaches that have been taken in prior literature to deal with this endogeneity problem. And this allows us to focus on various dimensions of heterogeneity. So in particular, the heterogeneity in along the skills of the mother, that is, are these effects larger or smaller when the mother herself has a higher level of human capital or academic achievement, and also by the quantity of her labor supply. That is, if you, uh, is the thousandth hour worked more or less beneficial or harmful, as the case may be, than the first hour worked. So just to forestall any concerns or questions, why am I talking about mothers today and not parents in general? So that is a data limitation mostly. So the data I'm using and indeed the data I'm aware of that would allow you to link mother, you know, a parent's work hours to skill measures of the children are only allowing you to do that linking mothers to their children. So you know, in principle, all of the economic forces that I'm talking about here, I would expect to be operative for other uh, caregivers to the child, fathers, other, other members of the household. It's just that the data don't allow us to do a linking there. It's also perhaps a you know, more relevant dimension to think, or if you're only gonna look at one parent, the mother is a more relevant one, that's where there's been greater variation in maternal labor supply, there's greater changes in, in mother's labor supply following the birth of a child than for fathers. So this is gonna be a margin that's gonna be operative, uh, perhaps in, in greater frequency. So just to give a preview of the results, because we don't have a large amount of time here to present, um, this is kind of the main picture I want to take away. I didn't uh, correctly forecast the size of the room relative to the size of this picture, so I apologize for the, the size of the labels. But what we have here on the x-axis is the hours worked by the mother on average over the first three years of the child's life. The y-axis is the child's cognitive skills measured in standard deviation units. 
uh, th each of these lines represents a different quartile of the maternal AFQT distribution. The AFQT, you can think of it as a, like an SAT or an ACT type achievement test uh, administered in, in, at a high school age. And so from this picture, you can take away a couple key things. One, the higher the m skill level of the mother, the greater her labor supply is. That's what these circles represent. These are actual data, the averages within each of those quartiles. Also, the higher skill mothers tend to have higher skill children. Neither one of these results are particularly surprising. The lines going through these circles then indicate, if you take our estimates seriously, what would be the sort of evolution of skills of a child who was, starts off located at each of these circles that appear in our data as a mother in that group worked more or fewer hours. And so these lines are all are downward sloping. So this says that there is negative effects of maternal labor supply on children's skills measured in the short run. And these effects are less negative for lower skilled mothers. So as you move down the, the skill distribution here towards the, towards the dark line at the bottom, the slopes of these become much less steep. And in fact, uh, at the, in the bottom quartile, the, the effects are flat until you get to a substantial number of hours. So this raises the question, why are we estimating higher skilled, you know, that higher skilled maternal labor supply in particular is detrimental to children's skills in the short run? Um, you can reject, based on this picture, the idea that it's because they're working more hours and that the last hour of work is particularly costly. These lines are all cl relatively close to linear, and if anything, there's actually slight, slightly convex for higher skilled mothers. That is, the more a higher skilled mother works, the less negative the effects are you know, for each additional hour. So our interpretation then is that you know, the additional money that the mother receives from this additional labor supply is going to be insufficient to fully compensate for the missed uh, interactions with the child if the high-skilled mother has particularly valuable interactions in terms of the uh, skill generation of her, of, of her child. And so to examine that question further, what? Oh, there we go. We want to study an additional dimension of heterogeneity, which is along the pre-birth wage rate of the mother. So the idea here is to think of two similarly skilled mothers whose wage rates differ, perhaps because they selected a different occupation or have a different major in college. And so we're trying to vary the income of the mother but by hol while holding the quality, the skill quality of the home time constant. And what we find here is that money helps. There is an offsetting effect of income that is two mothers of the same skill level all else equal, the higher wage mother will have a less negative effect for each hour that she works on her child than the, than the lower wage mother. But the income effects here are, generally speaking, not going to be enough to compensate. So almost all mothers in the data, given the actual skill levels that we observe and the actual wage rates that we observe, would still have significant negative effects. So our, you know, one possible takeaway and something that we think merits perhaps further, uh, further work is that this suggests that flexible schedules, work from home, things like that, might be better uh, sort of policies to target in terms of mitigating these, skill, these sort of skill effects on children than just direct financial incentives to work. So just increasing the reward to working isn't going to have, you know, uh, isn't going to do much to mitigate the negative consequences to children. However, a flexible schedule and even flexible schedules for other members of the family uh, or potentially higher, ch uh, higher quality childcare options would basically allow you to hold constant or increase your work hours while also still maintaining a large amount of you know, home time or interactions at home, which, which our data really suggests is, is the key force. So in the interest of time, I'll mostly uh, skip the literature view other than to note that you know, we, fit, we fit squarely in uh, a pretty large literature on this topic, even in terms of using the same treatment variable, that is this average hours worked over the first three years of the life, and the same skill measures, that is early, uh, early cognitive skills measured around age six. This literature has tended to find uh, ne either negative effects, roughly similar in magnitude to what we find, or um, zero effects. The one paper that has positive effects does so by looking at particularly disadvantaged mothers. And uh, our heterogeneous estimates actually will imply that about 10% of our sample should actually expect to have positive causal effects of labor supply on, on their children's outcomes. Again, in the interest of time, I'll mostly skip the data, but we have information on hourly or weekly work histories from the NLSY 79 data survey. So this is a cohort of mothers in their teen years, started in around 1980, who've been followed through continuously to the present. 
And so from there, we can construct our, our treatment variable. Importantly, we actually exclude the first three months following the birth of the child. That's to account for um, possible differences in how mothers in that case report if they're on maternity leave, whether they're, you know, they might say, I still have a job, so I'm, I'm engaged in full-time work uh, or not. So we just cut that out, although our results are insensitive to that decision. In the NLSY 79, you can link the mothers in that survey to another survey, the CNLSY, which is the children of these mothers. And from here, we get the cognitive skills of the child. So we um, basically take a combination of PIAT math and reading scores. The first uh, sitting of that exam was either five or six, mostly in this, in this survey. So in final, we have about 7,000 mother-child pairs. So our identification is gonna rely on the bunching of mothers at zero. So just to, this is just to show you that there is a substantial amount of munching. So this is the empirical uh, CDF of our treatment variable, this average hours worked, um, again, broken out by the quartile of the mother's AFQT. And so what you see is about 20 to 40% of mothers bunch at zero. That is, they report no hours worked in the three years following the birth of their child. Um, and then among those who report positive amounts, there's sort of a continuous distribution uh, going all the way up to you know 2,500 hours or so. And Importantly here, although there's more bunching for lower skilled mothers, it's 40% in the bottom quartile of maternal AFQT, there's substantial bunching across uh, a wide range of observables that we can see for the mother. And as this previous chart suggested, there, you, know, there, you might think that this bunching is selective, and indeed that is the case. So what we're showing here is local linear fits of the of various, out, uh, of various observable variables as a function of the mother's work hours, estimated only on the sample of non-bunched mothers, and then we're showing the average of that same outcome uh, for the mothers bunched at, uh, bunched at zero. And so what you can see here is that there's clear discontinuities. The mothers at zero have children who have discreetly lower cognitive skill measures. The mothers themselves at zero have discreetly lower um, AFQT scores than the mothers who are just working a small positive number of hours. They're also uh, discreetly less likely to have uh, the partner of the mother present at the birth of the child, and the child is discreetly more likely to have older siblings. Um, so, and basically, this, these discontinuities exist across pretty much any observable that you can imagine, suggesting that there's selection going on into who's working and who's uh, sort of remaining bunched at zero. So how are we gonna use this bunching to handle the endogeneity problem? So let's ignore controls for right now. I'll try not to do too much econometrics. Um, but the, you know, if you have skills S, we're thinking about this as a function of the maternal labor supply variable, that's L, and then this L star, which we're thinking of as your desired level of labor supply. So when your L star, when your desired labor supply is positive, L and L star are coincident. When L, when you're at zero, you can't have, you know, you can't choose a negative amount of labor supply. There's this natural constraint at zero. You can think of L star as indexing the degree to which the mother is indifferent to being at that bunching point. So having a very slightly negative L star means that a small change in cost or benefits might induce you to move from the bunching point to uh, a positive amount of labor supply. A significantly negative L star would indicate that you, you, your unobservables are such that you're very, very far from indifference. It would be difficult you know, to move you away from that bunching point. So if we consider the effect of you know, uh, changing work hours from L0 or the, comparing the work hours between uh, mothers who work L1 versus L0, what we can observe is going to conflate the selection and treatment effect. So what we can observe is the difference in skills between mothers who work L1 and desire L1 versus who work L0 and desire L0. You can decompose that into the treatment effect that you'd be interested in, which is holding your unobservable type constant, you say L star equals to L1, the difference just if you shift the hours, and then a selection effect, which is your actual hours worked or that are held constant, and what differs is this unobservable index. So that would be the classic selection bias term. So the usual approach in econometrics when you face this kind of problem is to find a dimension of variation along which you can turn off the selection bias term. We're gonna do the exact opposite. We're gonna use, woo, we're gonna use bunching to turn off the treatment effect term and therefore be able to directly identify the selection effect. Then since we observe the selection effect plus the treatment effect, that we, uh, we observe that sum, then we can get the uh, treatment effects indirectly. So to just give quick intuition for how this works, for the mothers who are bunched at zero, their treatment doesn't vary, they're all at zero. That means that variation in their, the outcomes and the skills of their children at zero is informative about how unobservables are affecting the children's skills. 
because that's the only sort of systematic force that's going on there. So this means that if we can use that variation to understand the direct effect of unobservables on outcomes, that's exactly the selection bias term that would sort of uh, contaminate a naive regression, say, then we can, you know, then, then we're good to go. You could also think about this intuitively as almost like an upside down RDD. In a regression discontinuity design, your treatment is, discontinu is discontinuous at the, at the point, your, and you assume, it's an assumption in RDD models, that unobservables are varying continuously through that point. So if you see a discontinuity in outcomes, that has to be due to the treatment. Here, the treatment, if you move from a positive amount of labor supply down to zero, is continuous. So if you observe a discontinuity in outcomes, a discontinuity in children's test scores, the inference is that that comes from a discontinuity in the unobservables, that is an L star. Uh, you know, and in, in the, in, in the, what I'm gonna talk about next, the RDD assumptions, you need a first stage. We can't do a first stage, since the L star is not observed if you're bunched at zero, and so that's where our distributional assumptions come in. This is lagging. So let me just uh, write the whole thing out. So now adding in some controls to explain what I mean by this, this is our actual empirical model. And the, the things to note are we have L star is now allowed to de depend in a very flexible way on observables X and this variable eta. So eta is gonna be the possibly confounding unobservable that we're going to be concerned with. And our actual outcome is then going to be composed of an effect, if any, from eta plus a pure noise term. If you do some algebra, you can show that this implies the following identification equation in which there's this new term multiplying delta which is sort of a new regressor that in principle you'd like to be able to add to the model. But importantly, it depends on this expectation in blue, which is the average value of L star among the bunched mothers. This is sort of on average at the bunching point, how far are you from indifference between being at that bunching point or being, uh, or being away from the bunching point. So if you could some, if you somehow had access in particular, we examine uh, uh, sort of a normal, a normal distribution, a uniform distribution, and a symmetric distribution. So here we're projecting down, this is the CDF on the right panel, and each of these implies a different expectation for that, uh, for, for that necessary piece to put in our, in our new regressor, which we can then plug in and, and construct our estimates. So that's hopefully the end of the econometrics. Um, so here are, the, here are the results. So looking at just a homogeneous model, that is that the, the effects are the same for all mothers, so there's just one beta. What we have in the left is that with no controls, there's a significant positive association between the amount of hours that a mother works and the child's skills. When we add controls, that association goes down to zero. This is consistent with the positive uh, selection into the labor force we saw in the mother's skill and family structure and all, a whole host of things. And so when we then do our correction for selection, across any distributional assumption, the estimates for beta turn to significantly negative. And this is really just saying that, you know, we added controls, it, you know, re reduced the sort of raw correlation. If we keep, if we now control for unobservables, that selection is going in the same direction. And so we just lower our beta yet further. And so I'm just showing in green the symmetric case, that's the sort of the most general assumption that we make. And to put this, I, I didn't put the units here, so to put this into context, the green estimates would imply that a mother increasing her work hours by about 10 hours per week for the three years following the birth of her child would causally lower her child's cognitive skills by about 0.1 standard deviations. And that's, a, you know, in the education and child development literature, that's a relatively large effect. It's roughly in the same order of magnitude as a one standard deviation improvement in teacher quality if you go to the value added literature. Um, or say a 35% class size reduction from you know, the Tennessee Star experiment. Um, and it's also roughly in line actually with the effects um, from earlier literature on maternal labor supply. <coughs> I'll also say you can do this for non-cognitive skills. The directions of everything are the same, but the point estimates are about half as large, and so nothing is significant, super. So I'll skip robustness, but I'm happy to talk about you know, lots of ways to test the different assumptions in the model uh, and how to do it. So next we wanna consider heterogeneity along the mother's skills. So here we're allowing the, the, the effects to depend on the mother's skill level, the amount of labor supply that the mother has, and the interaction between the mother's skill level and the amount of labor supply that the mother gives. We show in our econometrics paper that all of these parameters are identified under the same sets of assumptions. And so just again focusing on this uh, rightmost column here in green, the key things to note is now this uh, beta A, that's the sort of increment that you get to your, the, your effect, depending on your skill level, is now very significantly negative. So this means that you know, if you consider a, a mother with skill level of zero, who's at the average of the distribution, 
the, her first hour of work lowers, uh, has a, a setback size of negative 0.03. If you consider the same, a mother doing the same thing, but who's one standard deviation above average now in her achievement level, that almost doubles the negative consequence for, uh, for each hour of labor supply. So that's a very substantial effect. We do see positive estimates for uh, beta L, that's your effects get less negative the more you work, and that's differentially so the higher skill the mother is. That's this interaction term is significantly positive. However, those are relatively small in magnitude compared to the, the sort of direct beta A effect, which is why in the chart, in the picture I showed you, which is coming up right here, you have you know, substantially more negative effects for higher skilled mothers, even though they, shallow, they uh, shallow out more quickly. And so finally, we look at heterogeneity along the pre-birth wage rate of the mother. So now it's the exact same analysis, only we add an additional set of interactions. So now we allow the effect to be higher or lower depending on the mother's wage rate and the interaction of the mother's wage rate with the amount that she works. We can also do the interaction of the mother's wage rate with her skill level, but that is close to zero and none of the other results change when we do this. And so the idea here is for two mothers with the same skills, is the effect higher or lower depending on the wages? And this is what comes out of it. So firstly, in the green, the beta A effect is now even more negative. This makes sense because previously, if there was a positive income effect to working, higher skill mothers do earn more on average. So we're only allowing that one dimension of heterogeneity, and so there, any in positive income effects would be sort of lowering the estimated sort of detriment to, uh, to purely the skill dimension. And so when, now that we're allowing movement along both wages and mother skills, the, the effects on mother skills are now you know, larger than they were before, we get positive point estimates for the wage term. So that suggests that there is some offsetting, you know, that, that there is an offset from income. However, it's not precisely estimated, so you know, can't reject a zero effect, although it's, it's, it's reasonably far from zero. And importantly, it's much smaller in magnitude, you know, half or less than, than the um, direct skill effect. So this would suggest that even very high-skilled, high-wage mothers, if you take our point estimates uh, just at, at face value, you would still have negative effects for them. You'd have to go you know, to an extremely, extremely high-wage level you know, relative to your skill level in order to have sort of a full compensation there. The, in the, um, the interactions, the sort of convexity terms don't change in an appreciable way. So the real action here is the, what the beta A estimate is, that is how the effects are modulated by the mother's skill level, and the beta W, which we, you know, we wish the sample were bigger to try to pin this down more precisely, but are at least suggestive of a positive income effect. And so, yeah, so that's the, that's the paper. I think I'm probably out of time or close to it. Um, so yeah, so thank you very much. You know, I'll, I'll, the last thing I'll say here is just um, to, uh, advertise the method. You know, the nice thing about the method is we don't need instruments, we don't need special data structures. We think that this type of identification can be complementary to other approaches taken in the literature. And also for applied micro folks especially, it's very common to have a treatment variable that's continuous with some bunching point either at zero or it could be, it doesn't have to be at zero, it doesn't have to be at the bottom of the support. And so my co-authors and I are developing a suite of papers sort of under different assumptions allowing people to, uh, to, to achieve causal identification in this type of scenario, so I'm happy to talk about that more uh, as well. But yeah, th thanks, thanks everyone. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. There, I'm on, and I'll I'll say something before this starts. Um, so I'm Andrew goodman Bacon. I'm an economist at OIGI, uh, and I was really happy to get a chance to dig into this paper because uh, in addition to applied work, I sometimes out in the world masquerade as like a lowbrow econometrician. So I will probably re-explain my understanding of this new method, um, which was actually one of the most sort of fun parts of the paper in a lot of ways because it's not often that you read something that's like a really new idea about how we should go about doing this work. Um, and so it, it, was, it was quite a lot to, um, to, to uh, get through. The large green button. Got it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so before I launch into like my uh, actually what I, I was I was disabused of this notion last night. Uh, uh, I'll probably explain this in, in my way of understanding what was going on, uh, which is actually not quite exactly right, uh, but it's not fundamentally wrong. And I'll I'll make the, the link to what Eric uh, described in a second. But before we do that, um, you know, we saw this, and it's a big conclusion, right? It's a huge thing, a uh, huge claim to make about the world. A big thing to to um, to sit with the idea that like more maternal work hours um, 
uh, are kind of leaving child skills on the table. Um, and I think it actually, I, uh, one implication of this result, uh, I think that wasn't, that is worth more um, exploration in the future is that this suggests that maternal work hours are actually compressing the child skill distribution because it's the highest uh, skill and highest hours mothers who are leaving the most skill skills on the table for their kids. So anyway, I think that's an interesting, that, that's something that comes out of this result that wasn't discussed, but I think is worth uh, uh, more looking in the future. Uh, but this is a big deal for lots of other very contemporary reasons, which is uh, that this is changing a lot. So some of our researchers in community development uh, have this nice descriptive piece, uh, Katie and Ryan, on um, how after the pandemic, we have a lot fewer um, two worker households, and most of that was getting soaked up um, by women leaving the labor force. And so along those curves that we just saw, things have been moving a lot recently. So we really need to know, um, I mean, even to get back to the, the discussion about policies that invest in kids, if this is having long run implications for kids, we're gonna be sitting with that and, and feeling these effects if they matter this much for a long time. So uh, to talk about how I think this is, you know, what I think is going on here, I'm gonna start from something that we would agree we should not do which is what if we just took this data and we just did a scatter plot, you know, fitted a line through children's test scores and mother, the amount that mothers work in their first three years, we would never believe that this was gonna tell us anything causal about how mother's labor supply um, is affecting their kids. For one, you don't actually see the non-workers, so they're gonna drag that slope in a, in a weird way. And two, of course, there's all these things that are different about high labor supply mothers. Um, but these authors in a whole series of papers have this like very interesting idea, which is, well, what if actually the zero labor supply mothers can help us solve that problem of unobservables? Um, so I'm gonna describe this uh, in a particular way. Um, if we knew that, you know, if we knew what their unobservables were, then we could we know their test scores. You actually see it in the data, and then if we can figure out the unobservables, we can, we can make an adjustment to the rest of the cloud and really kind of get, get a sense of how much the labor hours per se are affecting children's test scores. Um, so I imagine this, that this is where my understanding is not exactly totally right, but it's not doing too, too much violence to like what's really happening in the estimation. Imagine you had two groups of mothers, so the way that the paper works, it really actually is breaking up mothers into pretty fine bins in terms of lots of observable characteristics. Um, so some of them suppose they have you know, high L unobservables, and some of them have low L type unobservables. Um, we see the children's test scores, right? So the height of those stars is like, how the children of high, high L moms do and how the children of low L moms do. And if we could just figure out how to, how to impute their labor hours, then we could fit a line through those, those stars. And we, that, because those moms don't really work, that's gonna tell us how much the unobservables per se uh, matter. Um, and then you know, we could just be uh, kind of moving this, um, we could be moving, the, oops, sorry, we could be moving this line uh, up there and basically subtracting out the difference with the observed association between labor hours and test scores, right? So if that line is like steeper than the observed slope, then you're saying, well, those high labor supply moms, the unobservables on their own suggest their kids should be doing really, really well. The kids aren't doing quite that well, so maybe so it must be, the inference is the labor supply per se must be dragging those test scores down a little bit. So the entire, this is, this is where, so this is not, this is um, avoiding the nice kind of RD uh, uh, description that Eric gave, which is actually how the paper works. But this conclusion up on this slide is actually still true. Um, everything in this identification strategy is all about imputing ADA, which is that term for uh, desired labor hours. And in the context of their labor supply model, desired labor hours means all the other unobserv unobservables that matter for how much moms want to work and also are productive for their children's test scores. So um, here's, you know, here's my example of how this works, but you know, if, you, if this method had just imputed a different amount of labor hours, a different ADA for one of these groups of mothers, you, we would infer something totally different about how much the unobservables matter. You know, in this case, uh, if that were like flatter, it would suggest that actually labor supply is good for kids. So this, this relationship is like the complete thing that drives uh, how this method is gonna deal with the fundamental unobservables. And so it's this that makes a big difference. And this is where the distributional assumptions come in. So um, I like the, there's versions of this picture in the paper that I really like, so I'm gonna reproduce them. But suppose we have one of those groups uh, and like 12% of these mothers say they didn't work at all um, during their uh, first three years of their kids. Well, one version of this distributional assumption is just gonna say take the upper 12% of hours 
and pretend like these these highest labor supply moms are like the reverse of the low of the low labor supply moms whose hours we don't really see and just chop that chunk of the distribution off and put it down at the bottom and that is going to tell us um, what the average on observables among those other mothers are of the non-working mothers you can do it for the other group and now we know those those two little stars we know how how much we should spread out those two those two stars and again as eric mentioned at the end a huge benefit of doing this is that you don't need an instrument. Um, you know, so uh, all the other literature on this is just is searching, scouring the earth for some other reason why two observationally similar groups of moms, not even observationally similar, unobservationally similar groups of moms, would work more or less than each other. And you don't need to do that. You can use all the you can use all the data. It's going to inform one or the other part of this exercise, and um, and you can proceed. So this is very helpful. Uh, so a lot of my comments on you know describing now how I understand this model working and the crucial role of figuring out the unobservables, I all my essentially all my reactions to the paper are about that method for figuring out the unobservables. So it turns out uh, that in the paper there's like all this nice um, robustness showing that m many of the choices about how you impute those unobservables, how you figure out like which type of mom you know these different groups are don't matter that much. So this left panel is just showing all these different choices for how much uh, labor supply to kind of give to those non-working moms. How, how extreme is their, is their unobservable taste for work? And it appears that in the range, uh, if you were to make that even more extreme, it wouldn't matter that much. Uh, and so that's, that's actually very interesting to me already. Um, and, and in some sense, this is, I'll come back to this at the end, but this is a lot of robustness in that the results don't change very much based on these assumptions. But that brings me to, that sort of triggered a different reaction in my mind when I was um, looking at this, which is, well then, in some sense my reaction was, well why is it, why isn't it less robust? I mean, I would think that this method, there, there should be a place where this breaks down. There should be somewhere where some assumption means this is gonna go like crazy in another direction and then we're in the space of arguing like which assumption is reasonable. But the, the fact that it likes, to some, it, to some extent in that last picture, the key choice of the paper makes relatively little difference was already very fascinating to me. So then I started looking at saying, okay, well how is the paper breaking up mothers into these different groups? So an important, important part of using uh, the behavior of moms who work a lot and, and ascribing their behavior and kind of putting it back down in the other part of the distribution is that they need to be very, very similar for all these other reasons. Otherwise, you're kind of in trouble. So these are all the, the covariates from the NLSY that are allowing the, allow the paper to break up moms in these little bins. So I, in some sense, this is just bringing a sort of like a omitted variables bias point to a slightly more uh, complicated empirical design. But you know, one thing is, is the mother's spouse present? And what's the mother's spouse's highest grade? So obviously important. But I mean, I would think that in other, other models of labor supply, we would also really, really care how much the mother's spouse earned. So for example, suppose that in a given cell of women, there are, there are moms whose partner earns a lot of money, and they can feel free to choose part-time work. Um, and so then the upper tail of hours is kind of not that high, because they don't have to work, because they have a rich spouse. Um, that would affect how you impute the lower end, and that would change that little slope. Uh, similarly, there is information on the birth order of the child. Um, I have three children, and I can tell you from experience that the co age composition of those siblings really matters. So my, my kid, my baby who grew up with a toddler had a completely different experience than my current baby who's growing up with like elementary school kids. So there might be other things beyond just, say, birth order that would really matter for like how that kid is going to test at age six in the survey. Um, and I just also want to, there's even more. So this was a really great paper I actually saw this summer presented on the importance of big sisters, specifically for child skill development. So, you know, the sex mix of the older kids might matter too. To the extent that these things are different between uh, families where mothers work a lot versus mothers work zero, it's not going to be valid to say that, you know, we've, we know the unobservables of the low labor supply market. Uh, and then lastly, um, another thing that was sort of cross, well, okay, actually I should go back one more and say uh, one last thing that didn't show up here that really crossed my mind is um, the model of labor supply that motivates the paper is like a unitary one where women are choosing hours, but there's lots of involuntary unemployment in the world. So if we look at a given cell and we see zero work, uh, uh, mothers who work zero hours and they're there because they lost jobs, 
that's a completely different shock to the family environment and we think probably children's uh, skill development um, than simply choosing zero hours. And so to me, um, these things feed into like uh, maybe a bit of like a, a, a greedy request, but more more X's I think um, are something I want to see, and and discontinuities in those X's uh, partly motivate the strategy and partly make me concerned that we're we're treating moms as observationally similar uh, when maybe we should not. Um, and then the last thing is uh, if you were to extend like the, the theoretical framework in one other direction. Um, women might not just be choosing labor supply, they might be choosing labor supply relative to their home productivity. Um, and so you, there might be reasons to think that you know, women who choose to stay home do so because they want to or they know that they are especially good at producing child skills and that's something that they really value. Now that story might go in a different direction, but I, I'm putting up this, paper, this really nice paper by Pat Klein and Chris Walters about the effectiveness of Head Start because one of the really like, nice little detailed results that they get in here, which you're not gonna know what these terms mean, but late NH is basically this, uh, these treatment effect estimates of going to Head Start that they uh, ascribe to kids whose outside option would have been staying home. And these are really positive. I mean, these are the biggest treatment effects in the paper. So that actually suggests the opposite of the story that I told, which is if you, in this paper, if you were a mother who was able to send kids to Head Start instead of be home with them, that was really good for your children's test scores. Um, and so that's another feature that I would think of um, as very relevant to family choices and children's development, which is the quality, as came up before, the quality and the availability and the reliability of uh, childcare. So I'm gonna end by just uh, going back though and reemphasizing this was a really fascinating paper in general. It's, a, it's an important topic to apply it to um, and it was really fun to read like a new method, like a, a truly new method, not a new application of a method or a new flavor of method, but like a really new idea about how we can go about understanding these things. Something that didn't come up for time is that fits actually fits really well with similar methods that are also trying to, to be creative about unobservables. Um, and really, my the biggest challenge I think is not that um, the numbers that you get out of the method as it currently stands are they they it's not that they change they don't really um, it's trying to understand whether they don't change because it's a permanently right answer or they don't change because there's a very stubbornly robust unobservable that's still going on um, and I think that that remains to be uh, to be pushed on a little bit so thank you. We'll open up for questions and collective view and then allow Eric to respond. So I have, have an econometrics question, but I'll save it for lunch and I'll ask my policy question. So you mentioned at the beginning work from home and flexible work as possible policies that one could, uh, you know, expand in this kind of in the context of your results uh, and potentially address some of the gaps that open up with work. Um, connecting to Ryan and Katie's work that Bacon mentioned, also some of the work that Misty Haganis has done looking at choices mothers made when they had the option to work from home with their young children. I think that experiment suggests that it did not work well for them, uh, and we see that in the participation numbers and the participation drop-off, that that just was not a tenable arrangement. So I would kind of encourage you to fold that in as kind of a sense in which we've sort of tried this, and there's some revealed preference information in that, but then also, um, and I'm curious about your thoughts on this, thinking through the hours margin as a bit more of a policy dimension. So potentially subsidizing child care at the level of the hour versus a complete zero one um, full-time subsidy. Obviously, you have pretty linear changes um, in these impacts, so we're not gonna find a, an inflection point where it's costless to do this, but, um, but using that hours margin seems like a really interesting policy opportunity that maybe you can think through some more. Andy has a question. So, so maybe Andrew, uh, could respond to this one, or if the two of you could do the econometrics in real time, but how would this methodology, would it be robust to the idea that being bunched might affect how I behave and therefore the outcome of interest in a way that interacts with that unobserved heterogeneity? So a high-skilled person who's unemployed might be very industrious while unemployed, whereas a low-skilled might be very angry and actually 
not be very a, a very good person to be around. I don't know if that's true, but it's just uh, one way that you could have the outcome variable interact with the actual outcome of being bunched. Jonathan has a question. I just had a very simple question, which was, I, I was surprised that there was bunching at zero, but there was no bunching, didn't look like anywhere else. I would have thought there would be huge bunching at like 2,000 hours or something like that. We'll get you the microphone so everybody can hear your question. Just following up on this point and thinking about the bunching up as information revelation for other women and thinking about our families and thinking about like how this may affect behavior and whether that could actually you know, uh, affect estimates somehow. If everybody's, you know, all these women are not working, then we also are not learning about, you know, the effects of working, and um, you know, there, there could be risk averse women that decide not to do, not to work anymore, and there is like sort of a, you know, affecting behavior and all change. Another question. Um, thank you. That's a relatively new method to me, and I was wondering if the bunching has to be a natural bunching or does it also work with winds arise data? Thank you. I'll throw in the last question. I was curious about this income effect um, and how it would look relative to total household income. So single moms versus moms with partners and partners with different income as well. And now we'll give you about five, six minutes to respond to all these comments. Sure. Am I okay? I'm still still live. Okay. So uh, thanks thanks a lot, Andrew, for the for the discussion. Um, so uh, I'm glad to hear you say that you know work hours uh, are would have the effect of compressing skill the skill distribution for children. Uh, I'll take this back to my co-authors who forced me to take out a bunch of counterfactuals uh, from the paper uh, precisely on this question, which is you know sort of if you were to say equalize. A, you know, uh, work the work hours distribution across types of mothers. You know, what would what the implications of that would be for on two dimensions? One, the the skill differences say between uh, children from advantaged and less advantaged households, and two, on the intergenerational uh, correlations between um, you know mother skill measures and children's. And so, uh, you know, the, I your intuition about what would happen there is is exactly right. If if you equalize uh, uh, work hours on some dimensions. Our estimates would imply, you know, greater intergenerational transmission of, of uh, skill disparities, as well as larger skill gaps between uh, the children from uh, advantaged and less advantaged households. Um, so, in terms of the, you know, the uh, age and composition of the household, um, and the other income of the spouse. Uh, so, in the version of the paper that's posted uh, on on the conference website, none of this analysis is in there. But I can just say that we actually have. Um, run this analysis only on families where both uh, spouses are present, same results. You can run it on um, including non-maternal income as an additional control. Again, um, you get basically the same results. So ex ante, those would be you know, reasonable things to be concerned about. Um, the main reason we didn't you know, go down that route is one, you get the same results and it, it does actually reduce your sample size and we really want, especially when we're trying to disentangle this um, wage versus skill story, we kind of need as much uh, sample size as we, we can. Um, in terms of the precise composition of the, of the ch uh, other children in the household, we had not looked at like whether they're sisters or brothers, it's just the, the number of children, so that would be quite, quite interesting to look at. Um, and similarly, you're exactly right about voluntary versus involuntary employment. Uh, the main thing I would say there is if for the wage analysis, I didn't show this, we have, we're restricting our sample to mothers who were working in the year before the birth of their child. And so it seems plausible. I mean, they, some of them may have lost their jobs, I guess, but likely this is a choice that they exited the labor force following the, the birth of their child. And when you do that, you know, the sample changes. The, Previous heterogeneous by only skill results as well as the baseline non-heterogeneous results are almost the same for that subsample. So I don't think um, that's that's too 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 much what's going on here. Um, 
in two dimensions of skill, that's a great comment. I'll have to, I don't know what the answer to that is, so I'll have to think about it. Um, in terms of uh, Abby's question about work from home, so our, the, our, our motivation here wasn't you know, what a lot of us lived through, which was like the children are literally at home and we're also trying to do our jobs. It's more, you know, what, for example, I'm experiencing now, which is I'm working from home a lot, which just makes it a lot easier to, you know, pick kids up from school. There's less commuting time. A lot of the other frictions associated with work are lower uh, by having this flexible schedule and being able to work from, work from home, but not that like literally I'm trying to work simultaneously with my kids present, which is, um, uh, pretty pretty difficult to do. <laughs> um, uh, in terms of uh, Andy's question, uh, oh, oh, in terms of subsidizing childcare at the hourly level, I think that would be an interesting you know interesting thing to consider. I, we did, we had not um, thought about it, but uh, you know having more flexible childcare options may may be may be useful. And sort of in the background here is really the idea of you know what is the quality of the alternative childcare that the kid is going to receive. Somebody you know for the children these age. There's coverage, you know, basically 24 hours a day. Um, there are childcare variables available in the NLSY. Unfortunately, they were a little concerned about their quality in that you, it's very difficult to sort of get an accounting of kids out, you know, childcare options that adds up to sort of full-time care. So you have mothers who work full-time and report that their kids are not in childcare and family members are not looking after their child which doesn't seem to make sense. I mean, if there's a two-year-old at home, somebody is looking after them. Um, so we, but, but we kind of want to think about, you know, the, the one way to understand these more negative effects for more skilled mothers is precisely that, you know, their time is particularly valuable relative to the alternative childcare that the, the kid would be receiving. Uh, in terms of uh, Andy's question about uh, how being bunched sort of might affect your behavior, so again, not in the draft posted here, but we um, estimate an alternative model where the unobservable eta has one effect on the positive side and a potentially a different effect at bunched at zero. So we're testing whether there's a discontinuity there. That would bias our main estimates if there were sort of a different operation of unobservables at zero versus everywhere else, but we very strongly reject that that's the case, that, that when we, we can identify that, that separate uh, parameter uh, of a different effect bunched at zero and it's, it's you know, zero and you can't reject it. It's, uh, you know, it's small and you can't reject it at zero. Uh, Jonathan's question about 2,000 hours. Uh, so we were doing some chicanery with our, our chart. There is bunching at about 2,000 hours. Um, we, I did not show that because we think of that as either you know, reporting or something else, but when we reflect, when we are estimating and trying to reflect the upper part of the distribution down to the negative side, in order to get this, this estimated expectation, we didn't want to include that bunched, that bunched group because it's going to make that expectation sort of have a weird, a weird shape. So the idea is we're trying to sort of fit a smooth uh, a sense of labor supply at the top end in order to do the reflection. But there is bunching uh, in that upper area. Uh, and including or not, or how, how you handle that isn't actually uh, material uh, for, um, for our uh, results. Um, information revelation uh, for other women. Uh, there's I, I, that seems reasonable as a point. I, we don't have any way to to get at that. I mean, the sample I, you know the, the were drawn from across the country, uh, so there's not going to be an easy way for us to sort of tell you know whose peers are doing what or something that you would need to I think to to get at that. And then finally, for uh, Windsorized data, it would not work for that. So it's important here is that the actual treatment has to be zero. It's not just that you don't observe what the treatment is the literal treatment needs to be zero or at the bunching point. It doesn't have to be at zero. It can be, like you could think about like what's the effect of you know, income or wage on something, minimum wage if you have a bunching point sort of given to you by some, some, external, um, some external thing that would, that would, um, that would, that would you know, work, but it can't be Windsorized. And then finally, uh, heterogeneity by income. Our sample is small enough that when we tried to look at that, we just didn't get, didn't get very far. So. Thanks so much. I'm happy to talk more afterwards, but I appreciate the questions and the discussion. Thanks, everyone. We're now going to break for lunch. So those who are watching online, we will return at 1.30 Central Time. For those of you in the room, if you've registered for the lunch, you're going to go out that doors and kind of follow the crowd. If you haven't registered for lunch, it's likely we still have room for you, but just hold tight and uh, we'll, we'll get you up there.
All right, I think we're good to go. Um, all right, we're ready for the next session. We'll have two papers, uh, one on consumer demand, supply, credit supply barriers to growth uh, for black versus white uh, businesses, and another one on the local effects of capital flows, a China shock in the US housing market. The presenters will be Tiga and Leslie, and the discussant will be Luisa and Tara. So without any further delay, Tiga, take it away. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. And uh, thank you to the organizers uh, for including this paper in the program. Okay, I would like to say that uh, there is a change in the title. So bear with me, uh, the content is still the same. Okay, so uh, today I'm glad to share with you uh, some findings about uh, this topic, uh, which is uh, uh, consumer demand. We would like to see uh, how consumer demand and credit supply can be a bar barriers to grow for uh, black-owned businesses or black-owned startups. Okay, so uh, I guess, okay, before moving to our, uh, I would like to say that this is a joint work with uh, Eugene Tan from University of Toronto. And since uh, I'm currently uh, visiting the institute, the standard uh, disclaimer also applies. Okay, so. How can I go back? Okay, yeah, thank you. Sorry, it's very complicated. <laughs> okay, so uh, everyone in this room, I, I guess that um, you know uh, that uh, entrepreneurship is not a secret or uh, building a wealth. You know, we know that uh, entrepreneurship can be a stepping stone. Yeah, to build up uh, wealth over time, okay. And then we can uh, also uh, <clears throat> learn from uh, uh, you know, the literature that uh, the path to success is uh, pa pa paved with uh, many, many constraints. Uh, potentially, we have at least two type of constraints, okay. We have uh, what you call the credit constraint, and uh, the, second side, the second type of uh, constraint are what we call demand, demand side factors. The first one is related to the capital cost. If it's a costly for you to borrow uh, capital, it will be very difficult for you to have, you know, large firms or even profit, uh, you know, uh, you know, a profit, a profitable firms. So this will impact the growth of your of your business. Okay, and we also have uh, some evidence that uh, uh, demand side factors may injure your firm size. So, Let's say that you are facing lower demand. So facing lower demand means that you know you will end up with a lower sales. For example, lower sales will uh, you know, um, reduce your firm size or even the profitability and then the growth. Okay, it is against the backdrop of this uh, 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 constraints that we would like to ask the following question. It's a very simple question. So comparing black-owned startups and versus uh, white-owned startups, we would like to see if these type of factors. Uh, affect differenti differentially affect uh, uh, black owned startups uh, relative to white owned startups. And putting this to the broader context, you know, we may ask what are the implications of our findings to, uh, for this uh, racial wealth gap and uh, with um, demand and credit sided uh, responses. So this is uh, why we think uh, this work is interesting. And this is why we are trying to come up with some uh, uh, empirical evidence. But before doing this, we'd like to say that uh, uh, on the theory side, you know, we just use a simple framework where we consider a, a profit maximizing firm that will face a downward sloping demand curve, okay, with heterogeneous price elasticities. Okay, this is the main assumption in our framework. And then in this framework, we are able to derive uh, <clears throat> two key uh, equations, and with these two key, key equations, we'll, uh, try to, we'll show that the average differences uh, in the capital labor ratios can be used to detect what we call the uh, credit wedges, so the, the supply size, and 
if we, if we couple this with uh, the average differences in the revenue, uh, revenue average revenue, revenue to, to capital, we can also detect what we would term as consumer demand wages. Okay, so I don't know, maybe you may have uh, some concern to leave the room before the end of the talk, but leaving this room, you have to keep in mind, we have to take away two findings. We use the Kaufman firm survey data, and this is a single core uh, panel following firms from 2004 to 2011, and we have key findings. The first one is that in the cross section, we, we find that um, black owned startups relative to white owned startups face a greater demand and uh, supply side uh, wages. Okay, this is in the cross section. And then taking advantage of the time dimension, we're able to find that uh, uh, the initial differences in the uh, demand side wages are, are more persistent than the initial differences in uh, credit. Uh, credit wages. Okay, so we did a, a few uh, robustness checks, but today, uh, because of you know, time constraint, I will just talk about the first two productivity homogeneity, product homogeneity and the productivity differences. Okay, as I was saying, uh, if we put this in the big picture, we can say that uh, the demand side factors appear to be at least as important as uh, you know, the uh, credit access, credit wages, because uh, actually the, the main policies usually are targeted to uh, supply side uh, factors. So we believe that uh, this is showing that uh, potentially uh, taking into consideration, uh, taking into consideration demand side factor may help uh, tackle this uh, racial wealth gap issues. So, <clears throat> so this is a literature I. So I don't know if you, there is no, because of time concern, we'll try to wrap up there. So uh, fairly, Rob and Robinson is a closest paper to ours because they're using the same, the same data set. And you know, they extensively e explain that uh, uh, black entrepreneurs are facing a lot of credit constra constraints. So uh, this will be a useful paper for us to pick up the main uh, <coughs> the main uh, explaining factors. Okay, and if we take uh, in the consumer side discrimination, we have uh, this recent book, uh, the recent paper by Cook, John, uh, Logan, and Rosé in the QJ, QJE 2020 paper, where they use a green book uh, to, to infer, they use a green book uh, to explain that uh, there was potentially a consumer demand, consumer demand, discrimi consumer demand um, discrimination towards, uh, towards uh, uh, no, they use the, this green book in order to infer from the firm's uh, behavior that there was potentially consumer discrimination. So let's say uh, how the talk will go. I will show you this, this our simple framework and then go, back, go to the data and the baseline results and then but to show you some further validation and show you um, uh, what we mean by dynamics and then conclude. Okay, our framework is very simple in the sense that uh, we have a, <coughs> a firm uh, in the static environment uh, maximizing this profit function. In this profit function, pi, pi i, we have the, the revenue minus the total cost. And then we have a, this demand function, the inverse demand curve, P, which depends on uh, the, the output, which depends negatively on output, and, and, and the demand shifter, DI, and also uh, this term in red that we call a group-based consumer demand wedge, okay? So the idea here is that all else equal, if you have higher, uh, you are, if you are facing higher uh, consumer wedge, you will have higher demand and then you can charge higher prices and then you will end up with higher markups. Okay, so on the production side, we have a, a CES production, fu production function with a constant return to scale. Uh, this is, uh, <coughs> this is uh, identical for every, across individual and across groups. 
and the labor cost is the same because we would like to focus more on the friction uh, towards capital. Okay, so there, and also to capture this uh, wedge, the credit wedge, we're introducing this term, the delta uh, tau RG, which is, which is capturing the group-based uh, credit supply, credit wedge or supply wedge. Okay, so we see that uh, here, uh, the profit will be positively related to the demand wedge. So the higher the, 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 the demand wedge, the higher the, you will face, uh, the higher demand you will face, and then this will have an impact on, you will have the possibility to charge higher prices. Else is, else, all is equal. And then for the profit, for the, uh, the tau RG, there we have a, uh, you know, intuitively if you are facing higher borrowing constraint or higher implicit cost of capital, you will end up with a lower capital and this will have a negative impact on your profits. That being said, let me show you the first equation that we have. The first equation is the labor, the capital labor ratio. So we can show that the capital labor ratio uh, is <coughs> defined as the following. You have the, the first term, which is uh, the marginal rate of uh, technical substitution, uh, which you can show that it does not depend on the, the, uh, the market structure captured by this wedge, tau dg, and with the, our CES production function. And then we have uh, the interesting part in red, uh, the capital wedge, okay? This capital wedge will be important for us in our identification part. And then here, uh, you see that uh, if the higher is uh, the credit wedge, the lower will be the capital intensity because it's costly for you to borrow and then you will end up with lower capital uh, in your firm. And on the demand side, we can show that uh, using our CES production function, the capital labor ratio is not directly affected by the market structure uh, in, uh, captured by the tau dg. Okay, and then, so broadly, you can say that uh, the financial wedge uh, does not affect the revenue, but only affect the factor mix. So the, how you uh, define your capital and your labor. So if we take the group differences, the group differences will be uh, the, you know, the average uh, capital, labor in, uh, capital labor ratio uh, within the black group and that of uh, the white groups, okay? So and you take the difference and you can show that this is uh, pro proportional to the difference in the wedges. So this gives us a way of identifying the credit wedge. So whenever you see uh, this quantity being positive, it's a saying that uh, black uh, startups or black fir firms are facing greater credit wedge. This is how we expect we are identifying uh, the credit wedge in, uh, in our model. Okay, so of course, potentially there are uh, first of all, identification. For example, if uh, we have this situation where the idiosyncratic, uh, uh, idiosyncratic uh, aspect of the, the idiosyncratic can have a, aspect of the data can have a, an impact on the, the tau gr, potentially uh, this may bias our result downward, okay, through the, but the virtue of Jensen uh, inequality, but we are focusing on the, on the group, on the group uh, differences. So in the empirical part, we try to capture uh, many of these, uh, as many of these uh, potential uh, confounding factors, okay? Uh, try to minimize uh, the omitted various variable bias, okay? So the second equation is the average return, average return to capital or ALPK, which is defined as uh, the revenue, total revenue divided by uh, the capital. And then we can show that this uh, ARPK can be decomposed into in two separate, uh, uh, you know, effect, two separate effects. The first one is what we call the direct financial frictions, where it's uh, the log of the marginal product of capital and uh, the elasticity, out output elasticity. And we can show that this term uh, this, this term is a function of the uh, credit wedge. In this case, the higher is the uh, credit wedge, the higher will be 
uh, this, uh, this term, the direct financial friction, and you end up with a higher ARPK. And this is exactly the key identification uh, strategy used in recent papers you know, <coughs> or in the misallocation literature to say that uh, there is a, a financial friction, uh, heterogeneous financial friction in the, in the economy. And then, for example, through this uh, channel, we can say that whenever you see that uh, if black entrepreneurs they face a financial concern only, you will, they will end up with higher ERPK and lower capital intensity. This is what you have if you only use the first channel. The second channel is now what we call the net demand effect. The net demand effect is capturing the, the market structure, so the demand side. There, you see that we have two uh, channels. You have the direct impact and the indirect. The direct is captured by the idiosyncratic demand shifter and the tau G, which is the, uh, the group-based uh, wedge, uh, demand wedge. For example, if you have higher demand wedge, this will have an impact on the price. So the price will increase and then you end up with higher uh, markup, okay? For the, the tau RG, so the capital constraint, uh, this will have an impact on the marginal cost. The higher is the interest rate, the higher is the interest rate, for example, you end up with a higher cost and then you have ma higher marginal cost. This will shift up the marginal cost, cost curve and you end up charging higher price and then higher markup. Okay, let me now show you how we identify these two wedges. So we have the average differences across group. We have the, the first is the average within the group of, of black firms and the second one is within the group of white, uh, white firms. So taking the difference, you can show that, uh, so here to fix idea, you can show that here it's uh, in approximation and you have the first term which is capturing the, the credit wedge and the second one is capturing the demand wedge. And then if, the black, if a black entrepreneur they face a credit wedge, this term delta tau r will be uh, positive. And if it's a demand wedge, delta tau d will be negative. So they, they have two imp impact there. And then if you end up having lower average revenue product for black firm, it means that the second term, the effect of the first, second term is dominating the impact of the first term. Okay, this is how we identify the demand, uh, uh, the demand wedge in our model. Okay, now, uh, just to fix a uh, take stock here, we have uh, taken into consideration heterogeneous price elasticity allows us to use the capital level uh, metrics to identify credit wedge. But if you uh, jointly study this metric with the ARPK, well, ARPK you can, de you can detect uh, what we call credit, uh, what we call demand wedge. Okay, so what are the data? So we have the Kaufman survey data, the single curve from 2004 to 2011. So uh, for example, this gives you uh, the distribution of revenue, ca ca capital, and employment in the data. So you can clearly see that uh, even if you take the, 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 the median, you have a, a large gap. So you know, take, for example, the revenue divided by the non-cash, which represents uh, the uh, average return. You have 1,000 to 46, you have around two. 31 to 25, around, around two. So it's like, a, you know, it's a, a relation to two to one, okay. Um, our empirical strategy here is that, let's use these two equation coming from our uh, framework. So we have a, a, fixed if, a industry fixed effect, time fixed effect, and we are interested in delta and lambda. So through the length of our model, we are expecting lambda. If lambda is negative, it means that uh, firm, black firms are facing a financial constraint, a greater financial constraint. And if lambda, uh, I say lambda delta first for the capital labor, labor ratio, and lambda, if lambda is negative, in this case, they are facing a, a greater demand friction. Okay. So this is the, the results, the baseline results. So we see that delta is negative and significant in the different models. And 
if you take, for example, first column and you want to analyze, you know, you, you take it at the face value, it means that if uh, white firms are experiencing 4% as an uh, interest rate, black firms will have a, an implicit cost of 6%. So the delta, the delta will be something around 2%. 2 okay. So this is the revenue equation. For the revenue, we have also uh, negative and significant across the different models. So this is uh, supporting our theory. So there is a, a demand, demand, uh, uh, there are demand wedges, the, the channel of the demand wedge is, is there. Okay, so here we can say that a black firm are facing a tighter financial concern and also they are facing a lower demand. Okay, so let me to the warp up. Okay, so here we have a, a taking, a, try to capture, to validate what we found. Okay, let's say that we have a, we can divide the industry, use the industry as homogeneous as goods, and then we say, oh, if we divide, uh, we are able to divide the industry as goods. Uh, from our, from our, through the lens of our theory, uh, we expect that black firm will uh, experience greater financial, financial, greater demand wages in the in the sector of more of a, in the industry with a more, which are more homogeneous. Let's say, okay, and also we have these productivity bins that we address and we still find that our result holds. So let's say, okay, for sake of time, we have this, we divided the, the, the goods, the industry in terms of a, 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 a more homogeneous, less homogeneous, so for the homogeneous goods we have manufacturing and construction sectors. And then we have, uh, we're interested in uh, this coefficient, coefficient new D and new S and uh, we expect that new D will be negative if black firms are experiencing uh, more demand wages, greater demand wages in the, this type of uh, industries. And as a placebo test, since uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, capital, the capital intensity does, does not depend on the market structure, we expect that uh, it won't have any effect on the capital level ratio. And this is what we find. We have the new D, which is a uh, negative and significant, confirming uh, our channel. So there are, there are stronger demand wages for black firm in the more homogeneous sectors. Okay, for the capital labor ratio, we see that new S is, is not significant across the different models. So uh, this survives uh, the placebo test. Okay, so for the startups, for the productivity, if we divide, the, we divide, the, uh, we divide the the sample in terms of uh, uh, you know productivity, and seeing that the productivity is related to the you know the degree, the you know it is related to the education level. You know, so we have advanced degree, or, or if we suppose that uh, we can cons we can uh, use the fact that. In Incorporated firms are higher quality firms. We regress, we regress this equation, and then we see that even for these high quality firms, we still see that uh, uh, the lambda is negative. Okay, so they are still facing higher, you know, greater demand wages there. So let me go to the dynamics because I don't have much more time. Here we ask if the initial uh, differences are persistent. Okay. So if uh, they are not persistent, uh, it will be uh, a, you know, a check for our, our, our mechanism. Okay, for example, here for the label, for the capital intensity, we are looking for this ZRT over time. And ARPK, we are capturing the, the effect of the these wedges over time uh, for black entrepreneurs. So if we look at the, uh, the the results, we see that for the capital labor intensity, there is a convergence you know, from the, the, initial, the initial differences you know, disappear after four, after age four, because here we have, to consider, we have to keep in mind that since it's the same cohort, the year is equal to age, okay? So after, 
at age four, we see it, you know, uh, uh, there is a conversion. But after uh, the 2008 financial crisis, we end up seeing a, a widening of, uh, of uh, you know, of these differences because uh, the rationing of the credit is, is impacting more black entrepreneurs than white entrepreneurs. So the last graph here is for the profitability, so the revenue. Okay, for well, the revenue, we see that uh, it's the initial differences are still there even after, you know, over the whole, you know, sample period. Okay, so here we say that uh, uh, the initial differences in demand wages are persistent, and even you can say that uh, they are acyclical. Okay. So, in normal times, black firms do and they can, you know, save uh, to overcome the borrowing constraints. Okay, and then uh, if you want to. Uh, analyze this wealth accumulation, uh, we think that uh, taking into consideration demand side factors may be also helpful. So as a conclusion, we say that uh, we, are foc we focus here in the understanding the effect of the credit wedges and demand wedges, um, how they impact black uh, startup uh, versus white startups, and we a formalized framework to identify these two channels. But we find that, uh, you know, on average, on the cross section, uh, black firms tend to face greater uh, wedges, either demand or uh, uh, demand or credit wedges relative to white entrepreneurs, and these are persistent. The initial differences in demand wedges are persistent as compared to that of uh, credit. And then, but as a question, as a news cautionary note, we would like to say that uh, what we are capturing in this equation might be at best uh, a residual that we don't understand fully uh, the, the source. Okay, so, at, but we think that this opens room for more research and even for the type of policy that we may think of. Okay, thank you. This is the end of the presentation. Well, good afternoon. I am Luisa Blanco from Pepperdine University. I was a visiting fellow at the institute in 2018, so it's nice to be back. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so I will be discussing uh, Tiga's paper, right? So here I'm just kind of like summarizing um, the findings, right? So here we find a very interesting paper that develops a theoretical framework and then also um, is able to work with data to kind of show how the model works, right? So I think, uh, and here we can see that the lower returns to capital and capital intensive, uh, intensity, which is related to lower consumer demand and tighter credit constraints, right? So the paper is uh, very nicely show, right, that uh, black-owned uh, firms, right, they face uh, consumer discrimination and credit discrimination, right? And here I'm just sort of, Summarizing the findings, right? Again, I think the author did a very good job uh, working uh, with the data. Um, so here, you know, I will emphasize uh, my discussion. I am an applied economist, so my discussion will be more on, on the empirical side. Uh, but I thought that it was a very strong paper because, you know, when we're looking into this research question, I felt that uh, most of the time we think about, okay, let's answer this question, let's focus on the demand side, or let's answer this question, let's focus on the consumer side. So. I like this paper because, uh, so, they con so here it was nice to see how it was really focusing on, on both sides. And then I think the use of a theoretical model and, and the application of the data is, 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 is done well in the paper, right? Um, I think, you know, this paper is very relevant right now, right? Because we're interested on how can we address the wealth gap and we know that entrepreneurship, fostering entrepreneurship can be a tool. So I think this paper has very interesting findings, right? Um, that I will definitely recommend to the authors to think about, okay, you know, you have your academic paper, right? I will say, you know, I think it's, it's, it's well developed. You, know, you probably want to submit it to a journal soon. And that's great, right? But I think you also, I will encourage you to think about how can we make this message, you know, more accessible to a general audience? Because I think right now you have interesting policy implications, right? Especially uh, for those people who are interested in addressing um, the well uh, gap and, and where we're trying to deal with 
um, credit discrimination, right? I think, you know, that will be very interesting for the authors to think about more like a policy brief or like an op-ed, right? So that people are more aware of your work. Uh, that will be my recommendation. So here, you know, as I was kind of summarizing, here are the main findings. Um, so here, I, I thought it was very nice. The paper kind of talks about, you know, um, the, imp the, 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 the credit discrimination and the consumer discrimination and, and what is, you know, the effect size, right? So the paper talks about how black-owned firms face an average of around 52% higher cost of capital relative to white-owned firms. I mean, that seems like a large effect, uh, right? I will encourage the authors to like give a little bit more of context on the magnitude, right? I mean, if I see that, I'm like, oh, that's terrible, right? That shouldn't be, you know? So uh, in the paper, maybe elaborate a little more of, you know, what these higher costs means, you know, in, in context of other things. Then, for example, the paper also uh, emphasized the black entrepreneurs holding all these costs face uh, lower consumer demand. Uh, which leads to a markup wage of minus 60%, right? So we see this, um, this effect, right? I will encourage the authors to put it more in the context, right? And again, I mean, that those seem like a large effects to me, right? Uh, put it in context. Then here, I just have some ideas of what I think, you know, I think the paper does a good job, like doing some robustness checks. My ideas here are, you know, things maybe you can think about, you know, this data set or maybe, you know, for the future with other data sets, you know, kind of continue in this space because I think, you know, it's, it's an important area of research and I praise you for, uh, for your work here. Um, so I think I saw that in your paper you are controlling by gender, but I think it will be very interesting to think about this research question uh, disaggregating by gender, right? Because we know that there is these gender disparities when it comes to um, to wealth, right, and income, and financial knowledge, right. So it'll be interesting to see if your paper can, you know, think about this entrepreneurship question with a gender perspective. Then I saw in your slides you talk a little bit about the impact of the Great Recession. I think the paper that I had didn't touch on that, so that's why I'm recommending this, right. So I'm saying. One of my recommendations was, you know, can you think about, you know, the impact of the Great Recession because I know you are working with firms, but you mentioned that towards the end of your presentation, so maybe the version I had didn't have that, so maybe I missed that. But I, I think, you know, putting in context your research um, with the Great Recession is important, right, because we want to kind of put in the context of what happened there, right, and how that affected uh, minorities to a different degree. Uh, when uh, credit became more constrained, when we see the shift on demand. I know you had a one good slide that kind of touches on that, so that's great. So maybe elaborating more on that. I think another area that it will be very interesting to elaborate more is if your data allows you to do a little bit more of um, digging in relation to industry and sectors. I know you present uh, this difference between a homogeneous and uh, heterogeneous um, good, right? And I think, you know, so manufacturing and construction, right? But I still feel that, that that might be too aggregated, right? So I felt that if we go into really trying to answer this question, um, I will think that doing more digging by sectors and industry can be very interesting. Again, I'm not familiar with the data set. I don't know how much you can dig into that. But you can really think about, you know, a different, you know, like a service sector is different than a manufacturing sector, right? And especially thinking about credit constraints and consumer um, consumer demand, right? Uh, the sector of, uh, will be important. Uh, then also, again, I don't know if your data set allows you to do that, but I think it will be interesting to think about in relation to location and geographic conditions, right? Because the thing. Um, we can see different things happening in different areas of the United States. Um, so if there is something you can do, right, I, um, I am a, I, I've been working on the space of, of what I like to call the uh, social determinants of financial well-being, right? So I know there is so much in the environment that will, you know, lead to different outcomes in different places. So if there is something you can do around that, it will be very interesting. Again, with this data set or we're in the future for another paper. And then I think one piece um, that will be interesting to see uh, is to think more about the entrepreneur confidence uh, measures and proxies, right? 
So you use um, the education of the entrepreneur as a way to measure productivity, right? But again, you know, what else do we know about this entrepreneur, right? Because I think one is your level of education, but then also we know that for entrepreneurship, you know, confidence is also very important. Again, this might be something for another data set to think about. Right, but I think that uh, these are just some ideas of how you can dig deeper to kind of answer this question because I think your findings are really interesting, right? So we find that black owned firms face uh, higher um, credit constraints, right? And then we find, right, that there is consumer discrimination but for consumer, uh, for black owned firms. So, so I think some of these suggestions might help you to better understand the channels. I think that's one thing that the paper um, it still um, doesn't elaborate as much, but again, I know you know you can't do everything in one paper. So I think some of my recommendations here are more for things you can do later. But I think if we really want to understand, you know, why you know financial institutions are treating these firms differently, right? We want to understand that channel, right? Or if we want to understand, you know, why consumers are are treating. Uh, these firms differently, right? We need to spend more time to try to understand that side. So here, these are just like some, some quotes from the conclusion of the paper, I think. So here, uh, black individuals appear to be able to accumulate sufficient liquidity to overcome their initial lack of credit. So this is a great finding, right? We're finding that black owned firms are actually resilient, right? I mean, you don't give me credit. Okay, I'm just gonna make it up myself, you know? Um, I'm gonna work really hard. So I think, you know, trying to understand that better will be interesting, right? Um, well, you know, if that is the case, you know, maybe black owned firms are actually um, more attractive to financial institutions because they are quite resilient, right? So I thought that uh, we really need to understand that mechanism. I thought that was an interesting finding, but like, where is it coming from? Like, like how these firms are allowed to, do, are able to do that? I, I don't know yet, and, and that'll be interesting to dig. Um, and then I think, you know, as you mentioned in the paper, consumer demand differences are insurmountable. So I think that what, uh, what I gathered from the version of the paper that I had is that um, the consumer um, discrimination was actually, you know, more relevant because these firms were able to overcome um, the credit constraints, right? So then if that is the case, right, so we need to understand better, you know, consumer discrimination. I know in your literature, um, you cite some papers, but um, can we really think about, you know, how the role of location, um, the type of product, and the messaging are really related to this consumer discrimination? Um, so I think for, um, that's why thinking more about, you know, being able to disaggregate by sector or industry maybe help you to understand better, because I felt like this question of why consumers are discriminating against these firms, right, um, it's important and we want to learn more. Um, you know, it's kind of hard to think about, okay, how, you know, it depends. You know, if, if you are a, a black owned firm of a service company, and if you are a black owned firm of a manufacturing good, right, so it probably is a bit different your, the way that you interact with consumers, right? So I would say uh, trying to find, pay more attention to that will be uh, very beneficial for, the, for, for this paper or for your future work, but um, excellent work. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Tiga. Um, now we have room for questions. I see a couple of hands in the back. Is that Ryan? I, I can't see behind the mask. Um, Natalie, yeah. <laughs> My facial recognition with masks is pretty good. Go ahead. Th thank you. Um, I just had a qu quick thought. It seemed to me that the price of labor may also differ across groups in the same way that the price of capital could. And I could kind of tell a story in either direction of whether that's higher or lower for black owned firms. And, and then it seems to me that the, the interpretation of the capital labor ratio gets a little bit trickier there. And so I'm just curious your thoughts on that. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, we'll collect all the questions as we did earlier, and then uh, Tiga will come up and answer both Luisa and uh, the questions. Oh, Bill, thank you. So I think your use of the term consumer is confusing. In the case of construction, uh, this is really more business to business. It's well documented, because 
I have to do benchmark studies for justifying minority procurement. Black-owned firms get highly discriminated in business to business. They are far more reliant on the public sector. So there are two things going on. One, they have to competitively bid for the public sector. Business to business, who knows how the deal gets cut and how things are being divided. So I, I think using the term consumer may be misleading because people may be thinking that there are individuals out in the street they are doing this. And, and for the B2B stuff, that's not true. But there is a source for a different problem, and that is for those that are consume people household facing, and that is because if they're going to a low-income neighborhood, they, they do face a different demand curve. What was very fascinating during the downturn, Fiona left? Well, anyway, her work is really enlightening because when you looked at the PPP loans, clear evidence, we all saw black firms didn't get the PPP loans, but her data was clear. When we gave support to black households, the cash flow of minority-owned firms went totally back up. And so I think it may be fascinating when you do disaggregate by industry to think about those that are services and therefore looking at their local community and that sort of thing, and therefore facing a community that is itself income constrained. Um, because that piece of evidence that Fiona was able to generate from the pandemic was really enlightening and a different way of thinking about it. For example, for HBCUs, for historically <coughs> black colleges, we of course face this. If, if you're gonna have a community where 75%, the people you're drawing from, 75% are Max Pell eligible, you got a problem. The, the amount you can charge to, for tuition, if those are the people you wanna serve, that's different. Same thing that these firms were facing. So I think that there's a bigger picture there that, that you could tell. And for the Fed, the Fed has always been the least responsive to credit discrimination. They've always had this responsibility. Study after study after study showed they abandoned it. They, and we saw the PPP loans embarrass them that this could have happened on such a large scale and right before our eyes, the things that we have been complaining about credit discrimination. This is really important to the Fed, and I think it's important to highlight you know, what this institute can generate, is no, you have a real impact when you don't enforce equal access to credit. Thank you, Bill. Um, maybe one more question. Uh, Andy, Natalie? Andy's here, uh, on the same as Bill, on the other end. Thank you. Uh, maybe this is what, what Louisa meant when she said to dig in more at the industry level, but I, I would almost like to, I was trying to figure out if putting industry fixed effects would uh, allow for heterogeneity in the output elasticity parameter, right? So you're trying to get that separate from the wedge, and maybe it, maybe it works, but it'd be nice to see those regressions with, the, with your fixed effect uh, for black owned business by industry, like maybe there's a distribution across industries and some seem to have much smaller wedges than others. That could be interesting in and of itself and it also might be just cleaner. Thank you, Andy. So Abby, Abby has a question on Natalie's side. Um, somehow the question share of my left doesn't, is not proportional to the population share. So I need a question on this side, but Abby, go ahead. <laughs> I'll go super quick. I, and I wanted to build on Bill's point, which is, you raised in your last slide the point that thinking about policies to address this, and I'll put it in quotes, um, consumer discrimination, um, or at least consumer demand shortfall, because I think you're careful to kind of keep it in that in that box, um, are hard to think of. What policies do we have for that? Procurement is the major policy that we have for that, and, and what you're picking up is the impact even after those procurement policies are in place. 
So I think maybe just trying to understand why they're falling so short or even kind of quantify, okay, this is how much goes out in procurement dollars and this it's this percent of the remaining wedge. Um, that could be really useful for just at a very high level trying to understand the impact that those procurement policies are or are not having. All right. And since there's no question on my left, I'll move to the left. Uh, one more question for you, Tiga. Uh, you end by suggesting that black-owned businesses are able to accumulate their way out. It's not clear. Can you tell us if it could also possibly just be that credit constraints are relaxed later for them? Okay. All right. You come up, and you have plenty of questions to answer. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you very much for these questions. Okay, I will start with, uh, okay. um, with Luisa's questions and uh, comments. Thank you for, by the way, the, for the you know, suggestion about uh, this op-ed or policy brief. So we'll talk to my co-author and we'll see what we come up. Okay, so uh, you asked about the context. So in order to understand the magnitude, okay, so um, for, for the capital labor, capital labor ratio, um, the, interest, the interest rate, the, you know, the wedge, that, the average wedge that we are trying to pick up is, you know, uh, is uh, we can say that it's approximately uh, the, the, the real wedge that uh, you know that uh, we can uh, ob can say observe uh, the credit wedges that we can uh, infer from you know the data that we have, meaning that uh, if uh, our, the way we identify through you know using our equations these differences in the wedges, if uh, uh, this uh, this is a cleaner way of identifying these wedges, so we believe that uh, we think that the coefficient that you see gives us an idea of the magnitude, at least for the capital labor ratio, okay? But for the demand wedges, it's a little bit complicated because in the, in the, in the model, we say that uh, the, mar the markups are function of uh, the, this idiosyncratic demand shifter, okay? There is a, this idiosyncratic shifter and you also have the group-based uh, you know, uh, wedges. So if with, even within the same group, you can end up having you know, higher demand than uh, the other entrepreneur, even in the same group. So this can have an impact on the, the value of the coefficient. That's why we didn't want to go uh, right away you know, um, interpreting uh, the, the coefficient of the coming from the demand wedge equation. So this gives us an idea that saying that on average, Black firms are charging lower prices uh, or lower markups with respect to white entrepreneurs. It's on average, so we are taking the average differences between the two groups. But I agree that uh, you know we can work more to understand in terms of magnitude what we can put on these numbers. Okay, for the gender part, yeah, there is already a paper uh, by Morazoni and C, JME twenty two where they already use the same data set and they are focusing on the misallocation driven by gender. And there, uh, they, they still find the same uh, conclusion as a standard literature saying that uh, uh, what if female entrepreneurs, they face higher mar marginal product of capital, so they end up with higher ARPKs. So, but in our case, it's like, it's a, a you know, uh, it's a, uh, you can say that uh, we are going against the standard theory. The standard theory say that if you see higher marginal product of capital, it means that you are facing financial constraint. But what we are saying here is that if you see higher marginal product of capital, and if uh, the, the demand constraint is not active, so this is fine, this is fine. But if the demand constraint is active, is, you know, potentially you are confounding the effect of this uh, channel. So that's why we wanted to highlight clearly that uh, uh, the way of allowing 
you know, heterogeneous price elasticity may be a way of uh, disentangling uh, these two effects. But I can assure you that uh, the gender part is already, uh, has been already studied in the recent paper. And if you want to break down our data set in terms of black, black entrepreneurs and, uh, you know, black, you know, black uh, uh, female entrepreneurs, we won't have much data. The data point will be low, you know, we don't have uh, much data to, to do the regression based on this, this, um, you know, these uh, categories. Okay, so for the industry sectors, yeah, it's true. We don't have data on prices. We don't have data on, uh, uh, you know, more digits. The, you know, we, we can go to two digits, and we know that uh, this is, uh, you know, it's roughly, you know, it's not uh, that, uh, it's not granular data to allow us to go deep. So, but we work on that. Uh, to see if we can have more data. Okay. You don't have to answer all of them, so do a selection of the other questions. Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, <Sorry. laughs> okay. And all the questions related to location, uh, location, uh, geography, and all these stuff, we are aware of that. But the problem is uh, the data. We don't have a, a data. If we want to disentangle this, the data at this point, uh, we'll end up with fewer uh, you know, entrepreneurs in the in the in the in the in the in the in, the, in, in each industry or in each year, because on average we have six percent of entrepreneurs in this data sample, and uh, it's the same cohort from 2004 to 2011. Okay, so this is a t data constraint, and. So, going to consumer, uh, consumer, business to business, business to business. Uh, so, business to business uh, transaction. Yeah, in the paper, for example, we have this footnote where we say, "Oh, what we are terming as uh, the main wedge may potentially pick up uh, these two type of uh, uh, transactions." For example, you have the business to business transaction and also the business to end consumer transaction. But uh, right now we don't have the possibility to, to disentangle this the, both. You know, so, but uh, I agree that uh, your comment is, is uh, welcome. And um, the PPP example, for example, it's uh, also important to show that uh, if you have procurement, this can help uh, business to increase their profitability. And right now there is a, a policy intent by the by the uh, uh, you know Biden Harris administration, where they are trying to support uh, minority businesses with uh, this type of policy that you you uh, you know you already stated. Okay, so uh, red card. Red card. I know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so uh, for the wage bill, you know, we control for the wage bill uh, as at some point, uh, but our results still uh, are old. So uh, your comment is welcome, and. Um, Last question. Uh, so uh, this question about procurement. So yeah, I will uh, try to you know dig deeper <laughs> to see if we can have a more data point. And you know, it's true that in our data we don't have a procurement information on procurement before you know 20, 2011. So I cannot answer uh, the procurement policy with this framework, uh, with this data set. But if we can have data. Uh, to do the same type of analysis, it will be really interesting. Okay, sorry for not having the possibility to answer all the questions, but we can talk after. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> all right, Leslie, you're up next. Discussion with Tara. And your slide will be up shortly. Great. Well, thanks a lot to the organizers for including our paper on the program. Uh, my name is Leslie Shen. I'm from the uh, Boston Fed, and so the usual disclaimer applies. And today I'll be talking about local effects of uh, global capital flows, a China shock in the U.S. housing market. All right. So our main motivation is that 
we want to call attention to a form of non-traditional opaque international capital flow that has become prevalent, which is residential housing capital flows. So this is you now different from the traditional you know, uh, foreign direct investment, foreign portfolio investment that's commonly captured in the balance payment. And it's unclear that how this form of capital is really captured in the balance payment, even though according to estimates from the National Association of Realtors, they have been growing over time. So they range about 3 to 11% of gross capital inflows in the U.S. between 2010 to 2018. And that's is tends to be you know, very controversial. It has prompted a lot of macroprudential uh, policies in the form of taxes on these type of non-resident real estate purchases. They were imposed in many countries, Singapore, Hong Kong, Australia, Canada, New Zealand. Um, and you know, there are obvious welfare questions that's implied by these sorts of capital inflows. The existing literature on this topic um, mostly have been studying you know, housing purchases uh, by these foreigners on housing prices. And they find that housing prices increase in response to these capital inflows. But also a lot of these literature is you know, using kind of a discrete proxy for these uh, foreign capital inflows because the measure is, it's very hard to capture it. So, this is one part that we want to contribute to. First, we want to provide the first formal quantification of these foreign capital inflows into the US or specifically the California housing market. And second, we want to go beyond just looking at house prices, but ask the question, what are the real effects, real implications of these inflows and what are the channels underlying these real effects? Okay, so here are the main results of our paper. First, we document that there has been a more than 30-fold surge in housing capital inflows from China after 2008. And we name that you know, a China shock in the US housing market. Second, we find that these capital inflows from China has significantly increased employment in local economies in the US. Um, third, we find that these employment effects has been largely driven by a housing networks channel. Uh, we see strong house price effects, and a lot of these employment effects are concentrated in the non-tradable sectors. And finally, we also find that these capital inflows have displaced local residents from the local economies that witness these capital inflows. In particular, it's the low-income households that have been driven out from these neighborhoods. So there are you no know, adverse distributional consequences in, as a result of these capital inflows. All right, so this is the outline of my talk. I am going to talk, first talk about how we're quantifying these foreign housing purchases, uh, then providing overview of our conceptual framework, then discuss the empirical methodology, then and on the results implication of our results. All right. Um, so the goal uh, in, for quantifying is constructing measures of these residential capital inflows. Um, it is challenging, mainly due to the lack of data to identify whether these transactions are coming from foreigners or domestic residents uh, due to legal restrictions on how these data are collected. The, our solution for that is we're going to use transaction level data and devise a three-step imputation algorithm. The data we're going to use are housing transaction data from DataQuick, which um, contains a universe of housing purchase records from county register of deeds and assessor's offices. So the data contains variables like, you know, what's the sale price of the house, the closing date, the address of the home, um, various characteristics of the houses that's purchased, information on the financing of the house, as well as the names of the buyers and sellers. Um, our sample is uh, you know, single family residential transactions in the three largest CBSAs in California. So that contains 17 counties and 774 zip codes. And overall, that's about 1.8 million uh, residential housing transactions over the period of 2001 to 2013. 
So now, how to go about from the data to the measures we're going to use uh, to estimate the impact of these housing transactions. So we devised this three-step algorithm. First, we identify the ethnicities of the buyers from the first and last names of the buyers of these houses. Um, so we're using this algorithm by Bill Kerr that identifies the ethnicity of, that you can infer from the names. And it, they can identify eight ethnicities, um, so English, Chinese, European, Hispanic, Indian, Japanese, Korean, and Russian. So as an example how this works, so if you have, let's say, like a name like Zhao Li, which is you know, a very standard ethnic Chinese name, the algorithm is going to assign that name a probably one of belonging to the Chinese ethnicity. So if there is a name like Zhang Li, which could be of you know, Chinese or American ethnicity, the probability will be assigned based on the proportion of the Chinese Americans in the MSA where the housing purchase occurs. And we run this algorithm, and we only keep transactions that belongs to one of these eight ethnic groups with a probability one. So we're dropping all the known John Lees and mixed ethnicities from the data set. That's the first step. For the second step, we only keep housing transactions by non-Anglo Americans that are in all cash. Okay. So this is motivated by you know, foreigners, they have very limited access to US mortgage markets. Um, and uh, various uh, survey results have shown that non-resident foreign buyers are much more likely to purchase houses in all cash relative to resident buyers. So this is our second step in ensuring that we're really capturing kind of the foreign sample. Then for the third step, we adjust the measures to keep only non-resident purchases. Um, so how do we do that? We make an assumption that the propensity to make an all-cash purchases is similar between Americans and resident non-Americans. So if you are of a non-American um, ethnicity, but you reside in the US, your propensity to purchase in all-cash is similar to that of you know, Native Americans. And we do some robustness analysis um, um, checks using our data to see if this pattern holds, and in general, it holds. So this is our three-step algorithm, and with that, we have our measure of um, foreign housing transaction purchases by value and by count. Okay, let's observe how it looks. So this plots um, the uh, amount of, uh, no, the share of housing purchases by dollar by the different foreigner groups as a share of overall housing transactions in California. And as you can see, you know, the stark pattern is those by Chinese kind of surged around the two th early 2008 periods while that by all other foreigner groups are pretty constant. Okay. Uh, and you know, they go as high as 3.5% you know, of overall housing transactions in California around the end of our sample period. And we get a similar pattern if we look at counts. Okay. So it's not just you know, they're buying higher end homes and that's driving the whole result. So this is not the focus of our paper, but briefly, why do we think there was a, such a surge in you know, foreign um, housing transactions that's coming from China? Uh, we think there are two main you know, policy-driven, um, uh, these are driven by two main policies. The first is the loosening of capital control policy in China in late 2017. Um, the government relaxed capital outflow regulation um, from the Chinese side, increased it to 50,000 annually, even though that looks small relative to the overall housing purchases. But there is a common practice that's called smurfing, where um, you no know, friends, families, neighbors, they kind of pull their money together and put that into one overseas bank account. And then some overseas can use that pooled money to purchase a house. 
and there has been like various regulations from the Chinese side to kind of um, avoid, control these type of behavior. But uh, these behaviors still exist. That's why Chinese government has been keeping stepping up, leveling up their kind of um, policy in response to these type of practices. And the second set of um, policy is a series of housing purchase restrictions by the Chinese government around 2007 and thereafter to curb housing price inflation. Um, no, now, uh, like, City residents can only now purchase two houses, and the resident can only purchase one house in Chinese cities, etc. So they could will be moving motivated to move their money out of the domestic market and purchase into the foreign markets. Okay. So in addition to the surge that I documented earlier, there is the second stylized factor we want to call out, which is that um, the foreign Chinese they tend to buy into areas that's historically populated by ethnic Chinese. So this graph, we're taking the difference in um, these housing purchase shares between the top two deciles of the historical ethnic Chinese population neighborhoods relative to the, all the other decile neighborhoods. And we see you know, the pattern is even more stark, the magnitude is higher, and in absolute values, if we focus on these neighborhoods that's you know, historically populated by ethnic Chinese, the share go as, as high as about 7%. So these are the two facts that we document with the data. All right, now moving on from these facts we document to estimation results, we construct a conceptual framework that helps us to think about, you know, how do we think about the real impacts of these housing purchases. So it's a simple framework, and given this is a short presentation, I'm not gonna go into detail, just outlining uh, the setup and the main predictions. So think of there are two regions in the economy, okay? and there are two goods, tradable goods, which can be freely traded across uh, zip codes, and there is a non-tradable good which must be consumed by the local residents of that neighborhood. And each neighborhood has a fixed housing stock. And we allow for, for mobility in cross-regional commuting as well as cross-sector job switching. And workers they just have simple Cobb Douglas preferences over the two goods and housing. And production is governed by a constant return to scale technology with labor as the only input. Okay, then we kind of solve the model uh, in initial equilibrium. And then we suppose that one of the regions, region one, faces an exogenous foreign housing demand shock. Then uh, we generate a set of predictions based on the equilibrium solutions to that model. And there are four pred main pr predictions from that model. First, uh, we predict that a positive shock in foreign housing demand is gonna increase local employment in the directly impacted region, and that's determined actually by the number of commuters. Second, the employment effect is partly driven by a housing network channel, so increasing demand increases local house prices. Okay. And uh, that would you know, increase the demand for, an uh, for goods, and that thus increase uh, employment. And third, another part of the channel is a displacement channel. Um, increase in housing uh, foreign demand is going to increase local house prices, which would displace part of the residents out of these neighborhoods. And fourth, um, based on uh, more, the more realistic calibration um, uh, numbers, we find that the housing network channel tends to be the dominant force that results in the concentration of the employment effect in really the non-tradable sectors. Okay, so how do we test uh, these predictions? Um, we're gonna run this type of um, diff and diff type of regressions where the outcome variable are the ones of interest in zip code Z at time T, and the main regressor are this Chinese housing transaction value or count that we constructed using our algorithm. Um, we are going to include a set of zip code level controls to control for differences in zip codes, including population, population density, the education level as measured by the shared population with bachelor degrees from the pre-sample period, the proximity uh, to a university uh, in the zip code, 
and we also include some pre-sample period trends of income and the respective outcome variables. In addition, we include county year fixed effects. Um, so we are really looking at cross zip code, but within county variation. So that controls for concerns like, you know, maybe you're worried about there is a boom in Silicon Valley that is driving a lot of results, but we're really looking at cross zip code variation within a particular county. But well, one concern we have is that of omitted variable bias. You can think of variable that's both correlated with you know, Chinese uh, housing demand and maybe employment in the zip code. So what we're gonna do is we use an IV approach that's motivated by the second stylized factor that we document. We instrument these foreign Chinese housing purchases with kind of a shift share variable. So with aggregate foreign housing transaction in California weighted by the historical population of ethnic Chinese in each zip code. Okay. Then identifying assumption is conditioning our controls. So the zip code level characteristics as well as the county year fixed effect, the historical ethnic Chinese population share do not systematically influence changes in local economic conditions, that's employment, house prices, but only through that of these capital inflows. And we do you know, very robust check to, to see that, um, that this assumption holds. Okay, so let's move on to look through the results. Um, this is the first main regression, which is regressing total employment in different zip codes on the um, foreign Chinese housing transaction value and count interacted this with this post dummy, which is conditioning on 2008, which is where we document this surge in foreign Chinese housing inflows. And we find a strong, significant, positive results. So in terms of economic magnitude, a one standard deviation increase in this uh, Chinese housing purchases explain 21% of the cross-sectional variation in total employment. And you know, can notice that you know, the coefficient on count is a bit higher on, than on value, which suggests that you know, the effect is not driven by really purchases of just higher end homes, uh, but kind of across homes from all price distribution. Okay. So that supports the first prediction from our model. And then we want to kind of understand the channels that's driving this total employment result. So first, looking at this housing net worth um, prediction, so whether these foreign housing transactions are driving up local house prices. And if we uh, regress house prices by Zillow or by the transaction level data on the foreign Chinese housing purchases, we find a, a strong positive results. And in terms of economic magnitude, a one standard deviation increase in this log CHTV explains 27% of the cross-sectional variation in house prices. And the absolute value raises the house price in the zip code by 17% on average. Um, so this you know, is supportive evidence of this housing networks channel. And the other channel that we, uh, the model shows is this displacement channel that they're likely to drive out local residents. And we proxy the number of local residents in an economy by the number of tax returns which has been used in various literature. And what we find is that this increase in foreign purchases significantly decline, lower the number of local residents. Okay? Um, and the results you now are strong and significant. And this may be surprising because you may think, you know, um, these you know, housing purchases, maybe they are attracting a lot of immigrant inflows. Um, why are we seeing kind of a decline in uh, total number of residents? But there has been various, you know, Anecdotal evidence, as well as some analysis that shows like uh, foreigners, especially Chinese, they tend to leave their purchase, foreign purchases vacant. Okay? Um, and even in cities domestically in China, uh, there are various evidences of like ghost cities where they just leave the secondary homes they buy as investment properties vacant. Um, so that is kind of consistent with uh, this result are we seeing? And if there are anything, it seems that the displacement effect of local resident, residents dominate any of the immigrant effects that we may be seeing. Okay. And 
Third, now we want to kind of disentangle the relative importance of the housing networks versus displacement channels. And one prediction of the model is if the housing networks channel dominates, the effect should be concentrated in the non-tradable sectors. So if we look at the non-tradable sector employment, their relationship to local house, the foreign Chinese housing purchases, we indeed see you know, a very strong positive result. Uh, while we see a no result on the tradable sector uh, employment. And even if we exclude construction from the non-tradable uh, sector employment measure, we still see a positive result. So this overall suggests that you know, the housing networks channel may be the dominant force in driving the employment effect. And, um, it may be a bit odd that if there are displacements, why do we still see such employment, strong employment effect? So one way to think about it is there may be some endogenous response in amenities in local uh, neighborhoods in response to displacement of residents. And there are some recent papers documents that. And if we look at the correlation of the average income relative to these foreign capital inflows, we find that there is a positive relationship. So that shows that you know, the average income of the remaining residents in the local, res uh, of the local neighborhoods tends to be higher. So it's foreseeable that you know, uh, restaurants, you know, various shops kind of, kind of um, changed, targeted their products more toward the higher end uh, population in terms of income. So, and then we do you know various robustness checks in our paper. Uh, there are just here, just a few examples. You no, know, first we ask, you know, are neighborhoods that historically attracted more ethnic Chinese systematically different in terms of economic conditions? So we regress kind of the pre-shock period outcome variables like um, employment income on the post changes in foreign Chinese housing transactions. And we find a null result. It seems that the neighborhoods that you know, later on attracted more foreign Chinese capital do not seem to be very different uh, on various economic condition dimensions. And the second is, you know, we were concerned maybe like the neighborhoods attracted more ethnic Chinese were affected by the global financial crisis differently relative to other neighborhoods because the period that we saw the increase was around 2008. Um, so we do various analysis where we you know, focus just on 2012 to 2013, kind of the post-crisis period. We still observe a strong result. We add in various controls that potentially captures you know, whether the neighborhoods are more resilient or less resilient to financial crisis, like you know, the share of foreclosed homes in each neighborhood. So those neighborhoods may be more affected by uh, financial crisis. The number of all cash transactions, these neighborhoods may be less affected, more resilient to financial crisis. And the financial sector employment, which is financial sector is a sector that was hit the hardest by the financial crisis. So maybe these neighborhoods are hit more by the financial crisis. But even controlling for all these, we still see you know, a strong effect. And you know, we do a lot more robustness checks in our paper where we you know, do event study to check whether the uh, parallel trend assumption holds and we find that they do. We do balance tests to see if there are any potential violation of the exclusion restriction, the cross-sectional variation of the IVs and uh, we don't. And we run alternative specifications using kind of a standard diff and diff regression. We run IV regression without time interaction. And we also look into you know, if there are measurement errors uh, in our construction of these measures, where they affect the results or not. And in general, we find that our results are pretty robust. Okay. And we do also look at the external validity of our estimates relative to existing literature in terms of the implied elasticity of employment to housing net worth. And we find they're uh, consistent with estimates from the and Sufi paper. Okay. And finally, I'm going to end on, on this result looking at the distributional consequences. So we break down the number of uh, the tax returns into those from the lower income households, which is under the 50,000. Uh, bucket and those above the 50,000. And what we find is that really these housing purchases have been driving out lower income households in particular. We see a strong result there, but uh, insignificant effect for the higher income population. 
Okay, so I'm going to conclude. So our paper, we provide the first quantification of these foreign housing um, capital inflows into the US, and from that we document a China shock in the US housing market. And what we find is that these capital inflows from China has significantly increased local employment, and the employment effect is driven both by a housing networks channel as well as by a displacement channel with a formal playing a potentially greater role. And they also been driving out local residents that of particularly of low income residents. So there is you know, some gentrification effects going on there and the welfare implications of these should be studied further. And you know, in terms of the broader contribution really coming from more of an international finance perspective, uh, this is, we see that as providing new perspective on the real and distributed consequences of capital flows. And relative to international literature has, that has mainly relied on kind of the macro uh, level effects regressions. We think that using cross-sectional time series variation, looking focused on the impact on local economies is a way to tease out more well-identified results looking at the in effects of capital inflows. And finally, relative to trade literature, you know, there has been a lot of the China shock, but mostly on trade. And we think our paper kind of suggests that there may be also a China shock on the finance side. So thanks a lot. Tara Watson, it's great to be here, and I really appreciate the opportunity to um, talk about this paper on the local effects of um, this China housing shock. Um, so I really like this paper. I think um, the, my big takeaway is I find it both really interesting and I'm pretty convinced by these results. There was a surge in house purchases by Chinese foreign investors. Starting around 2008, um, you saw Leslie describe this really innovative way of getting a handle on um, who these buyers are, which has been hard to do in the literature. So that's um, been, that's an impressive contribution here. Um, the authors also document that these purchases were concentrated in historically ethnic Chinese neighborhoods. Um, and they're therefore able to use an instrument, the shift share instrument, um, to identify a causal effect of these purchases. And um, I mainly work on immigration, and there's a shift share instrument literature in immigration. It's widely used, but there's also been criticism of it because um, there's sort of um, correlated flows over time in the, um, in, in say, uh, the arrival of Mexican immigrants to certain neighborhoods. And so when you're using this instrument, it's hard to distinguish between um, is this the effect of immigrants arriving this year, or is this something to do with the fact that this neighborhood also got more immigrants 30 years ago, and these are long-run impacts? So here we have uh, an unusual circumstance where um, the population of Chinese, ethnic Chinese residents in the location is driving these new flows, and the reason these flows are arriving now as opposed to in the past is really because of this policy shift in China. So it's a nice, uh, cleaner shift-share instrument um, application. Uh, the authors document that these, what I'm going to call treatment neighborhoods, but you should think of these as historically Chinese neighborhoods in large metro areas in California, um, have had more employment starting in 2008. It's all concentrated in the non-tradable employment sectors. You saw have an increase in house prices, have um, gains in income, and uh, have a decline in tax filers, which they use as a proxy for population. So um, the one caveat I would say as far as the um, convincing causal identification here is that this is a really tough time to try to write a paper like this. Um, the 2008 moment when China liberalized these flows uh, obviously coincides with a lot of other things going on in housing and employment markets. And so uh, here I've just plotted for California on the left housing price indices um, and on the right the total employment in California. And the blue is their pre-period, the orange bar there is their post-period. You see this, the backdrop here is really tough. And so your typical things like looking at pre-trends is really only gonna get you so far in um, believing a causal result. The authors do do a lot um, in the paper. You saw a little bit of it in the presentation to try to, to tease this out. 
One thing I didn't see that um, I think might help would be taking some of these zip code characteristics that they control for using baseline or pre-period um, zip code characteristics, interacting those with posts. So that would control for things like, did dense neighborhoods change disproportionately? Or did neighborhoods that were in more, had a, you know, were more leveraged in the mortgage market, uh, were they affected disproportionately? Just to rule out other correlates of historically Chinese neighborhoods. Um, but that being said, I'm overall, I am pretty convinced by the results, and so I wanted to talk about just some um, bigger picture things that I think we could think about with this paper. So one thing that occurred to me was about general equilibrium effects. The authors have a really nice model that Leslie didn't have time to get into um, that really works through what these effects should look like. Um, so there's a sort of, what I'm gonna call again, a treatment neighborhood, and there's a control neighborhood, and they have a model where the housing price is gonna go up in the treatment neighborhood, because there's increased demand for housing, um, but that's actually gonna spill over into the other neighborhood because people who are displaced from the treatment neighborhood are gonna go look for housing elsewhere. So you're gonna get house price increases in both places. Um, similarly, if you think about employment in the non-tradable sector, which is another one of their empirical focuses, um, you're gonna see increases in that employment in the treatment neighborhood, but also some spillover effects um, in the, the control place. And that's coming from the fact that some of the people move to the control place, even though those might be the lower income people, there's still more people there that drives employment. Uh, but in the treatment neighborhood, there are fewer people, but they're richer, so that also drives employment. So uh, that's all fine and good. Now, if you're gonna take it to empirics and you're gonna have county year fixed effects in there, it means you're controlling zip codes in one county in the same year to other zip codes in the same county. And so the places that uh, your displaced people would naturally be displaced to are going to be in your control group, essentially. And so I think um, if the model is, is correct, that both of these things are increasing, then you're gonna be understating, actually, the true impacts uh, with this empirical approach. Now, um, there, it may not be that the model is quite that simple, and that's because the theoretical model in the paper doesn't get into some of the distributional impacts that I think are actually very interesting and important. Um, so, uh, you know, as Leslie mentioned, we would imagine that high house prices are gonna drive out some people from the neighborhood and those are gonna tend to be lower income people. Um, in terms of the empirics, what that means is what they're describing as a sort of net worth channel is both a net worth channel and what you might think of more as a compositional effect that you're getting different people living in these neighborhoods. Um, there, there are no renters in the model per se, but of course they exist in real life and presumably are gonna be made worse off. It seems unlikely to me at least that the employment effects would uh, more than compensate them for the, the house price shock. Um, but this leads to all kinds of interesting questions about um, economic segregation, uh, what happens to historically Chinese neighborhoods. It's not clear based on the information in the paper to me actually what would happen uh, to, to either of those things. It really depends on where these house prices, this, these house purchases were relative to the overall distribution, whether that's increasing or decreasing economic segregation. And then, you know, presumably this could in fact um, help preserve a Chinese neighborhood if we're sort of keeping uh, ethnic Chinese capital in ethnic Chinese neighborhoods. So uh, I think that's a, a rich avenue for further inquiry. I think the authors, if they wanted to pursue this further, could use the ACS, their zip code level ACS data. Um, that the timing doesn't quite work out. First big chunk is 2005 to 2009. Um, but you could, you could sort of see what's happening to these neighborhoods in terms of the people who are living there in a more direct way using that data. The next point I wanted to think about a little bit was external validity. Um, so, you know, because this uh, experiment, if you will, happened at a time of crisis, it's worth thinking about what would happen um, if we ran the same thing where there wasn't this backdrop of a mortgage crisis going on and an impending recession. Um, also, it would be interesting to think about would we expect to see the same results if the new housing was purchased by people who are also going to live in the, in the neighborhood as opposed to just people who are leaving the houses vacant. You might think that might spur even more employment in the area. Um, and then, of course, California is just really weird. <laughs> uh, it's got rent control. It's got 
uh, property tax limit rules. It's got school finance complications. This is a, from a map from a recent paper of San Francisco. Um, the purple dots uh, in this uh, are apartments with rent control in San Francisco, and the green dots are those without. So um, rent control is a really big issue here. I had a hard time thinking about how that's going to intersect with these impacts um, where you know, the rent can't go up as fast as the market might want it to go up, but the house prices can. Um, so my last set of comments is just some things I'd love these, these authors to work on. There is a lot in this paper. It's got tons of robustness tests. It's got a lot of detail, a lot of appendices. I think it was like 74 pages or something. So I, I'm not suggesting that these go into this paper, um, but for future work, I'd love to see, um, as I mentioned, some work on how this affects income segregation um, and ethnic segregation or um, clustering. And um, also, you could think about looking at specifically at housing-related hardship for the groups that you think are most likely to be displaced. Um, and I think that could be, this could be a really informative experiment, sort of exogenous shock to that housing hardship. Um, and then also thinking about the fiscal impact. So we have this house price increase that should, in, uh, in most worlds, increase property tax revenue and therefore change expenditures. As I said, California is odd. The, the property taxes can't go up um, maybe as much as they otherwise would, and the school finance system is, um, has a lot of equalization built into it, so the expenditures might not change as much as they otherwise would, um, but I think there's a really interesting uh, set of things to study here. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, Leslie. Um, Floor is open for questions. I see John, uh, Natalie, next to you, and then, thank you. So, uh, yeah, su super interesting. Uh, just sort of slightly following up on something Tara said, I I'd be curious about what's happening with, is it prices or is it rents that's moving? So, like, what's happening to the price to rent ratio as well? That might be really informative about <laughs> sort of the finance side of this. If you're holding fixed a certain dividend stream, but prices are going up, that sort of implied something about sort of risk tolerance of Chinese investors versus someone else or something like that. Um, or discount rates or whatever. So there might be some interesting implications of looking at that additional variable, if available. A China shock, housing prices, gentrification. There should be more questions. <laughs> Thank you. So... Um, I was thinking that there's probably not a lot of variation in housing supply, elasticities between these regions, but if you could look at that and see whether, you know, if housing supply is more elastic, do you see smaller responses to this Chinese shock? Thank you. Natalie? Thank you, Andy. So I, wanted, I was trying to think through what's the mechanism for like the, the consumption increase. So it sounds like a very clean story is somebody's living in a house, they sell it to a foreign Chinese buyer, they leave the area. Well, they might have sold it for a good price, so maybe you think they would spend more money, but they've left. So where, where in your mind is the mechanism for the, the, the increase in consumption coming from exactly? Like just like a very simple story would be interesting to Thank you. Hi, yeah, um, I had just sort of a follow-up question. I was trying to think through uh, what else could be driving the consumption increase as you were talking and whether or not your approach and um, your kind of diff and diff approach is controlling for it, but I was thinking that perhaps the, um, the population of uh, ethnic Chinese in some of these areas has increased over this time period, and also maybe the taste for things like the uh, Chinatown um, restaurants and amenities might have also increased um, from not even necessarily ethnic Chinese, but from other kinds of consumers as well. And if that would be, could be something that's actually uh, driving the, um, the consumption response that you're seeing as opposed to the housing channel.
Natalie's coming to you, so thank you. It's very interesting what you're doing uh, with the data. I, I just wonder if there's some additional things you could try, like um, you have the names of the people buying it. Can you Google them or to see, I mean, if they were uh, a little bit more about them, just a, a sample of it, just to learn something about you know, how well you're doing identifying people uh, from, uh, you know, that are actually from China versus people. One additional question. How do you deal with zeros? Since you were focusing on, based on your instrument, I imagine, I just, just a question, how do you deal with zeros? I imagine all zip codes are not getting active, you know, Chinese based purchases every year. All right. Um, Leslie, please come up. Uh, so thanks a lot uh, for the excellent questions and especially Tara for the excellent um, discussion. Um, so uh, yeah, so overall, I think all your points are you know, very well taken and are questions that we've been thinking about as follow-on work to this paper. Uh, in particular, you know, first on the G comment that you made, um, our results here are what we think of as local general equilibrium results, right? And there are spillover effects that could affect you know, the overall macroeconomy. So if we want, really want to think about what is the aggregate general equilibrium effects, uh, I think we need a more uh, no, full-fledged model that takes into account you know, buyers, renters, and, you know, and uh, various substitution channels. And that would allow us to get into you know, both aggregate effects as well as di distributional implications. And I think, absolutely agree that that would be something that would be kind of the next step in this research agenda to really understand the welfare implications and what are the agents that's really hurt more, the you know, agents that's driven out of these neighborhoods, what are their impacts on the you know, neighboring neighborhoods. Um, so. Uh, this is definitely something that we would like to work on further. Um, and similarly, you know, expanding kind of the geographical um, dimension and the housing type dimension of analysis is also something that we want to think about. So there are certainly you no know, specific characteristics that um, you know, applies to California in particular. Uh, so if we expand that dimension, we may be able to see kind of more uh, broader effects across different regions in the US that may or may not be subject to you know, say rent control as much. And of course, understanding the fiscal impacts is something that would be of, certainly of interest to me. Um, so to the question of looking at rental prices, um, so we, we looked into this, but it's very difficult actually to get zip code level rent prices. <laughs> if anyone has any ideas, we would lo love to hear it. Um, and so that's what really stopped us. And um, it would be certainly be interesting to look into that. Uh, and if that is the case, then we can kind of expand our model to tease out kind of the prediction on the rental price side versus house price side and run regressions on that. Um, for house price elasticity, certainly, um, of course, for California, there is a uh, no, more constant housing stock uh, in that region in particular. Uh, but there have been papers, in particular, there's a paper by um, Benjamin Keyes that kind of looks at the housing price elasticity impacts of uh, foreign purchases. Uh, so that is certainly something that's uh, relevant as well. And on the question of where the consumption is coming from, so how we're thinking about it is, so first, um, they're increasing, with the increase in house prices, that's increasing the wealth of the homeowners, of you know, all homeowners in that neighborhood. So greater wealth uh, would prompt greater consumption. So that, that's what we think is one of the predominant um, channel that's where this is coming from, and this is consistent with results from like Mian Sufi literature. Um, and of course, 
the you know, people who are driven out, uh, they may have gotten you know, higher uh, prices, higher values out of the house that they resold, uh, but at the same time, they may have bought another house in the neighboring uh, you know, neighborhood, and at the same time, they can also may still need to commute to the region that's directly impacted by the housing shock. So they may still be spending money in the neighborhood that is you know, directly impacted by the China shock, and that would still increase the purchases of uh, non-tradable goods in that neighborhood. Um, and uh, the question about, yeah, so, question about maybe there was a preference change. Um, that, that's always kind of the, something that's very difficult <laughs> to really study, uh, but we think that um, no, Chinese housing prices, uh, housing shock may have increased, you know, changed kind of the target population of the various restaurants and shops of these neighborhoods. So if the endogenous response to these capital inflows, that may have also influenced why we see a surge in employment in these sectors. So let's see, are there any questions? Uh, how do we deal with zeros? Uh, we, we use log in our, as a mean regressor, so the zeros will not be included in our regressions. And for the name of the buyer question, yes, so we could certainly try to Google more and see if we can tease out any information there. And the one thing we try to do is actually look at whether Chinese buyers are more likely to buy from Chinese sellers, and we do see some evidence of that. So part of like this relationship, uh, familiarity, uh, linkages may be playing a role why you know, they're buying into these neighborhoods are traditionally popular by ethnic Chinese. So thank you very much for the excellent questions and comments. Super, thank you everyone. Uh, we have a 10 minute break, we'll be back at 3.25 for two excellent papers uh, moderated by Abby and we'll have closer remark by Raffo. So please don't leave, be back in 10 minutes though. <laughs>
grabbing coffee. Fantastic. I just want to remind people who are staying for the mentoring conference tomorrow. Breakfast is at 8 a.m. Um, and we'll get started after that with the, the paper presentation. So just a reminder for folks who are here for the mentoring day tomorrow, uh, 8 a.m. Is, is breakfast opening time. So um, we'll look forward to seeing folks back for that. I'm excited to turn it over to Andy Glover. Uh, and then his discussant will be Jonathan Heathcote. We'll follow the same format. Um, and then we'll have our final paper presenter of the day, Didem Tazuman, um, and her discussant, John Grigsby. Uh, and John, also a member of the program committee that put today's event together, too. So excited to hear from all four of our, our final speakers. Go ahead, Andy. OK, thank you. Um, I don't know if that one's on, but I'll try to stay away from it a little bit. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm really happy to be back in Minneapolis, uh, and I uh, really appreciate being put on the program. Uh, this is joint with Dean Corbet. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to talk about employer credit checks and uh, their effect on labor markets uh, in sort of two dimensions, uh, getting rid of poverty traps on one versus affecting the efficiency of allocating labor on the other. Um, and I should say these are our views and uh, not necessarily those of the Federal Reserve. So first, let me kind of define the, the type of policy and the, and the idea that this paper is about. Uh, and that is uh, this activity that we're going to call pre-employment credit screening, or uh, PECS. And so what this really means is essentially somebody applying for a job at a firm, and as part of the background check, instead, in addition to looking for criminal history or calling you know, um, references, uh, buying from Experian or TransUnion a product, which is essentially a credit report that those companies, uh, in, like about starting about 20 years ago, started marketing uh, to uh, employers as a way of trying to uh, screen people. And so, kind of the heyday of this activity uh, was probably right around 2009, 2010. Uh, at that point, there were these surveys by the uh, Society for Human Resource Managers, and they were finding a lot of HR reps uh, using these products, uh, at least for some hiring. And essentially, they were very cheap to add on to a, a background check, and you would just get a credit report from TransUnion uh, that you could use in the hiring process. Uh, around that time, there was a lot of discussion of how many people were being affected uh, negatively by this uh, type of screening. And Demos, which, was a, which is a uh, public policy think tank, did a survey in 2012, and they found one to se in seven uh, low to mid income workers had reported being told that their credit had cost them a job. Um, in the face of that, uh, we started seeing a lot of legislation, both proposed and enacted, both at the state and federal uh, level. And as of today, 11 states actually have passed restrictions on using uh, uh, PECs. And if you read the state legislators' uh, reasoning for this, you often get what we're going to call a, pro a poverty trap concern. And that's what we put in the title of the paper. Uh, this is Michael Barrett from Massachusetts. He said, we want people who have bad credit to get good jobs. Then they'll be able to pay their bills and get the bad credit report removed. The overuse of credit reports takes you down when you're down. Okay, so the idea being you can't get a job until you have good credit, but you can't get good credit until you have a job. And that's what we'll call a, a poverty trap. And so the nice thing about being very slow to, to finish a paper is that uh, those laws were enacted more or less since we started this project. So in another project that's actually published before this one, we went and did kind of the obvious diff and diff exercise. And we were able to essentially classify vacancies by whether they were in an occupation that was affected by the, uh, the restrictions on employer credit screening versus an occupation that was exempt. Essentially, the states exempted things where you know, the employee would have access to social security numbers and things like that with a large scope for uh, you know, embezzlement or any sort of uh, identity theft. And so what we found, my co-authors, uh, Crystal Cortez and Murat Tashi and I uh, found, is that the vacancies in those occupations that were affected by restrictions on PECs saw a significant decline after the, the restrictions were put in place, 
uh, on the order of 6 to 10%, and it was pretty persistent. And so again, I can't quite say this was the motivation for this paper, because this paper was started before, but certainly the idea is to have a quantitative equilibrium framework that uh, can make sense of uh, this type of outcome of the policies when we, when we do those experiments. There we go. So that's our question. What are the aggregate and distributional welfare consequences of those types of policies that restrict, that restrict uh, pre-employment credit screening? So you might say, well, what, wait, didn't you just show me the effect? Uh, so let me tell you what we do with the model and why we use the model to say more than just that graph I just showed you. And so the important thing in our model is that we're going to have both a labor market and a credit market that essentially play off of one another, right? So we're going to have equal, general equilibrium in both uh, the labor market, which is going to have search frictions, and short-term credit markets. And importantly, in order to have a sense in which a credit report is useful on, in either of those markets, we're going to have private information and adverse selection in both labor and credit markets. And that's really why this thing has taken so long to do. Uh, and so what I want you to think we're going to have essentially two types of workers. We're going to have uh, a high uh, type worker and a low type worker. And what I mean by high type, really it's going to uh, determine their, uh, their discounting. They're going to be more patient. And in equilibrium, their choices mean that that will affect their productivity uh, when they're employed. Whereas a low type worker will be imp less patient, uh, lower discount factor, and that will also affect their uh, human capital and productivity when employed. And so to the extent that, that these discount factors, this patience ends up uh, being correlated with, uh, with uh, a residual component of labor productivity, that's going to make employers interested in trying to infer whether you're the patient person or the impatient person. And one way they're going to be able to infer that is through looking at your credit market history because patient people are going to default on credit card debt less frequently than impatient. Okay. I said it before I clicked it, okay? And so because higher productivity workers generate a larger surplus, you'll want to hire people uh, who have good credit. Okay. And so what does a ban on pre-employment uh, credit screening do? Well, it eliminates this labor demand travel, uh, channel that can create a poverty trap. So when firms can look at your credit report then, they can refuse to hire you, which makes it where you can't improve your credit report and you can get stuck in a trap. If we eliminate that using regulation, you don't have that anymore. You just you can't use that information, so people can't get stuck in that way. Okay. However, it's going to lower matching efficiency uh, in the labor market overall because at the end of the day, those uh, that pre-employment credit screening was allowing the segment labor markets and increase the job finding rate for people who are ex post more productive and therefore have higher labor efficiency. Okay, and so again, this model is going to account for these interactions. Uh, I'm really only going to focus on the labor market because the credit market is an enormous lift that even in an hour and a half presentation I've never gotten through. Okay. Okay. So here's the environment. We have, again, two types of people, constant fractions of each. There is going to be switching over time. So just because you're the patient person today, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be the patient person tomorrow. There's going to be a probability of switching, one minus rho. In addition, to keep everything nice and stationary, we're going to have workers die or retire, uh, if you want to be less morbid about it, uh, at rate delta. And they're going to get replaced with a new unemployed, newborn worker, and because we're going to have to keep track of the market's uh, um, probability that they're the, the patient type, when you're a newborn worker, you have no information about you, so everyone just assumes that the probability that you're the, uh, that the good type, S, is the um, population share. Okay, so those are the workers. They're gonna be, get born, do their thing until they die, uh, there's also going to be a large number of potentially uh, of, of identical potential employers. There's going to be free entry in labor markets. And then we're going to have uh, a large number of identical uh, lenders and uh, a credit scorer. Okay. So the timing, 
We're going to have discrete time. Each period will be broken into two subperiods, and we're really going to think about very short-term credit markets. Okay, so we're literally going to think about something where at the beginning of the month you want to consume, you're going to get paid at the end, and so you borrow to consume before you get paid, and then at the end of the month you either pay or you don't. So two subperiods, the start and the end of the month is how I want you to think about this. And so we're going to give workers an incentive to consume early rather than late in the month um, in addition to their intertemporal discount factors. So in, within a period, your utility is going to be the amount of consumption you consume early on plus some discounted value of the consumption you get at the, in, the, in the second half of the month. And then if you're, not, if you're employed, you won't get any leisure. If you're unemployed, you'll get some leisure. Labor then will just be, if you're working, you're working, you make something. If you're unemployed, you don't make anything. Production will occur at the end of the month and then you'll get paid. Production is just whether or not, if, if you're employed, this is a one, and it depends on your, uh, your, your productivity. And if you're unemployed, then you're gonna have to try, go out there and try to match with a new uh, employer. And for that, we're going to have aggregate matching uh, functions that depend on the number of searchers and the number of vacancies for those searchers. Um, pretty standard stuff, really. Uh, Type-specific productivity, again, this is going to actually be a choice. Uh, I'll get to that in just a second. And then lenders, so again, I'm not going to focus on, are essentially risk neutral. They have access to a lot of funds, so they can make these loans um, at some, uh, they, they can borrow from outside of the model at a constant rate, and then they just uh, make the loans to the households. OK. So this is where all the kind of innovation really is. So as I said, there's private information about your your patients, okay? And that means that people with different patients are going to have different outcomes, sequences of uh, defaults, and we're going to assume that that is following them around essentially like a credit report, right? So it's going to create a state variable, which is the probability that the person's a good type. So we're going to assume that there's a record-keeping technology that keeps track of every period, whether you repay or you default. That's going to be summarized by what we're calling a type score. This is not exactly a credit score. It's related implicitly, but it's a type score, which is everyone's probability they place on you being the uh, high type. Okay? And we're just going to use Bayes' rule to update that. There are some you know, sort of simple formulas to, to do it. Uh, and we're going to assume that firms can always observe that before they employ you uh, up until the point where uh, the state bans it. So when I'm the firm and I'm going to hire somebody, I want to look at their credit report in order to know how, how hard should I, should I attempt to, how, how much should I attempt to employ them. But we don't want to have to deal with all these really technical issues of like how do you determine wages under uh, adverse selection. So we're going to do something that we saw Laura uh, Pilosoff and Gregor Jarosz do in a restat a couple of years ago, which we thought was a very elegant way of getting around this problem. We're just going to assume, assume that once you match, they learn your type right away. Okay? So I don't know Jonathan's productivity, but then the day he shows up, I see how well he's doing. I'm like, OK, that's the high productivity person. Okay? That makes it where we can negotiate from there on out with Nash bargaining without any technical issues. So we, liked, we liked that paper because it showed us how to make some progress on ours. OK, so we're going to have bargaining after the fact. There are actually some empirical reasons we think it's a good way of doing it as well. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so that's what we're going to do. I won't go into too many geeky details. Okay. In the credit market, we're going to assume that there's always this adverse selection problem. So lenders never observe the, the uh, borrower's true type. They just see this credit report. Uh, this is like a huge lift. If you read the paper, you'll be like, why isn't that a second paper? What kind of is, but we, we, we haven't done anything with it. So I'm not going to go into it. It's a huge lift. But essentially, there's private information and equilibrium determination of credit market contracts as well. OK. So if you're an unemployed worker, you start with this score S. You, uh, 
you don't work, you get your utility from leisure, and then you survive with probability one minus delta. You search in a, uh, in a labor market that is indexed by your score. If you find a job, that happens with probability f of theta. You enter the next period. Uh, we don't update your score because there's nothing, you haven't done anything in this period. And then you have some type transition. And then here's where I was saying the, wh why the discount factor is correlated with uh, productivity. At the end of each period, people are going to choose whether or not essentially to keep up their skills. So they're going to choose their next period's productivity H prime. Either it's going to be a low value or a high value. If they choose the high value, they're going to pay a cost. So oh, this should have been a minus, not an equals. So essentially, if you just keep it at the low level, you don't incur any costs. You're not studying. You're not thinking hard about things. But if you make that investment, you have a cost uh, from doing it. And so that's why patient people are going to end up being more productive, because wages from being productive are coming in the future, costs are coming in the present, therefore they're more willing to make those investments. And that's my 10 minute warning. Okay, for an employed worker, it's very similar. The, again, the only thing now is that we have to determine the wage they're going to get, uh, and they have to make a borrowing decision. Again, the credit market's uh, endogenous, but for, for, our, for, for, what, for, this, uh, for our purposes today, is essentially you, you're facing a menu of possible uh, loan amounts and repayment promises, and you choose the one that you think is the best for you, okay? You then get your wage at the end of the period. You draw a medical or some unobservable expenditure shock, and that determines whether or not you uh, decide to default. If you default, you don't have to pay. You don't have to pay the expenditure shock. You don't have to pay your debt. But you're going to have some future costs. And again, this is why more patient people are going to be less likely to default. They care about those future costs more than impatient people. You consume then. If you, again, if you default it, you, just get, you don't have to pay anything back. If you don't default, you have to pay everything back. And then you go on to the next period. You make your investment decision. Again, I have the typo. And uh, then you go into the next period with an updated score, which again is Bayes' rule based on whether or not you repay your debts or not. Okay. So uh, firms then are relatively boring. They just have to post vacancies in these submarkets based on the credit reports of the people who are searching in them. They have some cost of posting them, and they have some probability of filling it, again, using this, uh, this frictional matching technology. And since everything's full information post-match, Bargaining is really easy. They pay workers uh, based on the, the bargain. OK. It's actually kind of nice. I don't have the mouse to click, so I would usually uh, ask if anybody wants to see any equations. You don't even get that option. So OK. We, we, we then we calibrate this model. Um, we, we use some you know, convenient functional forms. Uh, the main thing I want to point out uh, is we sort of want to both have a reasonable uh, depiction of credit market uh, differences across credit ratings, right? Because at the end of the day, I can't observe the model's uh, type score, but I can observe a credit rating. I can then order people by their default probability in, in my model and match that to the data. And so we want to make sure we have a, a realistic gradient, a realistic gradient of of, um, of uh, interest rates, monthly interest rates on credit card debts uh, by credit rating. Uh, we want to make sure we have kind of the right amount of debt floating around uh, relative to income, right amount of delinquencies. And then this, this model, you shouldn't think of, right, this isn't a model of us. Uh, I know that kind of can, can feel a little bit sad. I'm not in this model. But this is kind of a model for people who are you know, below median income for the most part. So we target the uh, residual earnings 50-10 ratio uh, in terms of our income processes. OK, okay so what, what does this look like then? So we exactly sort people to get the right shares of each of the credit ratings. So we have a subprime, a prime, and a superprime credit rating. And we define them to make sure that we have the right shares of the population in each. And we find then that there is a, re a declining interest rate uh, as you go across. So the better your credit rating, the lower your interest rate. 
what is, that has a direct empirical counterpart, and we're actually using it to define our groupings. What doesn't have an empirical counterpart, but the model uh, we can calculate, and I think is kind of interesting, is the share of each type, high versus low, in each of these ratings. So in the stationary equilibrium, the credit markets end up separated quite a bit. We only have a tiny share of the high types with subprime credit, like maybe 5%. Most of the high types are up here with a superprime credit rating. The interest rates then depend not only on your credit rating, but also your type. And those are actually, uh, again, aren't directly observable in the data, but they're, they're, they have a model counterpart. OK. So what happens then? Those are kind of unconditional. What happens to, to a person in the model if they're chugging along and everything's going OK, and then they have to default, right? So even the patient people sometimes will get such a bad expense shock, right? Like every, every single appliance in their house breaks on the same day, and they end up having to default, OK? What happens? Well, this is the score updating function. This is Bayes' rule saying, I think your, your score is the x-axis. Whether you repay or default tells me your score on the y-axis. So if you're repaying, this might look like the 45 degree line, but it's actually a curve line above it. You sort of slowly chug your way up the credit ranking. But then when you default, you fall down dramatically. And we actually don't have scores above a certain region because of these type switching. So that's why these things don't go all the way. Okay, so defaulting really, really reduces credit score. Uh, repaying takes a very long time to build it up. So there's kind of a natural asymmetry uh, uh, to that. Okay. We then also have uh, want, want to make sure we're doing a good job not only on these unconditional differences in earnings, but also on the covariance between earnings and credit rating. This has been a really, really tricky thing to even go out and try to measure. Um, and so I will just broadly, you can think of this, of there being a correlation between credit score and earnings through two mechanisms. One can be that people with high lifetime earnings, like average lifetime earnings, also have good credit on average over their lives. We call that the across uh, co correlation. It can also be that any given person, when their credit improves, they get an improvement in their earnings. That's the within correlation. What we show in this model, and we show is consistent with a whole host of uh, empirical literature, uh, including Kyle's not here, but Herkenoff, Phillips, Cohen, Cole, and Dobby et al., is that in the model and in the data, our best approximation is that most of the correlation between credit, credit score and earnings is coming from that across component. People who are just consistently high earnings have consistently good credit. It's not that if any one of us was to suddenly default, we'd see our earnings plummet. Okay, so the model uh, is consistent with, with that and uh, what, we, what, we, what we infer from the data there. Okay, that said, if you were to lose your job, it does affect your job finding rate to some degree. So this is showing uh, in our model relative, uh, the blue line, relative to full information for each of the types, if I can exactly tell which, uh, if you were patient or inpatient, how does the credit score or the score affect the probability of finding a job? Okay, so essentially we're finding that uh, the lowest type, if I was absolutely certain you were uh, the inpatient type with a low match surplus, you would have about a 37% probability of finding a job each month. If, you, if I was absolutely certain you were the high type, it would be about 52. And there's sort of an increasing probability uh, as you uh, improve your credit rating and w when those things are observable. Okay. okay. So then overall, most of the cor correlation between earnings and credit reports we think is across. That's not to say there's nothing going on within for what happens to a person when they uh, default. And actually, that component really speaks to this large literature on quantitative models of consumer credit and default, which often have a, as an assumption that when you default, you lose some earnings in the future. So 
uh, Dean's um, Econometrica from 07 with um, Chatty and uh, Nakajima and Victor, they assume that you lose about 1.9% of earnings going forward when you default. Why? They, that was just something they had as a parameter to match the data. Our model actually accounts for about half of that. Okay, so about half of this uh, earnings loss from default that has been very central to a lot of these and a lot of this literature could be from uh, this sort of uh, signaling effect from default. Okay, and then how big is this poverty trap? Uh, I like to think about putting this in context by thinking about it in terms of um, uh, unemployment duration for people with really bad credit. Um, so. This is showing the average unemployment duration in weeks for somebody who, one minute, okay. Uh, somebody who has, uh, who, who's a, the high type should have a very short duration. Essentially, if they have a very bad credit, it's about uh, 19 days uh, longer than kind of it, it should be. Okay, so then we get rid of the ability for firms to, to look at credit reports. And let me get to the, to the graphs to show that the poverty trap is eliminated. So if you can't check, I can't condition on it when I think about how many vacancies to post for you. So everyone's unemployment duration goes to the same green line here no matter what their score is. So poverty traps eliminated. But in terms of welfare, it turns out that if you're the high type, you're just not unemployed that frequently and you're almost certainly going to be super prime. So the reduction in your average job finding rate actually hurts you in terms of welfare. The low type gains, uh, ex ante, it turns out to be a bad policy. What we wanna emphasize is that it's something that hurts some people a little bit, but it helps some people an enormous amount. Okay, then I'll conclude. Yeah, can I conclude? Okay, <laughs> sorry, I, I, I wasn't sure if it was clicking. Okay, so um, we think again, this type of policy of, of getting rid of credit re, uh, pre-employment credit screening is one of these things where probably on aggregate, we shouldn't think of it's doing too much, but it really, really helps a small group of people, essentially people who are very likely to have bad credit um, at the expense of everyone else, but again, not too much. The one thing that we, I didn't get to talk about that's in the paper uh, is how it affects the credit market, so please go to my website and read the paper to see that part. Thanks. Hi. All right. Oh, um, so thanks. Thanks very much for inviting me to to discuss the paper, which which I which I which I definitely enjoyed reading. I uh, have a few comments that are sort of mostly fairly general in nature. So, so the, um, you know, I guess Russian novel is going to be my theme. So crime and punishment. So why do we have credit in the first place? Well, there's uh, credit exists because default is punished. If you don't punish default, then everyone who's got a debt is going gonna, is gonna to default on that debt. Anticipating that, nobody's going to extend credit. So we sort of need some punishment for default. So the question is how harsh should, should that punishment be? The harsher the punishment, the less people are going to default, the more credit is going to be available in, in equilibrium. So it sounds like harsh defaults might be a good idea. But maybe sometimes default's not a bad thing. It introduces some state contingency in contracts. The kind of deal is, well, I'll, I'll lend you money. As long as nothing too disastrous happens to you, I'm going to expect you to pay me back. If something really bad does happen, I'll kind of understand and expect that in those circumstances, I'm, I'm not going to get the loan back. Maybe that's not such a bad thing. So the question that um, Dean and, and Andy are asking in this paper is whether punishment should extend beyond the credit market into other markets. So if you default in the credit market, should you be punished also in the labor market? Um, if firms can check your credit score and they see that you've got a bad score, maybe they're not going to be so interested in hiring you. Uh, and I guess in the sense of having a harsher punishment for default, that might not be such a bad thing. I mean, it makes, it makes default even less appealing because you anticipate this kind of double punishment. You can't get credit and you can't get a job either. Maybe you don't default. Maybe that ex ante allows you to access more credit. But, you know, you have to think, well, maybe 
should you be punished in the home rental market? If you, if you want to rent a house, should the landlord check your credit? If you're in the dating market, should your credit report be kind of on your Tinder profile and swipe right, left or right based on that? There's a, there is, um, there's a very nice novel, second uh, Russian novel theme by Gary Steingart, uh, The Super Sad True Love Story. If, if you haven't read that, that's a, that's a really good novel. It kind of imagines a future where you can scan people around the room and you can see everybody's credit reports in real time. And you know, it's kind of a key marker of social status. Is that the sort of society we want to be in? There's some question about you know, privacy, right, right to privacy. And, and, and so it's sort of like you want to think about you know, wh wh where do you want to draw the line? OK, so let me, let me recap. Andy explained it super clearly, but just recap a little bit how the model in, in that paper works. So you have these firms, and they're really interested in knowing your credit score. Why do they care? Well, because they can't perfectly observe the productivity of workers, and an individual's credit score is going to give them a clue about uh, how productive the worker really is. What's the story for that? The story that they put forward, which I think makes a lot of sense, is that people differ in terms of patience. Actually, it's kind of the same trick that Kartik used in his, in his model this morning. So the people who are more patient, they are more likely to pay costs of building up their skills in exchange for higher future earnings. So they're more likely to be high productive workers because of that. People who are more patient also worry more about the cost of having a bad credit rating in the future. So there's more patient people are also less likely to default. So you get this natural correlation between default risk and worker productivity. OK, so these firms, they kind of understand that. They anticipate high credit score workers probably more productive. They're more attractive as potential hires. So if you can see credit scores, the firms are going to put more effort into hiring high credit score workers. It's going to make it easier for high score unemployed workers to find jobs. And that's going to you know, strengthen this incentive to protect your credit score. Because you kind of know a good credit score, it helps you get credit. It's also going to make it easier next time you're looking for, for for a job. So that's kind of a plus. You're going to get more credit in equilibrium. So what's wrong with firms looking at their credit score? Well, the story that Andy told is, you know, everybody's hit by some idiosyncratic shocks, spending shocks, your health expenditure shocks, your house gets flooded. And if you, if you hit by one of those shocks, you default. Makes sense. You want to default. It's, a, it's kind of a smart decision. If you subsequently become unemployed, then you're kind of stuck, because really, maybe you're a good guy. You were just unlucky that you got these bad shocks that made you default. Now you're having a hard time getting a job because you've got a bad credit score. And because you can't get a job, you can't really rebuild your credit score either. So you're kind of in a, in a, in a hole. So is there a case for banning credit scores? I'm going to say I'm going to say no. I'm going to say, actually, probably it's not the policy you want to think about. Um, the first reason you might think about is an efficiency argument. You might say, well, maybe there are really good types out there, but they can't prove that they're good types because they don't get a chance to, 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 to start borrowing. They don't get a chance to, to find a job. Maybe if I ban these credit checks, um, I'm going to better reveal information. The paper suggests that that argument doesn't work. So they show that these credit scores are actually more informative about type when employers can use them to screen, and they become less informative about type when the employers uh, are not allowed to use them. And why is that? Well, if the employers can't use those credit reports to screen, good types understand that. The good types become more willing to default. So when you see a default, if all types, good and bad, are defaulting, a default doesn't tell you that much about an individual's type. So it becomes harder to figure out, based on an individual's credit history, whether you're dealing with a really a good type or, or, or a bad type. So this efficiency argument in their model uh, that doesn't work. What about the distributional argument? So suppose the planner just really cares about the low type. The planner is looking out for them. Banning credit scores in, 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 in hiring, that's going to make it easier for these low types to find jobs, because they're going to get pooled together with the high types, and they're going to find jobs at, at, at a higher rate. And they're going to get pooled together in credit markets a little bit more, too, because, you know, because, because this, this credit score becomes less informative about type. So they're going to get treated more similarly to the, uh, to, to the good type in credit markets and get a little bit cheaper credit. So yeah, if you want to help those types, maybe this is an attractive policy. Is there a better policy? I think that's an important question. 
these distributional gains for the low type, they come with big efficiency costs. The first one is you're not punishing default as much, you're gonna get less credit overall. So you shrink the total availability of credit in the economy. The second is there were these high productivity workers out there who were looking for jobs. Now, if the firms can see your credit score, they can really go after those guys and get those high productivity people employed and working fast, producing a lot of output. If they're pulled together with the low types, those high productive guys sit idle for a long time. That's, that's an, an efficiency cost for the whole economy. So if you wanna help the low type, I think probably a better policy would be you know, straightforward redistribution, redistributive taxation, unemployment insurance, something else. Not, not kind of trying to mess with the, the workings of the labor market. Another concern, I think an important one that comes up often in this discussion is, well, if employers can't screen based on looking at credit scores, maybe they're gonna try and turn to something else. They, they, they wanna guess at your, your productivity. A credit score might be a good guess, it might tell you something. If you're not allowed to look at that, well, you look at something else that might be correlated with productivity. You look at height or gender or, or, or race, and you might feel like, well, maybe at least a credit score is something about you as an individual. That reflects your own individual default choices. Your height or your race, those are things you didn't really have any choice over. Maybe you shouldn't be uh, you know, punished or rewarded for having a particular uh, height or a particular race. So I think that's, uh, that's that. Um, I guess I'm, I'm running, I mean, the, the model, the credit market piece is super sophisticated, realistic. Some other details of the model, I think, are necessarily a little bit stylized. You could think that if firms can't look at credit reports, they can still think of other ways to differentiate different types. So suppose you really want to hire the patient, high productivity workers. Well, you could offer a wage contract where you promise you know, rapid wage growth. So look, wages start low, not so attractive if you're impatient, but they grow fast. That, that would be one way to, to, to try and recruit the, the, the patient type. Another way to do it would be to say, well, you know, we'll post some high wage jobs, but not too many vacancies. So those will be really hard jobs to find. If you're impatient, you want a job right away, you're not gonna go to that market. But if you're patient and you really care about this long-term high-wage job, you, you might hang out a long time and, and look for those. Um, the model doesn't really have savings between periods to, to reduce the, the, the number of state variables, I guess, but it's a month, a period of months, so you can't really save to protect yourself against unemployment. And also the credit is short-term, so you can't really use credit to protect yourself against an unemployment spell either. There is some evidence by and a different paper by, uh, by Kyle and, and his co-authors showing that you know, unemployed people, they do kind of have some access to credit through, through long-term credit lines. So I'm out of time. Uh, it was an excellent paper. I, I really, uh, really liked it. I'm not just saying that because Andy's my co-author. Still, still an excellent paper. <laughs> and I think that, uh, I think that, you know, I think really the empirical evidence that they have and they looked at in another paper, that's super interesting, but we, we totally need theory and we need models to think through the interactions between these different credit markets and to think about how policies you know, spill over from one market to another and policies designed to Im impact one group end up affecting uh, basically everybody in the economy. Thank you. Okay, so we'll collect questions for Andy and, and he'll be up to respond and answer them. So um, Ryan in the back and then Amanda. Thanks, Hi, this is really interesting. I'm, I'm, so the Nash bargaining parameter here seems kind of important uh, because as I understand it, it's determining the employer demand for information. Um, and so I'm kind of curious how that gets set um, empirically. But then relatedly, if you added firm types and then had complementarity between the worker and firm types, that would further intensify the demand for information by employers, right? I'm just trying to think about that general issue of what determines that, thanks. My question's closely related. Uh, this is a model with asymmetric information, and so there's information rents between a uh, firm and worker match. Uh, so quantitatively, it's important to know how large those rents are and how they're divided. So your choice of Nash bargaining has an implicit division of those rents. But also, there's no other way in your model for a worker to show her type to outside employers. Um, in this literature of employer learning, it's usually pretty quick, actually, that outside employers get that information. And so 
Yeah, wondering how you're justifying the quantitative importance of the two margins you're studying and the size and the distribution of the rents. Okay, so I saw Aaron, and then I saw Ilana, and then Bill. Yeah, I was um, curious about the underlying mechanism here is impatience or patience is causing both less default and higher productivity. And I think I could think of another story as, say, family wealth um, that would create less default and um, potentially a higher productivity because of investment in human capital or ability to buy a house that is close to work or, or, or what have you. And um, yeah, I was wondering, trying to think through if this other mechanism would have different consequences for optimal policy. Okay. Elena is passing the baton to you, Bill. And then we will go back. Well, this is one of those models that makes me super uncomfortable because it starts with something that isn't, it, it, it's an assumption. Let's start the model with the assumption this is what the employer wants to do. These things came up greatly during the Great Recession when firms were confronted with lots and lots of applications. They came up with screening devices which had clear racial disparate impact. Credit scores, criminal background, length of unemployment. It's nice to think that they're all well-meaning and these just almost so happen to eliminate black applications, but I'm suspicious of when they came and what they did. So first, it's a credit score. It's not a default. I only see your credit score. This means I can rank people by credit score. Def it, it's, it's not, please, I only want people who have a 500 score or above. And so you, you'd need further evidence that this is only trying to pick out defaulters. So that it isn't, I'm asking for your credit score, but I know that you weren't ranking people on credit score because the difference between 700 and 600 isn't that I defaulted. So there's that. But the fact that these were attacked and the EEOC issued guidelines was because they had clear, obvious, measurable disparate impact. And if that's what the firms were doing, then that's a different story. And you don't come up with, oh, I might have hurt people paying back loans. Most people don't know what deems their credit score because their credit scores are a black box to them and to most of us. Women always had lower credit scores initially because you were deemed if you had store credit cards instead of bank credit cards. People who have no banking history, people who are young, have no credit scores. They're also going to get deemed if I go to an employer and they want my credit score. So there are a lot of reasons other than the very generous idea that, that they were doing something legitimate and this is related to something legitimate and here's the legitimate argument. I, I think we should be more than careful about that when we know what the rulings of the EEOC were. I think my question may be redundant now, but now that Bill and Aaron spoke, but Andy, suppose you had, let's say, a dimensional heterogeneity, even just in the structure of the expenditure shocks. You have two types of processes for the shocks for whatever reason. And I think it goes, the, G, the, the implications are gonna matter and I think it would be nice just to have at least a completed channel, like some sort of residual for another type of heterogeneity. Could also just be more uncertainty parameter or something. The second question I'm thinking through it could be, is technically, in your directed search mode, you're putting vacancies by score. In the real world, it looked more like it was one vacancy, everybody could apply it after I checked the score. And I'm struggling with the mapping. I don't know if the cost of putting vacancies matter. I don't know if you should be thinking about oh, the matching probabilities, the matching function differently. But there was a little bit of a gap there in the way you conceptualize the, the problem for me. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of start from the. Oops, sorry. I'm gonna kind of start from the back and go to the front here. So, uh, so Lennon, um, 
in, in some sense, it could. The, the, the exact choices we've made in terms of like this discount factor that's different across the two groups, uh, and then that has this investment. We've done it with like a permanent investment up front, same kind of results. We've done it with um, um, essentially uh, moral hazards, so like an, like an effort choice that could be correlated with getting a bad shock. Kind of broadly, it, it, it always kind of gives the same types of results. Um, so th we've just sort of been trying to uh, come up with something where at the end of the day, size of the match surplus um, is correlated with the credit report. And then once we have that with the Nash bargaining, which I understand people don't always like Nash bargaining, we get these kind of results. So the, the exact details, we've tried a lot of things and, and we get so much stuff. Uh, to build, one thing I, I, I should have emphasized when I talked about these, um, the products that the credit agencies sell, they do not have credit scores. They understand that the credit score is meant to, to really be useful for lenders. They are just reports. So they exactly show, essentially, if you have a lot of debt outstanding with a lot of it late, but they don't try to map that into a credit score. Um, I don't know if that was a regu regulation that kept them from doing it. The way they say it is they don't think it would be useful anyway. So it's not just ranking people by score because they don't have them. We have a score in the model out of convenience, but. Uh, that's not what is in the data. And then in terms of this heterogeneity by race, so in the in the restat, the empirical paper uh, that I showed that diff and diff, we did look for some heterogeneity on um, sort of uh, county level demographics to the, to the decline in vacancies, and we didn't find much. Um, what we did find in a much earlier draft that was a Minneapolis Fed working paper where we had access to some other data, we did find something interesting that uh, on credit reports, after these bans went into effect, black borrowers didn't change their, their rate of delinquencies, but they did see a reduction in the amount of uh, loans available to them. So it might have been affecting um, credit markets more than labor markets. We, we did look for, for some of that. Um, and then, yeah, Amanda, what if outside employers get the information? There are a lot of ways you can make it in this model where there's no reason to look at the credit report. Um, one of them would be if you had competitive search with enough heterogeneity in the contract, so like a, a payment that rises with time and things like that would work. We kind of, those would be non-starters uh, in order to get anything like that, um, that, that um, event study that, that I showed you. Um, oh, uh, the Nash bargaining parameter I, I haven't thought too much about. We did this thing where we assigned the Nash bargaining parameter to the matching function elasticity to kind of give everything its best chance of being efficient to begin with. Um, and in full information, it is. So that's kind of what we did there, but we, we, we can definitely move it around. I, I, I think actually that's, that, that's easy enough. Okay, I think that was everything. Thanks. Thank you very much for having our paper in the program. I'm Didam Tuzaman from the Kansas City Fed, and this is joint work with Murat Tashchir from Cleveland Fed and Mariana Guldiak from the San Francisco Fed. Is it too much? All right, decades of research, and yet the questions relevant for the minimum wage remains very interesting for policymakers and also researchers. There's an existing literature which is very vast, and majority of the papers in this literature has focused on the question of whether there's a negative employment effect when there's an increase in minimum wages. And there are many papers, right? Some of them find large negative effects on employment, some find small to zero effects on employment, 
And even now we have newer papers that assume different market structures and even find positive employment effects. So really the debate is very intense and very unsettled. So what we do in this paper is we take a step back. So we're gonna think about another margin where the firms are able to make adjustments when there's an increase in the minimum wage. And that's gonna be through hiring. So I said we're gonna take a step back because employment will be impacted by both hirings but also separations. So I'm gonna come back to that at the very end of the presentation. So what we're gonna do in this paper is we're gonna look at the changes in firms' vacancy postings as they're adjusting their hiring in response to the minimum wage increases. So a higher minimum wage means that the cost of labor is higher for the firm so the theory would predict that we will see a decline in vacancies. But this will be for the vacancies where the jobs are paying wages that are at or close to the minimum wage. So the question that we're gonna ask in this paper is that what is the relative effect of minimum wage increases on vacancies for these at-risk occupations compared to others? All right, so different from the literature, as I said, we're gonna focus on vacancies as opposed to employment. And again, somewhat differently, we're trying to capture a causal and a relative effect. Okay? I'm seeing kind of different because in the literature, the studies have mainly focused on a narrow group, so it can be a narrow uh, demographic group, such as teens, uh, or it can be a narrow group of specific sectors. So the idea here is that we're trying to capture the relative effects, so we're not gonna restrict our sample to a specific group. So let me give you a quick summary of the paper. We're gonna use county level vacancy data, we're gonna see the occupations, and we're gonna estimate the relative elasticity of vacancies for these at-risk occupations with respect to the minimum wage changes. Our ident identification will rely on several things. One is I'm gonna uh, show you there is great variation at the state level on minimum wages. There's great variation in minimum wage increases and there's great variation in the occupational exposure. So we're gonna look at policy change at the state level, which is the minimum wage change, but we're gonna look at the outcomes at the county level. We're gonna look at vacancies at the county level. And the reason is we're thinking this is gonna give us a more exogenous effect, right? If everything is at the state level, we can have the, uh, the danger of having reverse causality, but whatever is happening to vacancies at the county level, uh, the policy change will be exogenous. Okay, and then as I said, not all occupations are the same. There are some occupations where there are more workers earning at or close to the minimum wage, and these will be the occupations that are more likely to be impacted by a policy change. Okay, and then the preview of the results. We do find that there is a negative and significant effect um, coming from minimum wage increases on these at-risk occupations. In the time period that we consider, uh, 2005 through 2018, we find that on average a 10% increase in the binding minimum wage reduces vacancies for these at-risk occupations by 2.4%. And then we also find that actually the effect starts a little bit earlier than the implementation of the policy. Uh, so this is the announcement effect that some papers have talked about in the past so we find that the negative effect actually emerges three quarters prior to the policy change. All right, so let's start with the data. We first need information on the state level effective minimum wages as well as the minimum wage increases. So we're gonna use data put together by Vagul and Zipperer. Uh, we just do an aggregation to the quarter level, that's our uh, time period uh, that we're gonna consider. What we mean by the effective minimum wage is gonna be the maximum of the, either the federal minimum wage or the state level minimum wage if there is any. Now, coming to the minimum wage increases, uh, in the time period that we consider there are three uh, federal level increases. So in 2005, when our sample begins, the federal minimum wage was at 
$6.15 per hour. Uh, in 2007, it was announced that there's going to be increases, and it's going to be an increase in 2007, 2008, and 2009. So the federal minimum wage rose gradually from 515 in 2005 to 585 in 2007, 655 in 2008, and 725 per hour by 2009. And that's the last federal change that we have. However, of course, there are many state-level changes in the minimum wage, and we have a total of 291 minimum wage changes that we can observe in the sample period, and these range from 0.5% to over 34%. Now, I want to make three points about the minimum wages and minimum wage increases. The first one is that over time, many states uh, gain their minimum wage, which is higher than the federal level. Okay, so when our Sample starts in 2005, there were only 14 states with a binding state level minimum wage. As the federal minimum wage increases, of course, the number drops. But after 2009, the last federal minimum wage change date, we have a lot of states increasing their uh, minimum wages above the federal level. And by 2015, that number rose to, uh, rises to 30. The second point is, as more states increase the minimum wage, the dispersion between the minimum wages across states have increased. So here we're looking at the minimum wages. The red line corresponds to the federal minimum wage. And then the blue line corresponds to the maximum binding minimum wage at the state level. So as you can see through time, the difference between the red and blue line has increased, and the dispersion has increased across states. And then the final point is there is, again, variation across the amount of increases in the minimum wage uh, across states, so ranging from very close to zero to over 35%. Uh, here I'm showing you the distribution, and we have a mean of 7.9%. And here the important thing that we're going to be using is a lot of the minimum wage changes at the state level have been below 10%. Now, the second important data we need is the vacancy data. We're going to use the county-level uh, vacancy data from the Conference Board's Help Wanted Online data series. Uh, we're going to be able to see occupations in these vacancies. We're going to be able to see the stock of vacancies as well as the flow of vacancies where these are going to be new job postings that are less than 30 days old. And we're going to be uh, covering over uh, 3,000 counties. Okay, now the definition of at risk. Okay, so which occupations are more likely to be impacted by minimum wage increases? So for this, we're going to look at wage distribution at occupations. We're going to go to current population survey. Uh, we're going to have the outgoing rotation groups and get the wage information. Um, so we focus on working age individuals. Uh, 16 and above, no self-employed or working without pay. We're going to use hourly wages when available, but if not, then we can use the, um, the weekly information to compute the hourly wage. Now we're going to look at the distribution of wages across occupations. And we're going to look at, remember the 10% I just talked about? So we're going to look at the share of workers in these occupations who are getting paid at or below the 110% of the prevailing minimum wage. Okay? And when you do that, you know, there are occupations with many such workers, and there are occupations with very few such workers. So 5% seems to be a good cutoff. So we're going to define the occupations as at risk if at least 5% of the employment share of this occupation earns an hourly wage at or below the 110% of the effective minimum wage. Now, important thing, the designation of the occupation at risk does not change over time, and it's not going to change over states, so it's not locality specific. And this is the summary of the at-risk occupations. So we are looking at two digits uh, occupations, and we identify these six um, six occupations as in the at-risk group. So it's food preparation and servicing occupations, building, grant planning, personal care, and serving-related occupations, 
transportation and material moving, office and admin, and sales and related. Okay. Now let me move to the empirical analysis. We're going to run the, the following panel regression uh, in order to identify the relative elasticity of vacancies for the at-risk uh, occupations to minimum wage increases, and we're going to run this at the local labor market levels. Okay, so on the left-hand side, we have log vacancies in each county I, occupation O, and time period T. This is going to be quarterly. And then on the right-hand side, we have log of minimum wage in county I, time period T. And now we interact that with an indicator which shows whether the occupation is in our at-risk group or not. And the coefficient of interest is beta, which will show us the relative effect of the minimum wage increases on these occupations. Um, we're going to use fixed effects. So we will look at county by occupation fixed effects, occupation by time fixed effects, and county by time fixed effects. All right. So here are our baseline estimates. We run this regression separately for total vacancies as well as new vacancies or the flow of vacancies. And what we find is, on average, when there's a 10% increase in the minimum wage, uh, the total vacancies in at-risk groups decline by 2.4% compared to others. And then for the new vacancies, the coefficient is similar. Uh, we, it's now at 2.2%. And these two series are uh, very correlated, of course. Now, why do we use these fixed effects? We actually see that they're very important to include in our regression. So the, uh, the first column shows the baseline result that I just showed you for total vacancies. Uh, in the rest of the columns, we're going to remove one fixed effect at, at that time. Okay? So when we remove the occupation by time fixed effect, we can see that the coefficient becomes very big and positive and very significant. Why is that? Because it's very important to control for what's happening to occupations over time. So this is just showing that there are some occupations in the at-risk group which are growing over time, but if we're not controlling for this effect, we're going to find a positive result that we will think can be related to minimum wage increases. When we control for the trends in occupations, we can actually correct for that and get to the relative effect of minimum wage increases. Similar for the uh, removal of county by occupation and county by time fixed effect uh, will definitely affect the results. So it's really important to control for these trends at the both occupation and county level. Now the second thing that we're interested in understanding is if there is a forward-looking behavior by firms. Okay? I say this because there is a lag between the announcements of the policy change and implementation. So LIANG 2021 um, shows that mean announcements of a minimum wage hike is around 3.2 quarters before the implementation. So to account for this, we're going to have our baseline specification, but now add uh, dynamic leagues and lags. We're going to consider up to six quarters prior to and four quarters after the minimum wage change. And then we're going to report the cumulative effects up to the time period that we consider. Again, here's what we find. So period T is when the policy change happens, right? So we find that negative effect starts three quarters prior to the policy change. But then before that, we do not find any effects. So given that it coincides nicely with the uh, Leung's results, we think that this three quarter effect is the announcement effect. But before that, uh, there is really um, no effect. And then we find similar results for the new vacancies. And I'm mentioning the time period before the three quarters that we're considering because you know, this is an essentially definitive specification, so you want to make sure there was some parallel pretrend, right? And we're thinking that besides the announcement effect, actually there was some parallel pretrend. Now, in our specification, there are many minimum wage changes and at different time periods, right? Uh, so it's a little hard to think about the parallel pretrends. To just simplify it a little bit, we can look at a subsample of states. So there are 13 states that never had a 
state level minimum wage that was higher than the federal level. So these 13 states then were subject to this federal change that started in 2007, uh, continued for two years, but it was announced prior, right? So here we are looking at the at risk occupations and not at risk occupations in these 13 states. And these are indexed, their levels are indexed to the 2006 average. So what we see here is that between 2005 and 2007, you know, there seems to be, these series seem to move together. But after the announcement, there is the divergence, divergence between the, uh, the levels start and continues after uh, the policy change. So we're thinking that this is a suggestive evidence that there's some parallel pre-trends, but we need to be careful with the announcement of All right, now let me move to some robustness checks. Um, there are many in the paper. Uh, I want to just point to a few important ones. Um, so, Dubel, Esther, and Rai 2010 do a very nice uh, design where they look at the neighboring counties along the state borders. Okay? So, the idea is that these counties will be similar to each other, but they're going to be subject to different policies, right? Because they're in different states. So, we actually repeated this contiguous county design, and we find results that are very similar to our baseline. So if there was an issue about you know, comparing it to the average county, um, and thinking that this is gonna be correct and for that, we still find similar results. Then the another thing was, is there one particular occupation that is driving our results, right? So what we did is we removed one occupation at a time from the at-risk group and repeated our analysis. We do not find that it was driven by just one occupation. And this exercise is you know, similar to changing this 5% threshold that I just told you about. And then of course, we're looking, using the logs, so there's, you know, Problem with the zeros, we use several ways to transform, and again, the baseline results um, remain low. Okay. So the bottom line is, uh, we looked at the vacancies, and we find that there is um, relative decline in vacancies at these uh, at-risk occupations relative to others. Now, how can we you know, think about these results with employment effects? Does this necessarily mean that there's going to be a disemployment effect? Well, it can be, right? If there's a relative decline in vacancies for these at-risk occupations, then this may indicate a decline in employment in at-risk occupations as well, as well, right? But remember that I told you employment will de be determined by both hirings and separations. And there are some studies in the literature that argue when there's an increase in the minimum wage, actually worker turnover declines. And that might mean that without you know, losing employment, there can be need for less vacancies. So then that alternative explanation would be consistent with you know, small to no effects uh, in, in the employment effects of minimum wages. So I'm going to leave it there so we don't have a strong punchline about the employment effects. Uh, vacancies is a way to think about the different margin that the firms will be using when subject to the minimum wage. I guess the next step will be to, um, to think more carefully about separations and connect the dots from the vacancies to the employment. Um, so I was, uh, I'm John Grigsby, I'm uh, at Princeton right now, but I've actually visited the Institute last year virtually. Um, so it's very nice to sort of see your all's faces in this room rather than, you know, in a spaceship or, you know, wherever else your Zoom background was. So, um, so thanks a lot for inviting me to discuss this very interesting paper. Uh, this is strange. Um, I'm going to pick up my discussion kind of exactly where, uh, very similarly to where um, DDM left off. How do you go back? Is that the way? Okay, there we go. So yeah, so this paper is really trying to understand, uh, it's kind of an old question, where, about what are the labor market impacts about uh, of minimum wage increases. So there's a very large literature, as DDM discussed, that's trying to look at the employment effects of minimum wage increases. And generally speaking, that literature has found 
there's not that much of an effect on employment and minimum wages. So that's kind of, you know, perhaps surprising in classical economic theory. So what this paper is trying to say is, well, maybe if we think of it more carefully, minimum wages shouldn't just affect employment, maybe it more directly affects labor demand. So let's try to get a better measure of labor demand and see how, uh, see how minimum wages affect that. And so they're going to go and look at vacancies as sort of this more direct measure. And they're going to run this sort of triple different specification, which is, which is quite nice. They can include uh, occupation by county fixed effects, occupation by time fixed effects, county by time fixed effects, and really just look at the differential impact of minimum wage increases within a county within a period of time on uh, occupations which they call at risk, I'm going to use the terminology, exposed to that increase relative to uh, those that were uh, not exposed. And you know, I was trying to think, as discussants often do, you know, how can I complain about identification or whatever? All of these fixed effects really kind of control for a lot of things you might be concerned about. Maybe you're concerned about, you know, selection into online vacancy posting in rural versus urban areas over time. Well, that's going to be controlled for by the county by county by time fixed effect, for instance. So these, this is pretty nice identification, and kind of what they find is that, um, as did I'm very well explained, though focusing on column one, an inc a one percent increase in the uh, minimum wage in a particular state leads to a relative decrease in vacancies in these exposed occupations of about 0.24 percent. Um, so you know that's that's pretty big. Um, just one small comment on the slide, you can include the uninteracted minimum wage with column four, and that's just more apples to apples, so that's just one, one small point. Um, and so really kind of my discussion is kind of take up exactly where Didem left off, is so what does this imply about how we think about labor market dynamics, how does it, what does it imply about separations, and then what does that imply about, uh, about theories of the labor market uh, that we can think about. So that's what I spend most of my time talking about. Uh, then hopefully if there's time, I'll talk a bit about empirics and some of the mechanisms that we can think about going on uh, underlying this. Okay, so I'm going to put forward the most embarrassingly simple model you're ever going to see in a conference. It's basically just going to be a law of motion. So I'm going to think of employment as being ET, separation rates as in the share of employment that separates between T and T plus one is ST. Uh, vacancies is VT. I'm going to think of there as being some function H of VT, which is just going to return the higher rate for a given amount of vacancies, right? So, uh, so H is, is going to be the you know, share of employment between T and T plus one that's newly hired. Um, now we can sort of divide by ET in this law of motion. So em employment next period is going to end up being employment this period that hasn't separated plus new hires. We can divide this thing by ET. Oops, I went too far. Uh, and subtract one from it, and you're just going to find that GT, which is now the employment growth rate, is going to be equal to the difference between the higher rate and the separations rate. Okay, so already you can see that maybe we'll have hires moving around because vacancies are moving around, but uh, if separations move to offset that, you can get potentially no movement in employment, and that sort of rationalizes the other uh, stuff we've seen in the literature. So, you know, we can go a bit one step further than just that qualitative statement, though. We can actually take some of the estimates in this paper and sort of back out what must be the implied movement in separations as well. So how am I going to do that? I'm going to take this law of motion, and it's going to totally differentiate it. So now that to, to a first order, the change in employment growth rate has to be equal to the marginal value of added additional vacancy to the higher rate times the change in, high, uh, change in vacancies minus the change in separations. And if you do some algebra, multiplying and dividing by things, turning things into logs, you can basically say that the change in the employment growth rate, percentage change in employment growth rate, is going to be equal to the weighted difference between the change in hires, where you're weighting by sort of the elasticity of this hire function, and the, the change in separations. So this is kind of a nice little simple decomposition because we can actually get some measures from the literature and from this paper about what these what these numbers are. So, you know, prior research has found that there's kind of no employment growth effects or employment effects of minimum wages. So if I'm going to think of these Ds as coming from minimum wage changes, I can say D log G is about zero. This isn't exactly right, but we can think of this higher function as coming from some matching function. It's not exactly right because you would think matching functions is Higher is not higher rates, but you know, bear with me on that. Um, discussing so I can wave my hands a little bit. And so there's a range of, if I impose some sort of uh, Cobb-Douglas functional form for this H, it takes as, as inputs in unemployment and vacancies. There's a range of literatures for what this elasticity should be in the literature, somewhere between 0.1 to 0.5. I'm going to take a mid-range, think it's like 0.3. Around steady state, hires is going to be about equal to separations, so that's not going to matter. Turns out H over G and S over G are both about um, eight in the US data. 
and the new thing that this paper finds is that this d log v in response to minimum wage change is about minus 0 0.24. Okay, so then what, now we have all of these things except for the change in separations, so we can solve for what does this paper's result imply must be the change in separation rates that must come about from a minimum wage increase. All right, and so we find, you know, plugging in all these numbers that d log s has to be about minus 0 0.07, or uh, if there's a 24% decline in, in vacancies, this must be a 7% decline in separation rates, or using sort of more reasonable numbers that, that Didem said, if there's a 10% increase in minimum wage, leading to a 2.4% decrease in vacancies, there has to be a 0.7% uh, decline in, in separations. Okay, so one sort of first comment is, you know, is this reasonable? This is something that you can maybe go and check using some data, maybe from JOLTS, maybe from CPS, maybe this that's already been done in the literature and, and, and I'm ignorant in some way, noting that this is specifically separations into non-employment, um, not just any kind of separation. Another possibility, as you kind of alluded to at the end, is that maybe d log g doesn't equal to zero using this, this sort of um, design, this, uh, this, this empirical design, so maybe you can use uh, if, I don't know, an occupational employment statistics or some other kind of data set that certainly if you had employer-employee match, you could do it, I think, uh, of, uh, of what this d log g is to do a, do a comparison. That might just be nice to get a sort of benchmark uh, of whether this d log s is, is kind of reasonable. Um, and, you know, if it is reasonable, it kind of raises some interesting questions too. So, like, why is the separation rate changing? What kinds of theories do we need to write down in order to rationalize this co-movement of vacancies and separation rates in response to, in response to, to minimum, wa minimum wage increases? So maybe minimum wages increases job retention. There's sort of some evidence of that. Uh, maybe that's because search effort falls because the offer rate distribution compresses. One thing I will say is that generally speaking, we have sort of going backwards as a, as a fool there. And, uh, generally thinking, we, we think uh, in many of these DMP, in DMP models, we tend to think of separation as just being exogenous, in which case this would be zero, which is clearly inconsistent with the data. So um, one kind of theoretical point on this is that oftentimes when we're thinking about labor market flows, we might have in the back of our head a model of vacancy posting that looks something like this, where there's some free entry into how many vacancies are posted, right? So you can say that the vacancy cost per, per vacancy posted, kappa, in equilibrium has to be equal to the probability that you fill, that, fill a vacancy times the value of a filled job conditional on filling it. And maybe this value of a filled job depends both on the minimum wage, W lower bar, I think that's what you, the whole motivation for this paper is, is that J of W lower bar does depend on W lower bar. But it also is gonna depend on the separation rate, right? So if you're gonna think about what the value of a filled job is, well, it's gonna be the present discounted value of profit during the life of the match. If the separation rate goes up, the length of the life of the match is gonna fall, and so generally we're gonna think there's the value of the filled job is gonna fall as the separation rate rises. And so that implies that in theory there should be some interdependence between separations and vacancy posting responses in response to some, or separations and vacancy posting in, in equilibrium. So one sort of note on this, I don't wanna interpret vacancies as just a pure labor demand measurement. It's closer, but it's not exactly there. My hypothesis is that probably most canonical models would struggle to match, rationalize these joint movements um, of vacancies and in separations as sort of implied by your results and the, and the, um, and the results in the literature uh, and that law of motion, embarrassingly simple model I put up for, first. So it might be, I would just sort of like to urge you to think a little bit more about what kinds of models might be successful. You know, do we need some labor supply shocks that are, are offsetting this? Do we need some sort of job ladder or search effort or, or, or what? And I think that'll be a really uh, good thing to add to the paper to try and motivate why vacancies per se are very interesting even over and above um, what we think about with employment. So that's kind of my, my main sort of big picture comment. Um, now getting a bit more into the weeds, I, I have this one question about whether these high wage jobs that you're thinking of as, as controls are really untreated. So you could imagine, and there, there is some evidence on this, that firms substitute away from low wage workers in a variety of ways when the minimum wage goes up. One of those ways might be that they start investing more in kind of capital, uh, capital to perform some sorts of tasks. So you can think about McDonald's, minimum wage goes up, and they replace the cashiers with those boards that you can order at, or you replace cashiers with you know, self-checkout stands, things like that. If that's what's going on, then the labor demand for skilled workers in response to these minimum wage increases might actually be going up. So these skilled workers, if that's the case, stop being a, a perfect, you know, untreated control, 
Rather, they might actually just also be having a positive labor demand increase, and what you're estimating is, is the relative change um, for these low skill, not necessarily low skill, low wage versus high wage, high wage workers. Um, so, you know, one suggestion on that is that in principle, you could estimate, um, you know, the more canonical minimum wage uh, model where you just have sort of state fixed effects or county fixed effects and occupation fixed effects and, inter and the effect of the minimum wage, but you could estimate that occupation by occupation. You'd have a placebo essentially that says that this beta O should be zero for those, uh, those sort of high wage jobs that you think are, are not at risk or not exposed. Um, and the last thing I want to say sort of substantively is, is on this anticipation effect. You know, you mentioned that it's true that we only get a statistically significant effect, uh, you know, three quarters ahead, which is kind of nice because that's exactly how long there is an average lag between announcement and implementation for minimum wages. But, you know, eyeball econometrics, I'm a little bit worried that you could probably just draw a line straight through that from minus six through to minus one, and then you get the opposite uh, after that. The other thing I would think about with these anticipation effects is that I think a lot of these at-risk or exposed jobs are very high turnover. And so since vacancies are kind of a flow for the period of time that you're actually employed, if you're only going to be employed for six months, you know, I wouldn't expect huge anticipation effects for, for you know, those kinds of jobs. So I, I just would urge you to think a little bit more about, about where these are coming from. Um, there's a bunch of assorted quibbles and stuff. I've already sent you the slides. But I think this is a very nice paper that raises a lot of very interesting questions about the functioning of the labor market. How can we have zero employment effects but large vacancy effects? I urge you to think a lot about where the, how separations might be moving to and what we can learn theoretically from, from these results. But yeah, very interesting. Thanks. Okay, thanks, John. And I'll collect some questions. Anusha. Hi, it was a very nice paper. Um, I have a couple of empirical questions. The first is um, you club together a lot of minimum wage uh, hikes, so ranging from 0.5 to 0.5% to 30 to 34%. And um, I would assume some of those 0.5% are just changes which are indexed to inflation. So these are really not <coughs> policy changes that are happening. It's just over time they're indexed. So I was curious if you, you know, have you done uh, any heterogeneous, heterogeneous effects by looking at actual policy announcements versus policy announcements and different size effects? Um, and the second question was, um, uh, why 5% as a threshold? Just curious uh, what the robustness according to that is. And some of the anticipation questions um, John has already addressed, so I, I'll stop there. Since, since that anticipation came back up, so I, what's the logic there? I mean, he, are you saying is John saying that these people aren't employed long enough that you worry about hiring someone who you immediately have to start paying a lot? Yes, it's so, so if you hire someone for six months, the minimum wage doesn't affect them; that doesn't come into effect until after they're already separated on average by the mm -hmm. boss. Hi, so this is just a follow-up on kind of what you were talking about at the end and sort of what John was bringing up with the theory. Um, and I was just curious, I know like in um, JOLT, you can look at things like separations due to quits versus separations due to like a firm downsizing. And so you, I think, would expect with the minimum wage to go up potentially for voluntary quits or to go down, but for firm downsizing potentially to um, be an effect if the firm all of a sudden has much higher labor costs. and. It would be, I think, really nice to separate them if the if the data allows. So I, I, I don't know if you can if you can do it, but maybe there's a way to look at um, uh, using the Jolts data or something like that. Uh, just um, on the employment effect. So so I I don't know whether you can look at those directly. I mean, I, I guess I guess can can you can you see whether in, the, in these at-risk occupations that you identified, do you see any uh, evidence that the 
employment shares and those things is, are, are declining in the states that are having particularly big increases in minimum wage? I mean, or, or are you finding basically no evidence on employment consistent with the other, the other literature? Okay, Deedam, do you want to come up and respond and respond to John? And then after Deedam concludes, we're going to invite uh, Research Director Andrea Rappo up to close us out. All right, thank you so much for all the very nice questions. Well, first of all, John, thank you very much for your great discussion. Um, I think you raised a lot of um, very nice questions that we need to be thinking about. Um, thinking about separations is definitely something on our list. We want to be able to connect this vacancy dimension to employment better. Um, that would be something we'll be looking into. Um, the labor demand shifting to maybe high skilled workers and uh, high skill jobs, then they, is there a positive effect there? Um, well, there are two things that I can speak to that. One is that, yes, there can be, right? Those could actually be treated. And that's why we are looking at these relative effects and you know, not making any claims about the aggregate effects. Uh, but it's definitely the way you, su you suggested, looking at occupation, occupation, and uh, running those regressions. That's something that's on our list to do. Uh, but then another thing, which is an alternative, is would we really see these effects in such a short time we're looking at? Um, right, so like these kind of more structural changes might take longer. Um, so we, we're gonna definitely look into these, um, um, you know, analysis in more detail, but maybe when we're interpreting, we'll have more discussions with you. Um, Anusha, about the indexation. Um, yes, the small ones, there can be some of them that are just being indexed. We did not uh, get rid of those in our sample. But then we do know that those are towards the end of the sample because that's when you know cities start you know indexation. So we don't think that's going to be a, a huge issue. Uh, but that's also on our list of things to do to get rid of those smaller changes. Um, you ask about the five percent threshold. This is literally just looking at wage distribution across all occupations across all states. So we are look literally looking at the share of employed workers in each occupation, right? who are getting paid at or below 110% of the uh, state level minimum wage. And we like just look at across all occupations and 5% seems to be a really good breaking point. So you have these uh, higher wage occupations like for example management, right? You have very few workers who's gonna be making you know this wage close to the minimum wage level. But then when you look at like the food servicing, you're gonna have like 20%, right? Um, so it's really just looking at data across occupations and saying, seeing just this 5% is a good threshold. And as I said, we do experiment by taking off, you know, one at-risk occupation at a time. And that's, you know, uh, what it does is it moves that threshold as well and our uh, results are robust to that. And then on the anticipation effect, so as I said, you know, there's another paper that is looking at the minimum wage changes in the almost the same sample time period that we're looking at, and that's something reported there, and then we find evidence of it, so that's why we thought it's worthwhile uh, to bring that up. And, you know, to us it makes sense, given that there's a slag between the announcement and implementation, so there can be some, you know, pullback in advance. Um, Hannah, thanks so much for mentioning JOLTS. Uh, yes, I mean, ideally we would love to look at JOLTS to make comparison. The issue is that we're running everything at the, um, at the occupation level, whereas in JOLTS we're not gonna have that. So that's the only complication, otherwise uh, that's a great data source. And Jonathan, so employment effects. Of course, yeah, we're running a lot of stuff. We're looking at different data sets. Um, Again, the issue is we're looking at county level and then we're looking at occupations. So if you look at CPS, we can run stuff at the state level uh, with occupations, but then we're not gonna have county. Then we go to QCW, we can have the counties, but not occupations. So we are trying to you know, do some experimentation to say a little bit more about the uh, employment effects, uh, but that's gonna be in the next draft. 
Thank you so much for all the questions, all the comments. And I want to thank the organizers so much for uh, putting this great program together. And thanks, everyone, for coming. Hi. Um, just wanted to offer a few closing remarks. Um, needless to say, I think I'll summarize the mood and the views of everybody if I say that this has been truly enriching as an event, a great conference, both in terms of uh, content. We went from minimum wage to barriers of uh, startups uh, for um, black households. So we covered a lot. We had very fruitful discussions. I enjoyed particularly participation of the audience. So thank you for making uh, this event such a big success. Um, and then I have a list of Special thanks. It was great to see people back in person. Finally, we could organize uh, the full conference in person. So let me thank panelists, presenters, discussants, you all here in the room, and also the several hundreds that have been following us um, on videos. I watched the event online. So thank you for, uh, for you all. Um, as you know, Events like this are not possible uh, without the efforts of large teams. So I would like to take a moment to thank the program committee, uh, Amanda, Didem, and John. Thank you very much. Um, the conference support team, hopefully they're here in the room, but Lori, Brooke, Lisa, Kent, Chris, Paul, Natalie, hopefully I'm not missing anybody. Our uh, food team, Christina and the Euro, uh, Euro's team for feeding us and keep, keeping us well fed throughout the event. Um, our art and photography person, Nina, hopefully she's here, but thank you very much. Um, finally, this marks the fifth anniversary of the Institute and uh, it was a long journey. Uh, President Kashkari had a great vision in terms of what the institute mission uh, ought to be, but it, it took a lot of efforts to get us from ground zero to year five. So I would like to take a moment to actually thank the people that brought the institute with what it is now, and obviously the leadership of Abby, contribution by uh, Alessandra, former research director Mark Wright, Sharon Neal, and the advisory board members that played a very important role in uh, helping us shape uh, the activities and initiatives of the institute. Thank you very much. <laughs> Another benefit of being in person is that finally we can get to network and see each other. And at this point of the day, networking actually happens with drinks. So please, continue networking in the lobby. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>